Welcome to the fifth hearing of the inquiry into the response to major flooding across New South Wales in 2022. The inquiry is examining a number of matters relating to the preparation, coordination and response to the North Coast and Western Sydney floods by the government. I note that the committee was established by the Upper House of the New South Wales Parliament and is separate to the New South Wales government's inquiry into the floods. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the land in which we are gathered today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Today we'll be hearing from a number of stakeholders including various not-for-profit agencies and corporations involved in providing support or services during and after the floods. While we have many witnesses with us in person, some will be appearing via video conference today. I thank everyone for making the time to give evidence to this important inquiry. Before we commence, I would like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearings. Today's hearing is broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded they must take responsibility for what they publish about today's proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside the evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry's terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness, fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice. Written answers to questions taken on notice are to be provided within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do, th do so through the Secretariat staff. In the terms of audibility of today's hearing, I remind both committee members and witnesses to speak into the microphone. As we have a number of witnesses in person and via video conference, it may be helpful to identify who asks questions, who questions are directed to, and who is speaking. Finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. <clears throat> now I'd like to welcome our first witnesses. Could each witness, witnesses starting from my left, state their name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Now, um, Ms. Kiriaku. I'm Joy Kiriaku. I'm manager of member and volunteer programs at St Vincent de Paul Society. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you, Ms. Kiriaku. Ms. McGregor. Yep, um, I'm Miriam McGregor. I am the Emergency Response Coordinator for New South Wales and ACT with the Australian Red Cross. I solemnly swear. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Ms Bernardi. Uh, Diana Bernardi, Emergency Services Manager for Red Cross in New South Wales and ACT. I solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Major Hart, um, Haidley. Uh, Paul Haightley from the Salvation Army, uh, National Head of Government Relations. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Major Hopper. Uh, Sue Hopper, I'm a National Recovery Specialist with our Strategic Emergency and Disaster Management Team. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Um, Ms. Beadle? Yes, good morning. Can you speak into the microphone, please? I certainly. <coughs> uh, good morning. My name's Jo Beadle. I am the National Manager for Give It, um, taking the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. 
Now, um, witnesses, under the arrangements of this committee, um, organizations can make a short statement before taking questions from community members. Um, would anyone like to avail upon us to make a short statement? Nothing more than a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. Would you like to get the Oh, I'm on. sorry, we forgot another witness. I'm sorry. Uh, the witness um, joining us remotely, could you please state your, your name, title, and an oath or affirmation? So I'm um, Claire Van Dorn. I am the Regional Director for the Northeast Region and Flood Response Director for the St. Vincent de Paul Society and for the OAS. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you, ma'am. Now, uh, as I said earlier, um, would any witnesses like to prevail upon us or provide a short verbal statement to begin proceeding? Okay. So I'll start with Ms. Bernardi and then followed by Mr. Mr. Haley and then Ms. Beadle third. And the person remotely, you'll be the fourth if you wish to make a short statement. Does that cover everyone, Ms. Yeah. Um Ms. Bernardi. Uh, I just, the role of Red Cross um, in our response in this particular flood event um, has been, well, we, we've been actively involved in over 35 years in supporting New South Wales communities in disaster response. We have two functions under the emergency management plan. One of them is a, as a community partner under the welfare disaster functional plan where we undertake the role of personal support, our trained volunteers assist in evacuation centres and recovery centres. We meet people on arrival, we register them, we provide them with information and ensure that disaster impacted people are supported and linked in with appropriate services. We, our second role is supporting New South Wales Police um, through maintaining the Register, Find, Reunite database. We were activated at 2.30am on the 27th of February and our volunteers are still in the field supporting the recovery events. Um, at Probably at the height of the event, we, our volunteers were probably in around 13 plus evacuation centres. So it was an extremely peri busy period. The key experiences we wanted to highlight, Red Cross had a presence at 37 evacuation centres, 18 recovery centres across the state. We had a, over 380 volunteers plus staff working in the event. Over 15,000 volunteer hours were donated by um, members of the community through Red Cross. We came to face to face with 19, over 19,000 people impacted by the floods. Through the Register Fire Reunite, we took over 6,000 registrations, over 1,000 inquiries, and we, we matched 123 people looking for family and friends. Miriam, key observations. Yeah, we had a number of key observations over this period. Um, the impact of compound stresses on communities which have had five simultaneous years of disasters, particularly within the northern region, including COVID, floods, bushfires, co um, uh, and, in, and the increased cost of living um, and the economic crisis up there has really taken its toll on the community. The psychosocial impact of the floods on the northern communities is extreme and we've had community members saying that they have feelings of helplessness and despair moving forward at this time. The transition into recovery from response has suffered significantly due to the lack of outreach. We are struggling to get ahead of community needs. General operations in community and recovery centres were inconsistent, um, which tested the patience of a lot of community partners throughout this time. The constant rotation of staff throughout these centres meant that any, on any given day a recovery centre would operate differently. The recovery effort was not coordinating, coordinated, leaving those impacted telling their stories over and over again. Um, little to no understanding by centre managers of the role of community partners in evacuation centres made our job very difficult. Uh, continued lack of appropriate funding for community partner agencies to maintain our trained volunteer capacity made our job even more difficult. Uh, and communities who were more resilient and better prepared fared better than those who weren't, showing the effectiveness of community-led resilience programs and community-centric preparedness programs. Thank you. Mr. Um, Major Hagen. Thank you. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation on whose land and waters that we meet today, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I acknowledge their continuing relationship to this land and ongoing living cultures of Aboriginal 
and Torres Strait Island um, peoples across Australia. And I was, I'd also like to uh, thank the committee on behalf of the Salvation Army for the invitation uh, to appear and also to share our experience. Right from the begin beginning of this disaster, the Salvation Army deployed staff and volunteers uh, to provide emergency catering to those in the thick of it and launched an appeal to equip our staff and volunteers to provide the much needed financial support to those affected. We provided more than 40,000 meals and refreshments in more than 20 evacuation centres, 30 recovery centres and helped more than 28,000 households with grants and in-kind support across New South Wales and Queensland concurrently. Like any disaster, as we reflect and review, um, we always find that there are things that can be improved. Communication in a disaster is critical and ensuring that providers know in advance where recovery centres are ensures that we can be um, where and when the community expects us to be. The Salvation Army is recognised within the state's emergency management plan to provide emergency catering, which our Salvation Army emergency services teams relish. However, the work conducted in recovery centres providing chaplaincy and emergency, and emergency relief has been difficult throughout our recovery, or through the recovery. Our, compa our capacity in recovery hubs is limited to our human resources and the funds we can, can um, raise, both of which have been impacted by the pandemic and current economic pressures. A clear, formalised role in the recovery process and appropriate funding would allow us to hit the ground running and provide more tailored support for specific needs the moment a disaster strikes. Too many of the people we have helped are either uninsured or underinsured and are going to struggle to restore their homes as they were. Anything that the state government can do to address this issue, including revisiting insurance stamp duty, should be considered. And ultimately, in the longer term, a lack of affordable housing makes disasters such as these more likely to swell the number of people experiencing homelessness. Finally, we'd like to ex extend our appreciation to all the volunteers state emergency services, charities big and small who worked to respond to the disaster, and local heroes who did what they could. We see the best of the community during and following disasters. And Sue and I will be delighted to answer your questions when that time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Beadle. Thank you. Now, thank you so much for the opportunity to give evidence at today's inquiry. I would like to begin by quoting from the Royal Commission to the National Natural Disaster Arrangements final report for 2022. The donation of physical goods, including food and material by the community and charities, plays a significant role in individual and community recovery. However, despite the best intentions, this often results in unsolicited donations of goods, which may be inappropriate or do not meet the specific needs of the community. Recommendation 21.1 of the Royal Commission states that for arrangements for donated goods, state and territory governments should develop and implement efficient and effective arrangements to 1. Educate the public about the challenges associated with donated goods, for example the storage and distribution of donated goods, and 2. Manage and coordinate donated goods to ensure offers of support are matched with need. It goes on to state, having pre-established arrangements allows these organisations to develop partnerships and networks with local groups and pre-plan relevant logistics and communications, both critical in the management of donated goods. The lack of pre-arrangements in New South Wales for the management of donated goods for the, for the floods resulted in communities being inundated with unsolicited, unwanted donations, as well as significant delays in the distribution of aid. This caused increased public frustration and stress among impacted residents unable to access material. And it also caused that same confusion and frustration for donors wishing to donate. Just a little bit about Give It. We were founded in 2009. We're a national not-for-profit organisation that provides an online solution to match corporate and public donations to genuine need. Give It has a proven ability to support local charities, community groups and councils by helping them obtain 
exactly what is needed to assist those impacted by disaster events while preventing them from being overwhelmed with offers that do not require, they do not require or do not need immediately. Hibbert's website matches donation offers from the community requests for support, removing the need for organisations to phys physically collect, sort, store and ultimately dispose of unwanted donations. This greatly reduces the administrative and financial burden for organisations, as well as relieving the need to redirect valuable resources away from critical response and recovery activities. 100% of publicly donated money received by Givet is used to purchase essential goods and services as requested by local support organisations. These items are purchased from local businesses wherever possible. That also helps to stimulate the economic uh, recovery as well. We're still supporting um, the communities in the Northern Rivers and also across all of the local government areas that have been impacted by the floods. Um, I do want to acknowledge that Resilience New South Wales has given us some funding for the first three months. <coughs> Excuse me, that expired on the 1st of June. That, um, that arrangement, if we would call it that, was undertaken through an email that provided very little guidance around what the expectations were for us. Um, and we are now back in negotiations for a further three months, which, if it knows from experience, will be vastly inadequate for the assistance that's provided. Just wanted to conclude, Chair, by um, giving you some stats on the work that we've achieved to date, um, and also to just assure you that even though we um, do, do not have a service agreement at the moment with Resilience New South Wales, we are continuing to support the people that have been impacted and will continue to do so, however we manage to do that. But the stats are, um, to date, uh, as of um, last Friday, We've received $15.27 million um, nationally, and that includes $4.58 million, which is ex for exclusive use in New South Wales. Already, we've expended $4.39 million in New South Wales to purchase essential items and services. We've coordinated um, over 233,000 items that have now been received in the community and we're supporting 120 organisations so far. We're happy to take questions. Um, Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, Ms Van Doren, do you want to make a statement? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak and give evidence around the um, disastrous floods that um, impacted our northern rivers region. Um, for clarity, you have our submit, have submission, but um, for us, the Food Institute Poor Society is based in the recovery period of um, a natural disaster, and that's where we were firmly um, placed for this uh, latest event. For us, um, it is about our members, volunteers, and uh, the local embedded um, people in our community who are in there to be able to respond and provide uh, our, our support, care, and financial um, assistance to the people so greatly impacted. The charities um, with a state or um, nationwide footprint play an important role in responding to community needs following disasters, as do our smaller not-for-profit based organisations who we did work in closely with Paul in this disaster. As a large charity, um, the Smith to Paul Society, we can raise additional funds, we can um, leverage corporate donations and operate at scale. And as an organisation with grassroots member base, we're there to support embedded in the community with relationships, knowledge, experience, and an invaluable, um, which, and it is invaluable in the aftermath of a disaster. One of the government's role is preparing for and responding to disasters to be ensure that the mechanisms are in place, resourcing is in place, and this enables not-for-profit organisations like ourselves to contribute efficiently, effectively to disaster response efforts, recognising and enhancing the value of the com contributions that we make within um, response and um, observations that we had from our Northern Rivers uh, flood episode. We found that one of the uh, key areas of, um, of coordination, not um, not being in play, so um, as a few of my um, colleagues sitting on panels there have said that um, having, making sure that we've got a broader sense being prepared um, and making sure for moving forward for disasters, 
given that we had experienced up in our northern rivers areas and across the state um, devastating bushfires where with coordination of events of um, response and financial assistance were also in play. So for us, it is looking at what it is for that preparedness, that recovery. Yes, we can get in and, and provide assistance, but how do we make that more streamlined and less traumatic for the people who were experiencing this? For us, we, um, for our recommendations, it would be for us to be able to have a faster, more coordinated approach, that we should have um, plans in play for us to move forward, that we can move swiftly, but also mindfully for what, how we are supporting people with financial uh, support <coughs> and information. And also looking at that preparedness for us, one of our key roles for convinced Paul Society is our housing and homelessness, uh, making sure that our communities are resilient, they are, have capacity in place for those times when um, properties are lost and also how we can actually support that moving forward. So we uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and we can um, answer any questions. Thank you for your opening statements. Now we'll take questions until until 10.30. I'll open with a very quick question and then I'll turn to my colleague Kate Fearman. Uh, Ms. McGregor, in your opening statement you talked about the um, retelling of stories. Um, can you explain that? Because we've had evidence before that that actually was particularly traumatic and also a waste of time, wasting of the time of people in a very desperate situation. So can you explain what happened there and what do you think should be a recommendation or a replacement for that? Yeah. Um, so usually what happened would that was that someone would arrive at an evacuation centre, for example. They would tell the Red Cross, who was the first people that they saw, about their experience that they've been through. They would then spend, I don't know, um, a couple of days or a couple of hours, whatever, um, in an evacuation centre and tell their story again and again there. Then they would arrive at a recovery centre and because there's no... Uh, file or anything like that on these um, on these affected people, they have to tell their story again to every agency in that recovery centre, uh, which means that they're rehashing it over and over again just to get the, the grant money that they need or the assistance that they need time and time again. I know that there was a recommendation at some point um, that there was a tell your story once. Um, I think it came out of the bushfires, did I? Yeah. Um, and I think that that was, was happening um, before the floods happened, but it, it wasn't seen during this event. So I think maybe revisiting that is a really good idea. Do you have a recommendation on what, what could be put in place? Yeah, I mean, I think a database would be great where you had like a client file. Um, this person was affected by the flood. This is their experience. Register the victims. Sorry? Register the victims. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I referenced in the beginning that we have a register fine re um, which is a database which is used across Australia as part of the response. And the registration part is where we we actually ask the people who are coming to an evacuation centre they can also register online, so they can be sheltering with friends and families, which is the preferred options for people. And through that, they give their name, date of birth. Basic inf identifying information, they also also register their, their primary residence as well as where they're currently staying. That is the entry point which we can then build a database mm -hmm. and information sharing with that currently exists and is consistent across Australia. Um, w one quick question because Mr. Mr. Barrett's asked to do a follow-up. Yep. So how many occasions or how many times would you find people retelling their story? Uh, I couldn't give an exact number, but over and over again. Well, um, when Ms. we walk Bernardi? into an evacuation centre, they register Red Cross. We try and not encourage people to relive their, their but people need to, to share. Then when they go and register again with disaster, um, with uh, Department of Community and Justice, which is where they can access temporary accommodation, they again re retell their situation. That's an absolute minimum. Then we, when we walk into a recovery centre, every agency that they will go and interact with will require them to repeat their information, their file numbers, etc. So it's a repeat, repeat, repeat. And for some people, um, that's where they actually need a support of, can I say, the community partners in those recovery centres because they need time and space and sometimes they need to literally have time and space to go outside, have a cup of coffee, and actually regain their composure, literally. 
So mm -hmm. it, is, it is possible that you could be asked to retell your story up to six times. Six Absolutely. Six times. Easy. Yeah. Now, Ms. Kiriakou, you are nodding in agreement. Is there anything that you'd like to add to this? Uh, look, I, I think that one of the key points in our submission is about coordination, and I think that it's, it's a point that all of us have made. Um, from my perspective now, my role during the floods was as a, a support person and a logistics person coordinating things here from Sydney, supporting Claire, who um, was on the ground and is on the ground um, up north. But what we found is that for organisations like ours, where you know, we're a second tier responder, so we're in recovery centres and we're there to help communities recover, we're not there, um, we don't sandbag um, and so on at the very beginning. Um, what, one of the things that Claire and I spoke about on you know, day dot for this disaster is that we didn't want to force people to retell their stories. Um, but because uh, we, were, we were one of the agencies first off offering cash grants to people to help them um, rebuild their lives, we needed to take particular information for them to make sure we were supporting them in the way that they needed. We wanted to support and listen to them and take the time to listen to them um, and their stories, and that's something that our members who led the response on the ground are very keen on. But there, there really was, as much as we would have wanted to work into a system where you tell your story once, there wasn't necessarily a way for us to do that. So we, uh, we would be very supportive of what the Red Cross has just said here. Okay. Um, Mr. Baird, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I'd, I'd love to. Thank you. Um, sorry, everyone, I'm not in the room. It's, it's a few familiar faces. Today. It's good to see you all again. Um, on that data collection, uh, Red Cross, I think you're sort of that, that front line, that first touch point. It's, can we touch on, um, I, I guess, the training that we're doing on to capture those stories? how comfortable those people are in capturing that data. Um, and I guess as we go along that, does anyone on the panel, I know Ms. Beadle, you're a national manager, have experience from other jurisdictions as how this works, um, that data capture? I think there might be other, other systems in place in other states. Our volunteers are trained um, using psychological first aid skills. And we also offer our volunteers wellbeing um, training. We also <laughs> offer them um, um, our wellbeing checkups. Um, Pre-deployment, we actually, and I hate using that term because it sounds very response focused, but pre-deployment, we actually um, run through a, question, um, a verbal questionnaire with our volunteers checking on the, their state of mind, their physical wellbeing, um, their preparedness, understanding the situation. So we do put all those checks and balances to ensure that, that the volunteers are ready and prepared for what they may see because that our first responders, as we use in those terms, in an event will always be community-based volunteers. So they are living through what is that community has been experienced. But in summary, sorry, is our, all our volunteers are trained in psychological first aid. We maintain their training credit, uh, their, their training skills. We run them through various scenarios. They all have police checks. They all have working with children's checks. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fearman, do you have a question? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and then Pim. Thanks, everybody, for, um, for coming today and for the important work you do, particularly, obviously, during um, natural disasters. Um, I just wanted to go back to uh, a, a statement that a couple of you have said and kind of reinforced, Ms. McGregor. You said that the recovery effort was not coordinated. Mm. That's the role. Who, who, whose role is that to ensure that the recovery effort is coordinated? Um, look, my understanding is that it's the role of Resilience New South Wales. Yeah, and they tried. They did the very best that they could. Did, um, they? did they? Look, I think they did. I think every individual did the best they could under a very difficult circumstance. But so, it, it. But ultimately. It but ultimately, it fell short. Though. Well, sure. It, it ultimately, it does seem as though, like one of the main uh, issues that organisations like yours are, 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 are talking about, and I'm sure this has been the subject of previous inquiries as well. Um, some of you, no doubt, have.
presented to previous uh, inquiries into the response and recovery for natural disasters and was the issue of lack of recovery um, coordination, uh, has the issue been raised to previous inquiries to your knowledge? I'd have to get Diana to answer that, I'm quite sure. new. <laughs> it has been raised and I th what we say in, in, Rec in Red Cross New South Wales is that when they, when, as soon as someone, an event impacts the community, we should start planning our recovery. And the focus is on response when we should actually incorporate very, at the very beginning, planning for recovery. And that would be our key recommendation because that would then place all these agencies and the community on alert that this is what we're looking to when the roads open up, when it's safe to to actually activate those, those, so I'd say it's planning and it's planned in advance, not once the roads open. Mm -hmm. Do that you believe? Team? Sorry, can I just ask? Is that a separate team of people that you're talking about? It is a. No, not really. <laughs> we in Red Cross, we sort of do it all. Yeah, we don't have enough people. <laughs> no. Um. I just had a thought, I was just kidding, yeah. Um, so do you believe that evidence such as what you're giving today, um, Ms Bernardi, that it sounds like you, you may have repeated this time and time again to, to different inquiries, that organisations like yours are saying this ad nauseum, if you like, to government, that the recovery efforts need to be better coordinated and that's what Resilience New South Wales was established to do. Um, about two years ago, I believe, and, and it still hasn't happened. They have, um, they are, they have put um, mechanisms in place, process in place, but as every, as with this inquiry, is, is, would attest to is that this event ha has just tested every agency's resources um, across the board and. And I would leave it at that. It was an extremely challenging event. And the most important point is that we actually, from what we have learned, that we actually implement those learnings. So we don't find ourselves discussing them again. Um, Penny Sharp. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in and thank you for your efforts um, in what we also found to be an extremely traumatised community. <coughs> There. Um, I'm very interested, I think this might be either for Ms Kiriakou or Ms, um, uh, Ms Van Dorn. Um, it's the issue of the Welfare Services Functional Area Supporting Plan. What is that and who is in charge of it? Claire, do you want to jump in or do you want me to? Sorry. No, that's um, fine. So with the, because um, that, that's one of the government's role, the state um, framework that currently is in play, but whether it, um, you know, had been, um, you know, um, utilised or um, referenced back to, that that's what it was that we had our experiences, that it wasn't up to date, but that's that's actually what the, the plan, the framework that is um, in place at the moment. So, mm. it so there is... Been, so yeah. So there is, sorry, so there, so there is a plan that sets out, I mean, you, yeah. you've all clearly identified what your roles are, um, but in ter who is in charge of that? Does that sit within Department of Justice and Communities and Justice? Does it sit with Resilience New South Wales? Who actually, who is the holder of that document? And when there's a flood or a bushfire, who brings that into the response? <clears throat> Um, I believe that it, it is through um, current numbers in New South Wales where that, that framework sits. Mm. Okay. And, oh, look, it's in our submission, mm. but one of the things that we have noted about that plan um, is that while it does set out um, a range of roles for some of the primary responders, um, there's, it's a little bit more sweeping when it comes to secondary responders, which would include us. Um, so we would be really keen to see that plan reviewed, updated, um, and for it to bring in, I guess, become a bit more of a living and constant document 
um, that helps to pull together those roles of big and small organisations alike in disaster response and preparation um, and also perhaps uh, allows space for, as part of the plan, more kind of constant coordination so that there are touch points between the government um, and organisations like ours, all of the ones sitting here, um, at various points throughout the year, really at a simple level so that we all know each other a lot better um, and can easily communicate during disasters and know what each other are doing. And are you able to tell me when the last time that plan was updated? I'm actually not. Claire, are you? No. no it's, all right, I'll ask, it's all right, I'll ask the government. Mm. That's, thank you for that. Um, I mean, this goes to, I mean, I'm, this is the first that we've heard that there's actually supposed to be a plan. Um, mm. So I'm very interested in that. Um, uh, Major Hartley, you d Hartley, is that right? Hately. Hately, sorry. Bad eyes, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, you talked about not even knowing where the recovery centres were to go and do your work. Can you just sort of, I mean, are there other places? It strikes me that there's been floods in 2017, there was floods in 2021. The community told us that they're tired of saying all of these things. I, I'm really trying to understand this. If we knew, if, if this has happened previously, that the idea that the flood came in 2022 and no one knew where the centres were seems like a pretty big gap. Can you just give us a bit of an idea of how you think that has happened. Mm. Would you mind if I pass to Sue? No, she, her, she certainly was on the ground and uh, would be able to join those dots uh, uh, for you. Thank you. See, in the, in the plans, the Salvation Army is only responsible for evacuation, catering and evacuation centres, so we don't have an established role or a documented role in the recovery process. And um, it was a little bit difficult to get the connection to the right person. I mean, the information was there, like the website was there, and we followed that. And I happened to be in Lismore when the Lismore Centre was opening, so I was part of a meeting the afternoon before, but that was, I guess, coincidence. Luck, luck rather than good management, yep. I knew we were moving into recovery and we wanted to be available, so I, I guess our... We, we believe that's a space that we can provide immediate assistance and we fill the gap often for um, people who can't get government grants straight away. So, yes, but changing leadership in centres and then, you know, knowing where to go and when to go and for the centre to know we were coming. <laughs> One centre we arrived at and they weren't expecting us, although I tried to put that through so they immediately found a space for us but yes I, I, I guess to have a documented role for each of the agencies in recovery would be would be very beneficial. Okay. Which is actually to Ms Beadle which is about the, um, the, the no service agreements um, and, and really just a reflection given that you're a national organisation on you know who's doing it better and, and what are they doing that's different to what's happening in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. so, Really great question. Thank you for asking me. Um, yeah, the, look, the service agreement is critical for us. Um, if I can um, talk very quickly about the arrangements that we have in Queensland. So we've been operating in Queensland through a partnership service agreement with uh, the Queensland Government since 2013, and it's been for disaster donation management. We are funded all year. And through that, we um, have the necessary resources to do, all, to do all that preparation work and that coordination that we've been talking about a lot this morning. Um, we, we are able to build up networks like everybody in this room. We know who their people are at the grassroots. So, and this is what we did not have for New South Wales. Because we don't have that funding, we then don't have that ability to basically be building the resilience and the preparation that's needed. So when it came... Uh, time for us to finally be called in to uh, provide assistance for these floods which ended up being about eight days afterwards is so different to Queensland. So in Queensland as soon as we know that there is a disaster about to occur, which certainly we knew in this case, we are out early contacting our organisations to make sure they know that we're there, we're giving them training, we're talking to the local governments as well and also the state agencies that are involved so that we've got, everybody's basically G'd up 
and we're good to go. So that time lag which we experienced for New South Wales is great, really, greatly reduced and in some cases doesn't even exist in Queensland because we are, we are in plans, which I found was interesting that we were talking about plans because we're not in any New South Wales plans at all. There's no recognition of us at that local, uh, regional or state level, yet we, we provide such a critical service so that's, that's the difference between Queensland and New South Wales. Um, we, and like I say, we have survived for the, the first three months on an email. Um, and even then, that wasn't clear. We kind of weren't sure whether the funding was coming, how the funding was coming, what uh, was in and out of scope, what our reporting requirements were. And they've kind of morphed as it's gone along. Whereas if I go back to the Queensland, version, we know what our reporting metrics are, what the frequency of it is, what the state's expectation is about our maintenance of relationships on an everyday basis because we don't just do disasters, we actually do everyday hardship as well, which when you address that, it also helps to then address that um, the vulnerabilities within the community and enhance resilience. So. There, there's some of the big differences, and I and I guess if I, if I had my one recommendation to to throw out today, it would be that um, really serious consideration be given to the state government going into a similar partnership with Vivid, so that we can be essentially we're an enduring um, donation management capacity, which then also helps New South Wales to address those critical recommendations from the from the commission. Ms. Cusack. Thank you. I guess I wanted to ask some Vincent Paul in your submission you talked about um, following the black summer bushfires uh, government uh, agencies is supposed to provide uh, the society with updates about locations impacted and the scale of the impact to, to assist them plan and deliver relief efforts but such information was not really available following the floods. Um, I just wondered if you could unpack for me who is supposed to how does that actually work, that information sharing? Like, who rings who? Can I say, I think there's an opaqueness because resilience seems to be a name for every employee, including community, um, the justice and community services people. So could you be kind of specific around that? Um, and I guess as, as a person who was up there, I wondered myself if the government even knew what it I don't, and I don't mean that in a criticism of such a scale. I wondered if that information even was held by anybody. Look, um, I might start, but then I'll hand over to Claire because she yes. was on the ground. Thank so, you. Yes, Claire. Yeah, so I, look, I, I would say um, one of the things that we were trying to do in particular um, was to communicate, um, frankly, to the, the federal government um, because from the federal government we get... Um, and, and have in the past gotten emergency response funding and we also get funding that um, continues all the time for people who are in financial crisis. Um, but I'm so then, sorry to interrupt you, but we yeah. also have federal government. Can you just be more oh, specific? Oh, the Department about of Social that? Services. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, no, that helps um, us. Thank you. So, so from my perspective, um, I was pulling together data as provided by Claire and by our teams and members on the ground and really wanting to communicate to the DSS about the scale of what we were seeing. Uh, so Vincent de Paul has a framework for how we look at disasters when they occur and then that informs what our response will be. So Claire and I um, immediately, when there's a disaster, would pull together a meeting um, and go through that framework to talk about and inform what the response will be from St Vincent de Paul. So immediately when the floods happened, we had that meeting. We recognised that this was a disaster at the highest, most extreme level. Um, and even on that first day, I think, Claire, you said to me, you know, I think the impact is going to be worse up here than the Black Summer bushfires. Um, and so we responded in that way, right? Um, and I wanted to impress this upon the Federal Department of Social Services, um, but Claire and I 
apart from what she had seen and what her and the members had seen on the ground, couldn't really put our hands on any, um, I guess, official forms of data that would help us to express this. Um, and so, Claire, I think I'll, I'll hand over to you to talk about that a bit more. Thanks, Julie. Um, thank you for the question, too. With um, all the, the Black Saturday fires as well, I was working in that space of, um, of disaster recovery yet again. Um, at that time, the, the Office of Emergency Management um, were providing us with quite detailed information. We did have regular um, updates and circulation of it, which was absolute value add for, as Joy said, for us to be able to you know, re report back for the, the level of impact. But also, it, it even went down to a more granular level, was that we were able to see which communities, which smaller communities that we have. Um, fortunately, with our information and data that we have, we could, we could highlight who we were assisting, be it Lismore, Lismore South, um, Korokai, Woodburn, but to actually have that information to say, Korokai, you know, 90% of the housing was mm. um, either seriously impacted or um, absolutely um, devastated. And that, that was such a value add for us for what we were providing. And also, if you're looking at recovery, capacity building, all the donation management, having that, that in play to know where we should be targeting or where it is that we should be working with it. Um, so that was something that we most certainly did not um, uh, get in this, this instance. And, and we did request um, some information around that as well. But it, wasn't, um, it didn't seem to be as available, available as um, previously. Can I just yeah. follow that up by suggesting that maybe uh, the SES on TV, every time they come on, they say how many rescues they've performed. But in this instance, in, in the case of the flood, most of the rescues were spontaneously performed by community people. So perhaps that data wasn't captured. I just wondered if the whole response became a di I mean, not disorganised, the unorganised community, and that maybe inhibited the information. Is that... Sorry. Um, I, can I, think yes, I can respond to that as well? Um, I feel that one of the biggest um, issues we had was access um, for mm -hmm. external um, people to be, be able to come in and support. So that, that was a huge, um, it was just a major issue and looking forward that would be something we would certainly need to be planning around. And it did become, because of that I believe, it did become a bit of a community um, you know, led response because yes. people were isolated. Um, it was um, how how are they going to manage with each other, and that's what particularly in our smaller communities that were impacted. That that was a key thing for how they actually survived and managed. Once the services could get in play, um, they they certainly were in there and supported where they could. But I think access to us. <laughs> And even even now, um, even now in recovery phase, we are still having you know with roads um, you know being impacted and infrastructure as well. It is an issue in some areas. So I just want to come back to my original question. Then, did the government itself actually know what had happened for all of these reasons, principally to do with the scale of the disaster? And are there lessons that we can learn from that to try and know how to grasp? the information you need. You're obviously dealing with two levels of government, which must have been um, mm. more difficult as well. Look. Cedric, did you? Sorry. Who, who are you directing oh, you to? Oh, to, to, uh, to Claire. Okay. Thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I have to um, probably be honest to say that in um, 2022, given the experiences that we had before, and we've had multiple disasters over the past three years, um, I, you know, and one shouldn't assume, um, I thought it would, would be uh, that having the information really quickly and not so much anecdotal as what you've just said with SES, pulling people from X, Y and Z, um, I, I would hope that that information was available. It was available um, for the, the bushfires, so where, where it sits, um, that framework, who's you know calling that data for us, um, I, yeah, I would hope that um, moving forward it definitely would be in part of the plan that we would have for preparedness. Um, Matt, because it is, it's just too vital. Even now, I think, um, you know, anecdotally, we, we may say X amount of people have been impacted, but we, we haven't got, we literally don't have that hard evidence to say mm -hmm. these are the houses that are being impacted. Mm -hmm. 
may I comment? I think there's two aspects to this, is that, that formal um, assessment. And we know that I'm not a, S, um, a fire person or a flood person, so I cannot comment on the difficulties on how you actually yeah. complete those assessments. And I can only comment that I know that from anecdotally that to complete assessments on floods is far, it's not as easy as a bushfire event. But the, the two things that we have learned in Red Cross and in, during the bush, um, after the bushfires is our teams went out and did what we call unofficial outreach where we actually went into those smaller communities that, that, were, that were prior to recovery centres being set up that were self-managing themselves. So we could actually get immediate information from those communities about their immediate needs, which would then feed into and inform the local recovery. The, yeah, in the flood event, we did the same, but in the flood event, we had the added advantage of we had worked in the last five years um, post-TCDB on what we called our community-led action um, recovery, community-led resilience teams in those communities that are more prone to social isolation, to isolation or social isolation. Sorry, isolation due to the event. So we could actually get that information from them as to how the, what their needs were. That you know, reports on the, you know our flood gauge is actually broken. Those sorts of things that we could do as soon as communication was accessible. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably what you we may be alluding um, getting to around that community voice and a community uh, best place to actually tell us about the impact on their community. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that is what we call a community managed evacuation centre, which is operating Kyogo, and that would be, I think, um, something of interest that you may want to explore with the local emergency management officer there, um, around how that operated, which is community uh, training is provided, but it's also community led, and sits within the local emergency management arrangement under the leadership of the local management officer. Chair. Okay. Chair, excuse yes. me, could I, could I be indulgent for 30 yes. seconds, please? Yes. I just wanted to share an experience that we had. Um, one of our po points of frustration was getting that understanding of what was going on at the local level. Um, we were very hamstruck, um, to skip it, in that um, we were told by Resilience New South Wales that we could only communicate with them, that we could not communicate with the local governments and that any communications would they would do on our behalf. The same with um, their what they call their local recovery coordinators, which took some time to even get in place. So uh, through a discussion that I had with one of the Resilience New South Wales officers, um, they stated to me that they had points of frustration because they knew that the councils had the data, but they weren't sharing it. So that then escalated up to us as well because we are desperately trying to find out what is going on. And there just seemed to be quite an emphasis from Resilience New South Wales about a community-led recovery. I'm not quite sure they really understood what that is mm -hmm. and that there was such a strong emphasis on the local government but not that sharing of information where I would have expected that Resilience New South Wales may not take the lead but provides a hand up to get some of those local governments who have never experienced this type of disaster and response and recovery before to at least give them the momentum to get them going. And by the time that started to happen, we were well and truly one month into the, into the recovery. Okay. Yeah. Mike, you had a question? Yeah, sure. I'm just, just picking up on answers uh, given, by Ms. Uh, given to Ms. Fairman's questions. Uh, Ms. McGrady, you said everyone on the ground in Resilience New South Wales was doing their best, best but fell short. Where and mm -hmm. how did they fall short, in your opinion? Was it that they didn't turn up in time? Was it there wasn't enough of them? Was it they weren't trained well enough? Or we've heard submissions that say that they had no real clear line of responsibility mm -hmm. in terms of what their role was? Or was it all of the above? Mm -hmm. Probably all of the above. Um, I think also there was a... Uh, a breakdown in communication. We sat in the um, community recovery coordination centre that was established. Um, we sat there for the first week and a half. Um, it was full of combat agencies um, and we were the only community partner there. We had no idea uh, where recovery centres were opening, when they were closing. When the second flood hit, we took 
um, basically the rumour mill that the recovery centres would close for a couple of days and ran with that. And they did close, but it would have been nice to have an email from Resilience to say, yeah. And just quickly, Ms Bernardi, you talked about that Resilience as well put mechanisms and processes in place. What were those mechanisms and processes? We've sort of heard it pretty loud and clear that there wasn't any. Well, there's, there's the, can I say the operational, um, where you asked, you asked about um, the evacuation centre. The evacuation centres, the formal role sits with disaster welfare, um, which, is a, which is a section within Resilience New South Wales, and they then have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Communities and Justice who actually open and manage the, the evacuation centres. When we meet, move into recovery centres, and I think this probably sort of highlights maybe, can I say, the, the slight sort of operational sort of disjoint, is that when it becomes a recovery centre, they're actually managed by local councils. So the actual, how that process, that standing up, that training and everything, is supported through Resilience New South Wales, but you can start seeing that there's different sort of levels of players and departments that come in at different stages, and I would... Matt, and that would be worthwhile thinking through, considering about those very what those trigger points are, and how that smooth transition co coordination piece, which is where we talked about, we should be discussing recovery as mm -hmm. soon as um, a resp an event happens. Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you all for attending this morning, and in particular, thank you and your organisations for the work that you've done on the ground up there and they're continuing to do goodness knows where the victims of these floods would be without your assistance so it's very much appreciated. Uh, Ms Van Dorn I might direct my question to you. Um, page three of your submission, paragraph three, um, and I might just quote from it, in responding to the 2022 floods we reached out to other organisations that deliver similar types of assistance to coordinate where possible. Rather than trying to establish points of coordination following a disaster however, Relationships should be built in advance. Government can and should play a more active role in establishing and maintaining these connections. And you continue on. Um, clearly, I think here you're advocating for a more organised approach rather than reactive. And can I just tease that out and could you explain that to us a little bit more, please? Uh, certainly. So, and um, Joy um, actually touched on this before, that um, the whole preparedness um, um, for a disaster like this, um, we, would, we would not be as reactive if we had um, information, um, relationship, know who's, which, who are our counterparts, who are the players within, in, in the area who we can reach out for if something happens. Um, bang, we can go straight into whatever the framework, whatever, whatever those connections are in the, in the various spaces, um, be it emergency evac or into the recovery space. Um, having, I feel that one of the, the situations that we did um, face was there was a lot of change um, uh, around who was doing what, where and when, but also new players coming in who may not have experienced what it was in disaster. Um, recovery. So I feel the framework of what we had uh, and what we will build moving forward should be that we have those relationships within the organisation, not the specific person, which is what it seemed to come down to in this in this episode. If you know you knew someone, um, say in the Gibbet space, or if you had someone in resilience or the local government, that that's how that information and targeting of where we should be providing response. So. Mm. So for the broader moving forward, it's having that framework that the relationship with the, with the key players that will be in that disaster evacuation and recovery space. Look, just to add to that, there are there is a good model, um, uh, and I and I have to say, from a federal perspective, the federal government um, uh, throughout the entire period of COVID through the Department of Social Services federally has run a very consultative and collaborative approach when it comes to COVID. Um, and at the start of COVID established a range of consultative committees at the national level and then sitting underneath that at every state level. <coughs> and that has created a, a whole lot of community connections, not only to the government so that you have at, on the federal level 
you know who to speak to when you've got multiple points of contact, but also across um, NGO um, and charity agencies that are responding and dealing with the community who are, have been facing COVID and that um, continues today. So I would say that there are some really excellent models that could be looked at, including the Department of Social Services and the way in which they've brought agencies together throughout the COVID pandemic. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, thank you all. I'm from Lismore. I know what's been going on up there pretty well. Um, Ms. McGregor, you said, sorry, I know we've all kind of focused on you quite a bit and I heard you say you're very new to the whole scene, so I apologise. But you said, um, you mentioned that communities that uh, were better prepared fared better. Yeah. Could you just give us a little bit of a picture on what, whether there's a specific example or, or what you meant by that? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the Red Cross, we have the community-led resilience teams, um, which Diana was talking about, where it was talking about, you know, um, feeding back information about flood gauge levels or things like that, or the community-managed evacuation centre plan that we have. Um, that's not a replacement, for example, for evacuation centres managed by the Department of Communities <coughs> and Justice, but it is there for communities that we know are isolated, so they're ready and they know what to do when the time comes, um, that the flood levels are too high and nobody can get in to help them. Um, Diane, do you want to add to this? Uh, look, uh, one example, and I have, to, and I'm not going to name the village, the community, because I may get it wrong. Um, one particular community um, during TCW lost 200 vehicles due to the flood, and this particular flood event, which was bigger, more impactful, zero cars were lost, and that is all part of their preparedness, working as a community through the community-led resilience model that they actually prepared. So they were in a better place, and that's what we're referring to. And we you know, we can provide that information of those communities and different communities. For example, one community which has um, communication issues, um, we were able to support them in applying for funding to actually get satellite phones, for example. So really small, tangible things which actually has positive impacts on communities' response, preparedness, response and recovery. And the three are... They're not interchangeable. They're, it's a circle. Um, can I just follow up on that? And so it, 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 would you recommend that there is more support for those community-led recovery and resilience models? And so, it, you know, having support to buy the, that, those things that would help those communities in advance rather than once they've had the experience? It, it speaks to the resilience. It speaks to community voice. And that has come out time and time again in various reviews. It also would... Also, those communities could be able to link in with Give It, um, and so, so they, it, it actually provides a can I say exactly what we keep on saying: community voice, community experience. The preparedness is essential because we know we're going to continue having extreme, horrible events. We know that in Australia, every agency struggles to recruit and maintain our volunteer base. So we're better but to start with community, working with community, engaging with community, having their voice. They're linked into the emergency management arrangements that they know the role of the various agencies, that, and I'm talking about the formal agencies. So they're not rogue, they're not cowboys or cowgirls. They're actually informed, and what better way to work with our communities than to walk with them, not on top of them. And then just finally... Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, how long, what's your plan to stay in the Northern Rivers? Like, what's your time frame in your plans right now? As long as it takes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got outreach workers on the ground going door to door and they'll stay there as long as the funding lasts, basically. And for Give It, yep. well, we have the funding, which we think is for the next three months, we'll still stay until um, the work's done. So. We pride ourselves on that we don't we don't leave until the last house is repaired, and for um, the 2019 monsoon floods in Townsville, uh, we were there for two and a half years. And just for us, we're we're always there. We were there before because we're very embedded in the community through our members, um, and we'll be there after. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'd like to ask one last question to the Red Cross. Um, there was some mention about um, resilience, New South Wales. What was your um, what was your response? Your dealing, your interaction with resilience, New South Wales. 
We have an excellent relationship with Resilience New South Wales and um, as part of that we, um, with, because as our other agencies we also ran an appeal as part of that appeal some of our corporate partners also, uh, corporate donors wanted to donate goods and so we organised directly um, with um, first engagement with Resilience New South Wales and then linking the corporate donor directly with local agencies who could actually receive and dist distribute those goods so as not to, you know, sort of all of a sudden have truckloads of things arriving in point X when it was actually it sort of flowed into, can I say, that system that already exists for supporting communities. And there's agencies such as, as we know, Food Bank, all those agencies that we already had a relationship due to COVID, yet, you know, benefit of COVID is actually that increasing um, interaction with all the agencies, as mentioned um, um, just recently with Joy, is that, that interrelationship. So what, what we did better this time round um, is connecting those corporate donors and also not only their goods, but for example, one CEO donated their time to actually support logistics and management of donated goods with Lismore Council, for example. So that's, and so that's I think, the goodwill of that collaboration can be brought into every response. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for your time. Thank you. Mr. Binge, could you please state your full name, position title, and swear either an oath or aff affirmation? Yep. Uh, my full name is Christopher Binge. I'm the CEO of the Jali Local Regional Land Council, based in Ballina, but uh, cover the both the Cabbage Shell, Wardell, and Ballina communities uh, of the Ballina Shire. Uh, I will give an oath today. Uh, I swear that the evidence that I now uh, am about to give uh, by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Now, there is provision for a short statement if you wish to do so. Yeah, I, look, I think it's probably important that um, you guys have an understanding of, uh, I suppose, one, uh, the Jali Life Aboriginal Land Council, and two, the uh, particularly the community that's been affected uh, the most, I think, in the Balmain Shire, which is the Cavistry Island community. The Cavistry Island community is a very uh, small uh, section of the Balmain Shire, uh, but in saying that, is a very um, prominent uh, part of the Shire as well, as it, it is a community that's based, as as, it, as in what it says, it's, a, it's an island. Uh, it is actually on the cultural land. Uh, that is overseen by the Jali Land Council and also the Nangangpur people, which is the uh, clan group of the Bunjalung Nation in which we're sitting uh, here in, in Ballina. Um, and, and my uh, tenants today is to speak to um, everybody in relation to, one, the impacts uh, of flooding for Cabbage Island, uh, and more importantly, um, the effects that it's had, both short, medium and now long term, for, for the residents of that community, which, which is around uh, between 190 to 120 uh, individuals uh, or, and family members on, on the island itself. Thank you, sir. Um, what's the status of the community at the moment? Can you give us an update on the situation on Cabbage Tree Island? Yeah, Cabbage Tree Island at the moment, uh, at this point in time, uh, no one is actually currently living on the island uh, due, to the, due to the impact of flooding. Uh, obviously, uh, 17, 18 weeks ago, um, all community have been moved from the island and now are currently living in what we would deem as crisis accommodation, uh, spread out through the Shire. Uh, initially, the community, uh, obviously from evacuation, uh, attended an evacuation centre first and foremost in Ballina. Um, and as we may know by now that that evacuation centre also had to be evacuated as Ballina was also uh, at a point of flooding as well, and they were moved from Ballina across to Lennox Head and placed in an evacuation centre over the Lennox Head community, uh, the Lennox Head Cultural Centre, which was which was uh, turned into an evacuation centre for approximately, I think, two weeks, two to three weeks. Um, so the community right now is spread across the Ballina Shire. Um, we've got people living in caravan parks. Uh, we've got people living uh, in motorhome villages. Uh, and we've also got people living with extended family where they can, um, 
uh, as you probably may, may be aware, it is very difficult at this point in time for those people to live with extended family members for an extended period of time due to the size of the homes they are living in at the moment in Ballon. Do you have any indication of when uh, people will be able to return to Cabbage Tree Island? Look, I think at the moment that's pretty, uh, I think that would be undetermined. I think there, there are currently processes in place mm. at the moment where a number of evaluations have occurred or assessments have occurred on the homes of Cabo Strong. Um, majority of those assessments have been done by uh, professionals, engineers, uh, and both, built, built, both, sorry, both building and engineers assessments and also assessments undertaken by uh, the EPA, which is the environmental uh, environmental group that is actually doing the testing on the water and the land and also uh, other issues on the island from a contamination point of view. And at this point in time, it's not foreseen that people will be able to return to the island in the homes as such, as the homes have either been condemned or been deemed uninhabitable. Okay. Now, what about infrastructure on the island? Uh, infrastructure on the island at the moment, as I've just mentioned, uh, from the assessments that have been undertaken, uh, we've also got outside of the 27 homes uh, that have been affected. We've also got three community buildings that are on the island. One of those being uh, one of those being an office space. Uh, we've got a health post or a health centre. Uh, we've got a uh, playgroup area uh, for mums and bubs, and we've also got a, a fourth one, which is our school, uh, which has also been inundated and been deemed either uh, condemned or uninhabitable as well. So all dwellings on the island have been impacted severely by the floods um, to the extent where at this point in time none of the, the dwellings that I've, that I've just mentioned uh, are, are, would be uh, deemed to be habitable at any given point at this point in time or for the same future without extensive work or rebuilds. Did any building or piece of in infrastructure on Cabbage Tree Island escape water damage? No. Not a no, single? Every, every, every building on the island by the time the water, by the time the water got to Capistrano, um, we 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 are now based this on information received both from the SES and and um, other providers that the water would have been in excess of sixteen metres by the time it hit Capistrano. Thank you. So, yeah, all the homes were inundated um, from the point of view of uh, water coming either to the floor level or inside approximately one to two foot of water inside the homes on the eastern side uh, and we've had major land loss on the western side of the island as well. A significant land loss of anywhere between 15 and 20 metres of land at the back of the homes on the western side. Thank you. Um, Ms Cusack? Thank you. Chris, hi, it's Catherine Cusack here. Just to round out the damage you've described, I wondered if you would like to mention the farm that's on the island, the vehicles yeah. that were on the island and the roads on the island. Yeah, well, as, as uh, you would know, Catherine, um, the, definitely the roads weren't, the homes and the roadways weren't built, I would suggest, suggest the specifications, as the road and stormwater drains are actually higher than the base of the homes, um, the, the, the land base of the homes I'm talking about, which meant uh, as far as flooding of water runoff, there is actually, there isn't an opportunity for that water to run off into stormwater drains as such. So that in itself um, played a role in, in not just the flooding but the, the extent of how long the water stayed on the island. Um, as far as our farmlands, our farmlands on the island were inundated um, and that farmland that we're talking about is a very productive farmland. That was an initial cane farm to which it was farmed and has been farmed for well over 60 years um, on the island and off the island. Um, and those farms have been pretty much decimated. We, um, there is no cane left on that farm to be harvested at any given point. Uh, we were just about to take a major project um, where we're converting all of our farmlands into macadamia um, and that's now been very much affected in relation to uh, time framing and, and for us to move into that space. It was a business opportunity that was going to place Cabbage um in a very, very good position moving forward in years to come from, particularly from a funding perspective, it would have meant that Cabbage Island would have been going towards what we would call self-sustainability, um, not just in the short term, but for the foreseeable future. Um, we've done an extensive amount of work in that space, and that work now has to be uh, reviewed, and also then those time frames have to now be readjusted 
trust to be able to have any, any thought of uh, those farms becoming uh, or coming to fruition, but we do believe that that can happen. Um, and we're going to be working tirelessly to ensure that we go down that path. As far as the um, other question you had... The vehicles. The vehicles, we lost approximately 30 to 35 vehicles were on the island at the time of the flooding. Uh, none of those vehicles were able to be uh, taken off the island due to the fact that we've entered onto the island and off the island is via a one-lane, very, very dangerous bridge um, to which had the potential to be quite honest to become a death trap. We actually could not get vehicles for the evacuation across that bridge, uh, which meant that we had to actually park three uh, 24-seater buses off the island and a 12-seater bus off the island and evacuate people from the island across that bridge to get them off, um, which created its own dilemmas as we weren't able to get everyone off at the one time, which meant we had to commute between Catastrophe and Bala. Um, the township, which is a 20 to 30 minute drive uh, from the island. So we actually had evacuated women and children first. Um, being mindful that the evacuation wasn't done by emergency services, this evacuation was done by myself and staff from Jolly Land Council as the emergency services were really, really stretched at the time. They gave us the alert, which was approximately between 5, 30 and 6 o'clock in the morning of the floods. Uh, which was a Monday morning, I think, I'm pretty sure it was a Monday morning. Um, so from about 6 o'clock onwards, we were around um, in the community doing the evacuation, knocking on doors, banging doors down, actually asking people to leave, which was an arduous task in itself. Um, and then we actually uh, had to go back on numerous occasions because we had people that were refusing to leave as well, which we then eventually had to carry off in waist deep water uh, across the island. Yeah. I, did, I did want to just say that was very, it was a miracle really, wasn't it, that everybody got off that island safely? Well, there, there was no other way to put it, Catherine. It was a miracle in itself that we were able to um, save every um, life, not one for a better term, on that island, which was, as I said, approximately at the time was 190 to 200 people. Uh, how we did that, I got through the grass of God. Like, it's as simple as that. There was no other way to put it. There was parameters that, that were in our in plot base that um, would normally be there in those circumstances. But at this stage, at, at, at the time of the floods, everyone was being impacted and we actually had to do this from the community point. So it was a community evacuation um, and, and, and that in itself is where the miracle, I suppose, it is uh, in that community was able to do this in a way that we were able to save lives. Thank you. Um, Sue Higginson. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, um, for being here and for all the work that you did to save the community there. Um, is, I, I don't know how... Um, is there any view from the community about the return and the rebuild of Cabbage Tree Island at this point? Is there... Um, I'm assuming there isn't one homogenous view, but are there some people who are uh, reconsidering returning or is there a view to return during a, after a rebuild? Could you give us just a bit of an insight as to what the feel is at the moment? Look, I think those discussions have been happening for quite some time, well, from, from when the flood hit to, to, to now, uh, even over the last week. Um, obviously there was a number of things that, that we couldn't assure of. We needed all those assessments that I spoke about earlier, the engineers' assessments, the building assessments. But the most important component to those, those assessments were the EPA assessments. Um, and, and obviously from those EPA assessments, that would be yeah, one, one major issue for us. Uh, that was around safety. Um, and safety in relation to contamination, obviously, we were, we fought, we, we were the brunt of upriver, um, particularly uh, the little town not far from us, which is Broadwater and Sugar Mill. Um, so whatever come down through Lismore, Karakai, Broadwater, Woodburn, it actually finished on the island. So that EPI assessment was really, has been really important from the aspects of that return uh, and also from the aspects of a rebuild. Obviously, Cannister Island, as I said at the start, it is cultural land. Um, we've got ancestries, ancestors that are buried there well in excess of 140 years of, of, of age um, on the island. Um, those ancestral links are the families that are living and come from the island. They are the descendants. Um, you know, from the island, I just so happened to have a grandfather that was buried there 140 years ago. Um, 
and, and that has obviously that connection to country is really important for us as Aboriginal people um, and the return obviously we do uh, want and, and obviously the need to return is, 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 is huge um, but I would also say um, in your questioning around the want to return, the want to return is definitely there, uh, the need to return is, 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 is also definitely there. Are there questions around what a rebuild will look like? I think it does need to be looked at from what a rebuild might look like from a rebuild point of view. I think those issues and, and those uh, discussions need to occur not before a rebuild can, can be, I suppose, looked at. The other component is that, yes, there are um, some people from the island or some family members that, that are tenants of the homes on the island that have questions around return, and that could be purely around safety. Thank you, Chris. Uh, sorry, Penny, if you'd like to go next. Sorry, the way this is set up, it's very hard to see you. Sorry, Mr. Finch. <laughs> oh, no, I'm looking in the wrong direction. Anyway, um, look, my, I just have really one question, which is what is, um, I mean, I suppose the one, but probably the two or three things that the government could be doing to support you in recovery right now? What are, the, what, what are your three priorities in terms of what you need? Yeah, look, I think priorities, as you know, I think I've spoken about this to numerous ministers, we were grateful that, that we actually had the Premier visit um, and that was that was definitely welcomed. I think uh, Catherine definitely would know that there was a level of frustration for me particularly. It took uh, in excess of 14 days for me to get any action from anywhere. Um, I was personally the person that actually went out and asked the ADF if they could actually put me in a helicopter to have a look at the island and the damage that was done. No one knew about Cabbage Trial. We were, we, were at, we were an afterthought, um, you know, for us to be able to even get onto the island. It took approximately four, 13, 14 days, um, and that was physically get on the island. Water did not reside from underneath these homes for 12 to 14 days. So we're talking an extensive period of time for water to be underneath homes, um, and those homes not being able to be, one, looked at, or two, knowing what needed to happen in relation to whether these people could return back home. So for me, the, the key priority right now is accommodation. Um, we've been working tirelessly with government um, around the supported accommodation component. Obviously, you now know what the current accommodation is, but we're moving from those premises to a, uh, to, to a place down at Wardell, down on the Wardell Recreation Grounds. There was a number of trains of thought as to what, could, who, what would that look like for us into the future. Those um, discussions have been long and robust. We had two options, one of those being Lake Ainsworth, but that was taken off the table pretty quickly uh, by government. And then obviously the second component was the water oh, recreation. So why, was, yes. sorry, so why was that? I thought that there was some... Yeah, do you have any? Do you understand why the government took Lake Ainsworth off the table? Uh, the building infrastructure um, is what I was told. Now... Um, and, and whether the facility itself would be able to cater for such a high number of community members, which I pretty much know that they probably could have catered for the initial components. Um, but for the longer term, they were looking, from a longer term point of view, they believed that they could not cater for the need that was required for Cabbage Shire particularly, which is why then the second component of the recreation ground uh, became available, and that's a crown, that's crown land. The other component to that is it is closer for community to be back to as close as possible to their home country uh, on their, and, and the rec ground, funnily enough, even before it was a rec ground, it is deemed for us as Aboriginal people as our country uh, or the country of what we belong to in the water area. Um, so that would be one of the key priorities in the short to medium and possibly longer term because we, we do understand that the rebuild isn't going to happen overnight, it's going to take some time. And, that, that, that for us is key and crucial for us and that's what, what we're working towards. And other work started there last week. Um, I can't tell you what the time frames of that is right now and it's always it's been different as we go along. Um, but that work has started. So accommodation is definitely key and crucial. But the accommodation mix combined with ensuring that we've got the health support that's going to be required, the long-term health support, both physically. Uh, we've got a lot of our elders that are um, chronic disease is huge in, in, for all of our daughters at the moment and also we've got different care needs 
uh, for, for people in, in, in some of the family groups. Uh, and then obviously the second component is educational. So we now know that um, education is actually going to be moving um, demandables down there for the school, uh, as the school, we did have a school on Travis Road. Um, so that's a key crucial component as well. But the other component, I think, is the rebuild, obviously. Uh, we want to make sure and ensure that whatever that is going to be looking like, that Aboriginal voices are at the forefront of what those conversations are and need to be. I think I've been definitely uh, driving that with the government that any decisions around what is going to be happening with our community needs to be driven by us for us and we'll get the best outcomes. We know our community better than anyone else. And if we aren't at the table, then that's going to be a very difficult thing and that's why government needs to think very differently around what this means for us as Aboriginal people. Um, not just the Cabo Strong, but right across to Lismore and out through to Corica. These are discussions that have been long and ongoing. These are discussions that have been driving at the highest levels of government and I need government to understand that for once, um, in a very, very, very long time, Aboriginal people need to be at the forefront of these conversations, not just from the components that you've asked, but also from a flooding history perspective, also from a flood mitigation perspective, and any ongoing work in those spaces. Aboriginal voices, we've got the knowledge base, we've got the understanding of what happens in our communities, we've known this for quite some time, it's been passed on both written, orally, and we know it within our stories as to what these, this means for us in our community, across the region. And it's sad that we've gotten to this point of what's happening in our community from a catastrophic point of view, but initial conversations with us as Aboriginal people, we could have informed as to how this could have been managed better from those communities and better from the, from the point of view of how we manage this for generations. And, it, and, it's, and it's not just hindsight, it's not just um, stuff that we would put up to the front now. This has been ongoing knowledge for us as Aboriginal people for generations and it would have helped in the point of view of not just how we manage it but also how we can construct communities in the right places at the right times. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Mark? Yes, um, just uh, quickly, thanks Chris. Um, in your submission at the end there, you, you asked that we uh, have regard for your submission to the New South Wales Government Inquiry. Can I ask that you just formally uh, send that through to the, the Committee Secretariat so we can actually have regard, because the, the Government Inquiry doesn't talk to the, the non-Government Inquiry. <laughs> so we won't, unless you send it to us, we won't be able to have yeah. regard for it. I'm happy to send that through, and I think, as I said, the reason I think it needs to be sent through is because of the other points that I've just raised towards the end yeah. of this conversation. Awesome. Thank and you, Chris. Flooding history, flood mitigation, and the Indigenous knowledge is in those spaces. We, we can help and support better decision-making in, in these circumstances, and I think that's now's the time that we engage in those spaces. Otherwise, we're going to be in this situation in five to six years' time due to, you know, with the, the flood mitigation issues and combined with global warming, we need to be real about what's out there. Thank, thank you, Chris. Uh, Catherine? Thank you, yes. Chris, thank you. I just wanted to come back to Lake Ainsworth just to um, let committee members know that that is a facility owned and operated by the Department of Sport and Rec at Lennox Head. It has accommodation for 200 uh, and there are around 190 people from the island. It has communal kitchens. Um, facilities where the school could continue. In other words, there was an opportunity there on government-owned land, in government-owned facility to accommodate the community together. Um, I just want to, uh, I guess, ask if you wouldn't mind just expanding on the importance of the community being together in terms of people's mental health, in terms of the education of the students and in terms of the capacity of that community uh, to collectively decide its future, particularly in relation to whether you do or don't rebuild on the island, just the need for people to be together to have those conversations. Well, I think, for, for, and I said this at the start, for us as Aboriginal people, connection to land and country is really important, but more importantly, um, that connection flies out beyond the country. <coughs> that, that, that connection is around uh, people, that connection is around family, that connection is around kinship. The, the ability to be able to not have people come together, which at the moment, displacement is an issue. And displacement needs to be acknowledged. Displacement has happened once again for us as Aboriginal people and for this particular community. So it's actually had an ongoing impact. This this impact isn't, isn't going to be something that we can brush over. This impact is going to be felt for years to come. 
the support side are going to be required in those spaces, particularly from you know, a health and wellbeing um, space is going to be huge. Um, the ongoing impacts on that on families is also going to be felt for generations. The importance now to have those services um, provide the support that's required in those spaces is, is I would suggest, urgent, um, but more importantly, it needs to be not just urgent and one stop, here we go, let's drive it in and you know, fix it for now. It's going to be something that needs to be ongoing and looked at and monitored over years to come. Education is massive at the moment. These children have been impacted severely. They, don't, they can't concentrate um, at school. Their conversations aren't about uh, what it needs to be within the school settings. It's actually about other issues. It's about the flood. It's about where they live, who they go home to. So connection to country and connection to family and kinship is really important. It is their homeland. Um, the land adjacent to Cabot Island is very, very culturally significant to those people and from a connection point of view. To take that away and not allow um, people to return home would be detrimental and have long and lasting impacts, not just on these people in this community, it will have long and lasting impacts on government in, rela in relation to funding needs into the future. This community is a very productive, self-sufficient community. It has been for quite some time, well over 60 or 70 odd years. It is moving towards self-determination. It was moving there before these floods. It will continue to move in those directions. But if these things aren't supported and these things aren't done in a way where our voice is being heard and where we aren't asked about what our future, you know, our future is and, and, done, and, and things done in a way where we have to say in that, then we are going to be having a very different conversation in 10 or 15 years. Whatever amount of money has been committed by government, which at the moment you've got a $70 million commitment, you've also got a $50 million commitment. Those commitments need to be upheld regardless of what level of government and what government is in um, power at the point in time. Because without, those spends are, are, are going to be minimal compared to the lack of support in the spaces that I've just mentioned into the future because you can double, triple or quadruple those in you know, incarceration rates, in health rates, in lack of education, in unemployment, and you're talking about multi-billion dollars being spent over years to come if it isn't done properly now. And the only people that need, need to be asked about how we do this is us. Because if we aren't asked, the future will be determined again once and foremost by government on us, not for us. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Binge, for your time. And that, uh, oh, Catherine, uh, sorry. No, 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 no. no. I was about to just say that. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for responding, and thank you for listening, and hopefully um, our voices are heard, and hopefully my community will feel that they've been heard as well. Thank you very much. Now we will resume, we'll take a short break and we'll resume at 11.15. If you don't mind, um, could each witness state their full name, title, position, and swear either an oath or affirmation, starting with the um, person on the left. Yes, uh, Ms. Demetra Irene Sophia Crystal, Senior Industrial Officer, FBU, for taking the affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Can I also get you to pull the microphone closer to you? Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Sir? Uh, Leighton Robert Drury, State Secretary, Fire Brigade Employees Union. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now it's 11.15, so I think we'll start. Okay. okay, good. <laughs> Sir, the, the, there is a provision for a short opening statement if you wish to do so. Uh, yes, I do. And um, greetings and thank you for the opportunity to speak to our submissions today and add further information. Uh, my name is Leighton Drury. I am, as I said, I'm the State Secretary of the FEU and I've been a firefighter for the last 22 years. FEU members work across metropolitan regional areas throughout New South Wales, from Bondi to Broken Hill, Tweed Heads to Albury, and are all involved in all manner of emergency response with the protection of life, property, landscape being our core business. The FBU has submitted this paper under on behalf of members who are directly involved in the northern New South Wales uh, floods earlier this year. Some of this feedback even comes from the previous year's floods as well. Based off direct feedback from our membership, it has become abundantly um, and pertinently clear the Government of New South Wales must rethink the current arrangements for coordination and response arrangements of New South Wales emergency response agencies. 
I would like to premise the following points um, with, with this following statement, that the FBU value and respect the role of volunteers in emergency response as a support agency. They provide vital surge capacity and much needed assistance during these events, but the community of New South Wales should not, in 2022, with the scale of natural disasters we continue to see, need to rely on a volunteer workforce as their lead emergency response. The current New South Wales Emergency Plan nominates the New South Wales SES as the lead agency in the case of floods, storms and tsunami events. As, as outlined in our submissions, there are in, inherent difficulties in a volunteer agency being the nominated lead in major emergencies. Unlike paid staff, volunteers are, by their nature, an unreliable workforce. In emergency response where seconds can be the difference between life and death, loss of property and significant economic loss, it is vital that the initial response is active and ready to go at all times. It is not reasonable for the New South Wales Government or any other government to expect volunteers to perform in the same manner as a professional workforce. Professional firefighters, both permanent and retained, are some of the most acutely trained emergency response personnel in New South Wales and are ready to respond seven days a week, 24 hours a day, at a moment's notice. In this case, they are trained in incident management, all manner of emergency response activity, including land-based flood rescue and swift water rescue. Our uh, swift water rescue operators are ready to respond in the capacity on a 24-7 basis, whether being on duty or off duty. On top of this, these firefighters, our members, hone their skills day in and night by continuously responding to emergency events and putting their training into regular practice. Our senior officers are specifically uh, trained in incident management and response, equipping them with vital knowledge and skills and experience to manage in incidents of this nature and manage incidents on a day-to-day -day basis as part of Fire Rescue New South Wales core work. This sets them apart from a volunteer workforce. Fire Rescue New South Wales officers and senior officers have hundreds of incidents under the belt, and yet when it comes to a large-scale incident uh, such as this, a less experienced agency, through no fault other than not having anywhere near the volume of work that Fire Rescue does day to day, are put in charge. Our submissions outline various failings of SES as an agency to properly train and equip its volunteers to respond as a lead to these events. Various previous inquiries into past events and other submissions of this inquiry have made similar submissions, however, seem to have fallen on deaf uh, ears. If you therefore submit that Fire Rescue should be designated to be the lead combat agency to tackle these future catastrophic disasters. The FBU further submits that in delegating Fire Rescue New South Wales as the lead agency for flood storm uh, and uh, major events, the government must also ensure they are uh, adequately funded to perform the role. This government has consistently let professional firefighters uh, uh, underfunded uh, and, and, and they've let them down in ensuring they have the necessary resources to do their job. In just one example, which was in the submissions during this event, Fire Rescue New South Wales with water rescue operators reporting to having to purchase their own wetsuits to respond, as they simply weren't readily available from Fire Rescue. This penny pitching from the current government must stop if we are to ensure the community of New South Wales gets the response to these major emergencies it deserves. Professional firefighters call on the government to review not only the response arrangement for New South Wales emergency response agencies, but also the funding allocated to ensure the agency best place to provide an immediate response is properly funded and resources. Uh, resourced. In our submission, the FU has made nine recommendations, which we are happy to take questions on. And thank you again for the opportunity to appear today. Thank you, sir. For happy to give that speech to Hansard if they want it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll start with a very quick question, and then I'll turn to my colleague, Penny Sharp. Sir, why were... Um, your members purchasing their own wetsuits for flood rescues? There was none available. None available? No. Or... Unfortunately, we've only got the, uh, the the ones that we have on our trucks and only a, one spare or two reserve caches. And the reality is in the scale of this sort of disaster, we had multiple teams in the field, not enough equipment. Not enough. Is that, is that an ongoing issue or something new? No, that's an ongoing issue. Um, and it certainly doesn't just apply to wetsuits, but the vehicles that our members drive aren't fit for purpose. So what you'll find with the Queensland model is that they have appliances and trailers to deploy the vessels that they use. And Queensland Fire Service is the primary agency for support or rescue in Queensland. Um, we strap our vessels to the tops of four-wheel drives with gaff tape and whatever means we can. Now, obviously, there's a health and safety risk to all of that, but obviously it takes a um, lot, lot more time to get that boat out and into the field and therefore as we know, seconds 
matter in these events. So having, us having fire rescue properly equipped with the proper, proper resources um, and, again, the proper training, uh, it, it is an ongoing problem, unfortunately. Now, you said um, fit for purpose. What were you referring to on, on the, in the north coast floods? So the vehicles that we've got up there are just four-wheel drive twin cuts, whereas, obviously, um, the ones that Queensland have are fitted out. Uh, they have put the gear into the back. They have um, special sections for all that gear, so you don't get contamination into the cab. You also have trailers that deploy the vehicles rather than putting them on top uh, of the roof. So they are fit for purpose. So does that de delay response times? It can do, yes. Okay. Penny? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your submission and um, thanks to your members for all their ongoing work. Um, <coughs> I wanted to just uh, perhaps ask you, just to start off with, um, when the floods were happening, and SES is the lead agency in Lismore, can you just tell us, like, when are you asked to deploy? How, who gives you the order? When did that happen um, in the most recent floods? That's a good question. Um, generally, fire rescue and the way that our communication centre works, they are looking at these events into the future. They obviously uh, get their reports from the bomb and a number of different um, uh, um, agencies that provide that sort of information. And what Fire Rescue does is they start pre-planning what they will do if, if called upon. Um, they start talking about how many strike teams they can put into the field, where our swift water capability is up to. They even start making phone calls to off-duty swift water operators saying, are you available and ready to go if we need you deployed? We are waiting, unfortunately, though, for the SES to make those decisions. Um, my understanding is that we had um, more swift water operators um, in those two days leading into the weekend in the field um, than the SES. Uh, we could have had more, but we weren't called upon for those resources. Yeah, and so when were you called? We, we would call it the sort of when all the evacuations were starting. Was that, was that when you so were we had two the green light? Yeah, so we had two teams in the field, but then after that, yes, the, the green light was then given, but even then it was at a very limited space. Um, the other thing that goes on is obviously our senior officers, which are scattered obviously across New South Wales, uh, start to get put into um, uh, the emergency operations centres, but they're put in as liaisons generally, um, rather than incident controls. And so, what? So, for your for your members um, in Lismore at the time, can you take us through the kind of how how do you? So you're in the incident team. So there was a I saw a picture of it on the news yesterday because they're going to upgrade it. The incident response team. You've got people in there. Is that right? Yes. Um, but SES is obviously providing. Correct. The overview there, um, and so were there issues with being able to deploy your swift water assets? What I would say is that in the initial stages, there wasn't enough swift water teams on the ground uh, in, in in the at the incident to do what needed to be done. But you could this small more that you're referring to. Sure. Well, and nearly any other flood event. If you go back to Port Macquarie, it was our people that, um, the year before, it was our people nearly solely that saved hundreds of people. Um, and what is the role of fire and rescue with Resilience New South Wales? What's the interaction there? Well, we don't see that we have any, because we, to be honest, we're quite confused about what Resilience New South Wales does. I mean, they've got a $1.2 billion budget reported um, in the papers over the weekend um, with only 200 staff. We've got 7,000 staff and we're at $800 million. Yet they have no response capability. Certainly none that we would agree with that they should have anyway, because um, inserting themselves if they do, which I think they did in this event, only created confusion. Um, and so, so you're not aware of the kind of pre um, prepared you know, the, the pre-planning, I mean, you've just described, obviously, you've got your own incident rooms, you know the rain's coming, you, you, you're aware that you might have to be deployed, you start to gather your resources. There's no, that you have no, there's no sort of agreement around how that works through the SES and Resilience New South Wales? None that I'm aware of. Um, but certainly I think um, Resilience is a reasonably new organisation. It was supposed to take on emergency management in New South Wales. Um, I haven't seen them take on that role or, or even fill the role that they were performing to any extent that would justify $1.2 billion. Um, 
certainly, you know, I have a very biased view, to be fair, that a lot of that money should be going into frontline services rather than the back rooms. Um, I think one of the major, I think, um, problems with this flood is that you can spend a lot of money into different departments, but if you don't have boots on the ground in a very uh, quick and efficient way, and they're not resourced, well, that's the problem. Um, and it's certainly not the millions or nearly billions of dollars that you spend on X, Y and Z. It really is in when these events happen. You need a trained workforce, a standing army, which is what fire rescue and FBU members are, and you need to be able to deploy them legislatively, but also um, efficiently. Can, can I take you back? So what was your, what were the, I guess, the relationship or the interaction between your members and Resilience New South Wales? Um, I imagine they attended the same briefings. Um, I haven't heard uh, that. Uh, I think a lot of the problems that um, my members had was more with SES in regards to an uncertainty on what to do in this incident um, continuously throughout the phase um, of, the, of the disaster because obviously this one did go for a couple of weeks. Um, but again, f from what I've had reported to me, when resilience did try to insert themselves that wasn't particularly welcomed. So Now back to the SES. Now we had earlier evidence that there was incorrect information and information was coming from Wollongong. In fact, community radio operators, community radio people told us that the information on the ground was more accurate and they could trust that rather than what information from the SES. Did your members find that? Yes, I actually received a, um, a photo which isn't in the submissions. Um, <coughs> And, and I, I probably shouldn't put a foot unless you really do ask, and I'd ask for it to go in camera, but we did get a photo of a whiteboard of uh, the span of the control and the con control structures, and it looked like a bowl of spaghetti. And that's what people were using in these EOCs as the command structure. That's certainly not something that um, we learn in fire rescue, nor in any of the um, processes that even the, the police or ambulance do in, in regards to major incidents. Okay, take you back to that. So what is your criticism? Was it just... Well, there's no clear command structure. One thing that we're taught um, as all firefighters and police officers is that there is a clear command structure, uh, structure, and we're taught in that structure. There is one incident controller. They are trained to be an incident controller of whatever level incident that you go to. Everything stems out of that. Everyone has a role. Everyone knows who they're reporting to, where information's coming in, and how information goes out and how you bring your support agencies in, attacked onto that incident command structure. That doesn't appear to have happened, not only in this flood, but the previous last couple of floods that we've had in the Northern Rivers. Um, well, we actually had evidence that when Mel Lanyon was appointed, that problems were addressed when there was a command structure. Well, correct. I mean, the police run, I think nearly the same, Mr Roberts might know, the same training that we do around AIMS. Uh, which is done through the police um, training centre down there at Manly, um, that deals specifically with incident management. But I'll say this, because a lot of that training does get done by other agencies, this is not just about receiving the training. This is about implementing it day to day. And what you'll find with your professional agencies like police, fire and ambulance, because we go in day in, day out, responding to a small bin fire, up to you know that recent fire that we just had down there, uh, in the Shire, that scale of incident we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, if not you know week to week, we could have a two hundred uh, sorry a two hundred firefighter incident once every couple of months. Whereas obviously, fortunately, we don't have these incidents all that time. So I go back to the point of our submission was that you're having the people such as us or the police or even the ambulance service who are trained in incident management on a day-to-day -day basis and use that day-to-day. -day. The moment it gets a bit big it's handed off to a volunteer organisation that look after these events once a year, once every couple of years. And to me, that sounds like madness. Okay. Kate. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just uh, continuing along um, those uh, uh, lines, um, in your submission at um, paragraph 64, it just does seem extraordinary that you're describing emergency management meetings which are taking place, which contain senior local police command, fire and rescue New South Wales superintendents, local council and government management representatives, and you make the point all of whom are employed and trained to perform 
you know, particular roles, including in emergency management, yet the decision-making function rested with the volunteer member of the SES. I mean, that just is extraordinary and no doubt something that you have um, put to government time and time again or put to similar inquiries time and time again for that to change. Is that correct? Yeah, and it requires a legislative fix, which is hopefully what comes out of this, is that um, the SES, our RFS, our Marine Rescue, they all do a wonderful job. Um, but as we all know, the environment is changing and these events are occurring more and more. And um, what I think is, is, is near criminal is that you have standing armies already in place, professional standing armies already in place, and that is fire rescue. With 6,500 permanent and retained professional firefighters around the state ready to go, we know that they're online, we know what their levels they're trained to, and we know what capability they have. And the fact that you then move to um, a volunteer organisation to take over and run the lead on that, rather than support, because there absolutely is a role for volunteers to run this surge and support. We, we, we cannot fight these big um, incidents, whether it be a big flood or a big bushfire, without that surge. But certainly, um, yeah, they should be interlocking in underneath fire rescue or another you know, professional agency rather than taking control of. Because there's, there's a couple of, of things here. Firstly, um, I don't think your submission makes this point as well. Um, you would need far more resources, I'm assuming, in terms of um, uh, vehicles and, and rescue resources and then potentially paid firefighters as well skilled in <coughs> if you were to undertake it. I don't think it would be a matter, would it, of Fire and Rescue New South Wales just simply being able to, to take over that responsibility without additional resources? Uh, we'd need re additional resources. I would say some of the resources that have been spent just recently in the budget um, could be reallocated to Fire Rescue. Um, to say that that would be a, a, a ridiculously significant cost, though, I, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. Um, we already have... Um, my understanding is over uh, uh, more in water swift water operators than the SES. Um, they're on shift as well as off shift, and we can put those people into the field right now. Yeah. Um, to say that we couldn't take over, we're already there in those EOCs. We're just taking a backward role in, in, in those EOCs rather than taking command. Um, as for resourcing, you know, I don't see why we couldn't use the resources at hand if volunteers can't. Uh, be there in a timely fashion. Thank you. So Anna. it becomes a training issue rather than even a resource issue yeah. in some cases. And just my last question, although I, I, I could ask more um, in, in the time allowed. Um, so going to those volunteers, because we've heard so much, of course, um, in the media and everything about how it was the community who got there, the community who got out their boats, um, the SES, in fact, of course, warning people not to do that in the first instance, but the community stepped forward. What would Fire and Rescue New South Wales do differently then um, to enable, uh, to not hinder the community rescue service as well? Because I think some people listening to this would think, oh, please don't um, do something that would stymie the ability for volunteers and community to also be part of rescue efforts. What, what's your view on that? <laughs> Given what we saw in the Northern Rivers. I think the problem that we had in the Northern Rivers was that there was a view that enough wasn't being done, and therefore when people have a view that enough is not being done, then they fill that void. Um, one thing I believe fire rescue and the professional services do very well um, is they treat an incident as big as it can be, rather than as little as it can be. Um, the go big, go early um, certainly works in fire rescue, I'm not sure the police, which means you have an abundance of resources there and you start scaling back. What I don't think we see in these, in these floods is that we're trying to just address what we think we're going to have right in front of us. And unfortunately, um, you know, in all my years, when you are under-resourced something, it only gets worse in emergencies. And therefore, you're playing catch-up. And generally in fires, you lose, you lose, instead of losing a room, you lose a building or the one next door. In floods, if you under-resource floods, as we know, we're going to lose a lot more people. Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, I might just pick up on some of the questioning already about, about the swift water rescues and the uh, physical resources. In paragraph 39 in your submission, you talked about how you weren't called upon in the initial phase um, and 
you, you sort of believe that you, know, you would have had more boats than the SES. If you were able to be fully deployed with the resources you had, how many boats would you have been able to contribute to the rescue? Um, at, at this point, I, I'd have to get the exact figures from Fire Rescue, but yeah. we have um, accredited Swift Water teams at Newcastle, Wollongong, and my understanding is another five across the Sydney metro. Now, we also have um, a couple of spare caches. Um, really, what we needed in those situations was more operators on the ground. Mm. Um, my understanding, there were spare boats out of the SES. Um, and again, this is where I go back to Ms. Famine's point around maybe not necessarily needing more resources, but the reality is we need more people to use the resources that we have. Can I just, just direct yeah, what, sure. So are you not allowed to use, if you've got, yeah. your, your officers are not allowed in the SES boats, is that right? We're allowed in the SES boats, we're not allowed to operate them. So if they don't have anyone, then the boat doesn't go? Correct. Well, well, are, you, are your boats uh, considerably different to how their boats operate? Um, I'm, I'm being a bit facetious here. No, no, right? our swift water boats are, don't have a motor, so they're more like an inflatable kayak, yeah. and that's to get in, in around the built environment a yeah. little bit more, as you can imagine, in floods, and to actually go into houses with them and so forth. Um, our boats that we have with our hazmat, again, our fire rescue is hazardous materials, and we're the combat agency for that. They were not called um, at the start, as obviously with floods is one of the biggest problems that you've got up there, and there was a lot of contamination. Our hazmat teams weren't initially deployed into that area either, which they should be, but our hazmat teams also come with boats. Um, they're a lot smaller than the SES, maybe not necessarily all fit for flood work, and they should be. Again, um, I think our, some of the stuff in fire issue probably should start being upgraded to being cross-purpose and cross-capability. So I just want to go back to, to the observation you made. So you had a situation where... If you, they weren't your boats, you couldn't operate them. Correct. Did you have situations where your your members just said, bugger it, we'll do it? None that have been reported to me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to but certainly I understand that in other flood events, um, that has occurred. Well, take matters into their own hands, so to speak. They, they under the Act, they are allowed to um, commandeer things. Yep. Um, but again, you know, if things are locked up... <clears throat> It's a little hard to access these things. Now, point 34 says many FBEU members described a lack of information about what they were being asked to do yep. and or what plan to follow. Information received was vague in nature. There was a lack of direction, and at times it is unclear who, in fact, was in charge on the ground. When an incident controller could be identified, member reported that at times the person seemingly lacked the experience or training to be making relevant decisions regarding the response. Correct. So you had, did you have people with inferior experience to your members providing instructions to your members? Oh, again, I'm pretty biased on that, Walt. I'd say that my members are probably better than <laughs> nearly any service. But what I will say, I suppose, to back some of that commentary up yeah. is that every single senior officer that we have that wears a uniform started as a firefighter. So they start as a recruit, they go through the ranks, they do a number of years, and to get to station officer, which is our first officer rank, at the moment, it takes eight years to go on to inspector is another couple of years. To go on to a superintendent is another couple of years after that. So at a minimum, people that you've got in charge of our medium-sized incidents at superintendent have at least had 15 years, if not more, in the job. And that's day-to-day that's -day incidents running from when you're a firefighter doing the work to a station officer running a crew to an inspector running a zone of 20-odd stations. That level of experience you, you don't get from anywhere else. You don't learn it in books. You don't learn it on you know um, any diagrams or even on a course. You learn that in job-to-job -job experience. And I think that is the difference between your professional agencies and your volunteer agencies. Mark, you had a follow-up, and then Catherine. Yeah, just um, just quickly, <coughs> New South Wales, well, you're obviously fairly critical of, of their role here, but is... In your view, is there any place for resilience in New South Wales, or is it just a failed experiment that we need to walk away from? I'd kill it. I'd kill it. No. And I don't mean to be blasé about no. that. I don't see the point of what they need to do. You've got your local emergency management committees that should be dealing, I think, with the preparation going into events, whether it be a bushfire or a flood, or any other sort of major natural disasters. And then afterwards, I, I think you 
I think what we're saying in, in, in Lismore, and I think it, the government's acknowledged this, is that a New South Wales state-based agency is not delivering um, what they need at a local area, and they've now set up, what is it, the Northern Rivers Building Cor Corporation or whatever that is to deal with that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I, 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 it feels like a $1.2 billion bureaucracy of kind of doing nothing, which isn't already being done. Yeah. Catherine? Thank you. Thank you. I understand that you're referring to the Lismore floods because you talk about two people losing their lives. Are you aware that four lives were lost? My apologies, sorry? In Lismore, four lives were lost? Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, my understanding, yes, there was four lives. Okay, yeah. just to refer to the two. Oh, my apologies. Interested in the entire in Northern Rivers region where the yeah. flood unfolded and there isn't any fire brigade mm. in many of those towns. Um, such as where, Miss Cusack? And I don't have the list of stations, but we have a station at Lismore, Ganalabar, Ballina, Alstonville, Grafton. Wardell. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have one in Wardell, I don't No, think. so just there are many river towns. Are you suggesting that the SE, that SES should be replaced in their leadership role by the fire brigade? So yes, at, at, okay. at, at an incident level. How many rescues did the fire brigade perform in the floods? I don't have that rivers? information, but... I believe Fire Rescue provided that in their submission. Right. But it, it, would, it would be hundreds, I would suggest. Hundreds out of tens of thousands? Oh, I, I, again, Ms. Cusack, I don't have those numbers. Um, unfortunately, Fire Rescue doesn't give me all the data that they've got. Sure. Is it the role of um, the Fire Brigade uh, to sound the flood alarms in this one? Um, it's funny, I was only speaking to a member about this uh, over the weekend because the the alarm, and I, I don't want to get this confused because I still don't have it quite right in my head about where this alarm fits into the scheme of things, but the alarm in Lismore is actually attached to the fire station, um, if, if for those that didn't know. Now, it wasn't sounded uh, the night before the evacuation was held. Um, the information that I received from uh, a member who works there and also lives um, uh, in that area was that they didn't want to upset people, they didn't want to put any undue pressure on people. Um, but the alarm could have been sounded because it had only been tested somewhat recently, is my understanding. The second time it came over the wall is that there was no electricity to it at that point. Uh, therefore, the alarm wouldn't have been sounded. Um, interestingly, um, from my understanding, there's been a request out of the firefighters up there to have a, a secondary backup source for the alarm so it can be sounded if electricity is out. And uh, at this stage, that's been denied. How many members of the fire brigade are there across the flood affected region, just oh. in terms of logistically dealing with rescues and for, managing for, the operations? For this event or in normal day to day? No, just in relation to this event. Okay, I'll take that on notice. I know that uh, we were sending, I think we sent hundreds if not thousands of firefighters up from Sydney um, over the... Sure. Over the month basis so look, that we were there, the, the but I'll the, take that on notice for you. The use of the fire trucks to uh, water out the mud affected residences is deeply appreciated. Everybody yeah. loves the sight of yeah. that truck coming down the street. I'm just no, really absolutely. want to acknowledge yeah. that. Um, and and to, to put into, I suppose, some context about what I was talking about, our standing army, we were having firefighters come from Albury, you know, every, every part of New South Wales where they were mm -hmm. spare. Uh, at the time, they could give up three to five days. They were going doing uh, three to five day deployments in the Northern Rivers. I guess there are two parts, though, aren't there? There's the, there's the emergency and then there's the recovery. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and, the, re and the role of the fire brigade in the recovery is amazing. Yeah. I understand when we visited in the Woolambar um, that there's certain things that you can do and can't do. Um, for example, there's a fire station in the Woolambar in a car parking case in mud, but the fire brigade's not allowed to post that off. So that... Can you repeat the question? So, so hosing out the mud yes. is really a great assistance. Yep. Yep. Uh, there's a fire station in Mwilumba, yep. um, and in one of the streets, I'm trying to remember, anyway, mud everywhere, yeah, right street. but apparently only the rural fire service can close it out and they'd left and the fire brigade who's actually in the town is not allowed to close it out. 
and community there to see if there's something you can do about this that would really help us a lot. So you, like, anyway, maybe you could take that on notice as to whether there are constraints because the, you've got a fire truck sitting there in that town. The, which is a, probably a totally different inquiry we could have. Um, um, excuse me. Uh, the, there are lines on a map, unfortunately, between the two fire services on yes. who, Very who, it, I totally agree. Um, you won't hear any complaints out of me about mer uh, merging those two services either, um, or making the quickest and um, most appropriate response. That would be one of the reasons, or the other reason would be is that they need fire coverage and that fire applies to be online for coverage for the area, and they don't have another uh, another um, resource available, but it does seem odd. Maybe I should ask the service. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you for your time. That concludes the uh, time allocated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to your members. <clears throat> now, um, Mr. Cornish. Thank you, Mr. Cornish. Would you um, state your name and a title if it's relevant, and um, either an oath or an affirmation? My name is Lindsay Cornish, um, and I was previously a recovery centre manager up in Ballina. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Uh, now, Mr. Cornish, under the um, rules and regulations of this committee, you are permitted to make an opening statement if you wish to do so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity today. Um, I firstly want to make it clear that I'm appearing here today in my personal capacity. I did have the opportunity um, to um, run and manage a recovery centre in Ballina for three weeks between the 2nd and the 22nd of May this year. And the evidence I wish to give you today is based on my personal views of what I experienced uh, managing that centre. Um, but I want to acknowledge that every human being that I came into contact with who was involved in the recovery effort was absolutely um, passionate and committed and gave everything they could and were often very disappointed at not being able to help people more. So any observations that I have are related not to the people who are delivering those services. And that went from the top to the bottom. Yep. Um, it's around the processes and the, the infrastructure. Thank you. Ah, OK. That's true. Would you like to do an opening statement? That's was it. That it? That's my opening statement. That was your opening statement. We'll start with questions, Ms. Cusack and then Mr. Roberts. Oh, thank you. Well, perhaps I can ask you what lessons should we learn from your experiences at the centre? Indeed. Uh, look, I, I, was, I was a bit surprised. I had the opportunity to go up there for a period of time um, and um, the process that was set up there was um, quite interesting but very, very manual. And what I got from that was um, the service or the, the experience from people that were coming into the recovery centre who were looking for help um, weren't necessarily getting um, the greatest um, possible experience they could possibly have. So these people are people that need help. They've lost their homes, they've lost their possessions and um, most of the people that were coming in didn't have a computer, didn't have access to internet, didn't have smartphones. So they wanted to come in and speak to somebody to get some help. They didn't know what help they could get so they wanted help to find out what it was, um, how they could get it and get someone to help them to do that. Um, and some of the processes that were in place were quite uh, restrictive. We had very confusing grant situations where there was conflicting information about grants and about how you went about going them, about go going about getting them. Um, and there was um, a, lot of, a lot of manual work being done, such as, you know, filling out forms and having to scan them and email them in and um, things were getting lost and you know, the whole process was quite um, unsatisfactory from a, from a point of view of a person who's already gone through a, a process and lost a lot, who wants to come in and get some help. Um, from what, you know, what I could see, um, the experience wasn't very satisfying from their point of view. So Mr Cornish, I mean I visited the centre a few times think, and I agree, everybody, every staff member, and I know the centre stayed open well past its hours. 
Um, but it was like a production line, wasn't it, in terms of people entering, getting information and then moving through the various steps. Um, in relation to Service New South Wales, who were dealing with grant applications, um, that was a major area where people got stuck. Can you just talk about the impact that had on the whole process and on the queues of people waiting for information at the centre? Yeah, so the, there was obviously there was two grant, two major grants that people were interested in, who were just you know, apart from any of the, the rural sort of primary producer grants, and there was the, the back home grant, which was done through Service New South Wales and could be done online, and there was the disaster relief grant, which was processed through Resilience New South Wales. Um, there was a bit of confusion about which one people should go for. Um, people coming in obviously had no idea which would be best for them. Um, but at the same time, as, as staff working in the centre, we didn't know either because we were getting information that. You could definitely get this amount from one grant and you might get more from the other one. Um, towards the latter part of my tenure up there, it was apparent that people who had applied for the disaster relief grant were actually getting less than they would have got had they applied for the back home grant. Um, and on top of that, there's this process where people come in <coughs> and they establish their identity and they bring in evidence of their bank documents and their resources they have and um, they bring in photographs. Um, and then if they have to apply for another grant, so they might be entitled to a certain grant from the back home grant for contents of their home. They might also be entitled to one for the rental support grant. Um, each time they go through this process, it's the same thing. They go and produce their documents, they go and produce their identification, they have to establish where they were, where their house was. That all took some considerable period of time and it actually took a toll on the people. We could physically see them coming in frustrated about having to go through this process again and again and again. But for the services New South Wales, of whom staff, who there were only two doing these grants, they also had to assist people with their documentation, didn't they, given that many had lost everything in the flood? And that this was, to just have two people managing that entire process, it's not very, it's very dysfunctional in the centre, no. isn't it? In the time that I were there, the, the I don't mean any disrespect. No, no, no. Those people, I, mean, oh, I saw them; they were almost in tears. The two people who had to do all of this were just almost yeah. broken down. The the service New South Wales people that that were in the centre when I was there were absolutely amazing. Yes. Um, the contingent had grown by the time I got there, so there was um, we usually had at least five on every day. Those five people were kept extraordinarily busy trying to manage. Um, a whole range of things. So not only were they doing the Service New South Wales um, back home grant, which was kind of the bread and butter, but they were having to do all sorts of inquiries relating to people who had lost documents. Um, by the time I got there on the 2nd of May, there was previously up until that point a representative from Housing, from Department of Just, uh, Communities and Justice in the centre. They stopped turning up, wasn't quite sure why that was. Um, so all of those people that then came in who didn't have anywhere to live and needed urgent housing or had some acute housing needs, um, we were essentially referring them to Service New South Wales and they were taking that on board as an extra thing to do to try and then ring housing to try and sort out the housing um, situation. So, um, and you know, they never whinged or complained about having to do any of that, they just yeah. went on and did it, but it was, it was pretty onerous for those Service New South Wales people, day in, day out, faced with a whole range of things, some of which they knew what they were doing, some of which they were just learning on the spot. Just one more question. Yeah, so we've had a lot of evidence about communications, about the program, communications to the victims, communications to the community about what was going on. And I just, I'm, I'm aware that there was an incident in the Ballina Recovery Centre where people incorrectly believed that it was going to close. And I just wondered if you might share that story with the committee, um, because to me it highlights the need for better official information to the community. Um, look, there was there was certainly some communication issues. That was one of them. Um, that we had people coming in saying, "Oh, we, we didn't think you were here. We thought you were closed already." Someone did a post on Facebook. And Somebody did a post post on Facebook there yeah, that that it was closed or it was closing. Um, there was uh, anecdotal evidence that people had thought the recovery centre was actually the um, the centre that was set up adjacent to Bunnings immediately after the the flood event. Um, didn't realise that there was actually a separate thing called the Recovery Centre out at the, the Surf Club, which is where the Ballina um, Recovery Centre was. Um, there was issues around um, people would turn up with donations to give to the Recovery Centre, so they didn't understand that it wasn't a place to receive donations, it was a place for people to go and seek help. Um, and there, there was um, the, the site was originally going for seven days a week, um, and then it would reduce, it reduced down to five days a week. Um, and I happened to be in there on a, on a Saturday doing some work and a lady came in 
had no idea that the centre wasn't open. Um, so there obviously was some communication issues. And then um, towards the end of my tenure, they also um, started sending people out on what they called street visits. So these were people, mainly the, the interstate contingent um, people who had volunteered to, to fly in and assist, and they were fantastic as well. And they were walking through some of the most affected streets, knocking on doors, trying to you know, talk to people and ask them, you know, did they know they could get help? Uh, and as a result of that, we had several people turn up in the centre saying, we had no idea you were here. Mm. So, And then you did have some queues when the centre opened, didn't you, where people waited for maybe six hours but then couldn't be processed? And yeah, I will say I wasn't there at that time, um, but I was... The, the previous recovery centre manager that I spoke to said there were lines up out the door, down the ramp, um, yeah, people waiting for several hours. And then um, couldn't be seen. So maybe some surge capacity. I mean, I have to say, the way the centres opened on different dates, I kind of assumed that maybe there was going to be a rolling resource there to deal with the initial flood of inquiries, but that didn't appear to happen, did it? It, well, not, not to my understanding, and that would have been quite helpful. Um, I guess it's very hard to upscale to, to meet the demand of these things quite quickly. Um, so the way I got there was, you know, I responded to a, an expression of interest, you know, weeks and weeks after the flood event and, and went up to try and help out, you know, just to add a little bit. Um, but it would be, I think, quite helpful to have, you know, a contingent workforce that said these are people, you know, particularly across the public service who have got some level of training, who have spoken to their superiors to say, yep, if something happens, I'm available to go and help. And when something happens, they can be called upon immediately rather than have this administrative sort of process that takes, you know, three, four or five weeks to get them up there and, and get bits on the ground. Mr Cornish, earlier you mentioned about the two grants. So what happened when people did, when the people for Service New South Wales discovered that they were um, putting people forward for grants when they should have actually put them forward for other grants so they could get more of a, more support? What happened when that occurred? Look, and, and it's, <coughs> one of the problems is we didn't understand. So the, the back home grant was mm -hmm. clear. It was, you know, 10,000, 5,000, 5,000. So you could clearly, you know, if people were approved, they would get a certain amount. The disaster relief grant, um, we didn't know how much they could get. There was obviously some formulas for calculating based on the loss that had been suffered, how much um, a person was entitled to. But staff didn't know what that was. So they were proceeding on the assumption that if um, if you could get the disaster relief grant and you lost you know a hundred thousand dollars worth of possessions, you might get more than ten thousand as you would under the back home grant. So I just want to get this clear. So you had people working for the New South Wales government who didn't actually know what proper advice to give to people seeking assistance. Yeah. Well, I was running the centre and I I didn't didn't know, didn't have any sort of hard criteria to say you'll be better off on this one than you will on this one. Yeah, it was one speculative. You could apply for both. And, of course, if you once you were approved for one, you became ineligible for the other. So if you applied for the disaster relief grant and got 9000 then you became ineligible to apply for the 10000 So, Rod, Rod, do you have a question? Uh, just a couple. Uh, thank you, Mr Cornish, for your submission and for uh, appearing today. Can you take us back to the... Um, the situation in the recovery centres where people were coming in and retelling the story. So we've heard a lot about that um, from numerous witnesses. In your experience there on the scene, how how could that be changed? What could we what could we do better going forward? <coughs> yeah, look, it did appear to me that that there was a lot of duplication, and you know I could see that. Everything in the recovery centre was manual, so we signed people in on a piece of paper manually. We put post-it notes up to allocate people to desks. We sent them along to, you know, there was nothing, there was no system in place. Um, and I know that across government we have systems everywhere that can manage this sort of thing, like the, the you know, customer, customer relationship management systems where you could log somebody in, create a profile for them, then that person could go to the next service provider and their details are already in the system. You could put their evidence in there, their photographs of their home underwater, their bank statements. They could all go in, and if they're eligible for another grant, they might have to do something else. But the bulk of that work has already been done. Um, so they don't have to keep retelling their story and keep having to go through the emotional trauma of having to, like one of the things is people having to trot out photographs of their house underwater and looking at it again and, and getting emotional because, you know, they're seeing their house underwater again. So if we could just have them do that process once... Um, that would be really helpful. Um, and the other thing was that there was this big drive to collect data through the re recovery centres. 
to feed up to the resilience executive because they obviously wanted to know what's happening on the ground. They wanted to know who was coming through the door and they wanted to know why they were coming through the door, which is, which is you know, obviously understandable. Um, but again, all that was done manually, so it was all manually adding up and, and sending things through, you know, often before the centre had closed, trying to give statistics so they could go up, um, be funnelled up to the executive. So, you know, some sort of system where that was recorded, they could have that data in real time and they could just be looking at it and people wouldn't have to be running around, you know, trying to add things up at, you know, half an hour before close to work out how many people had come in, how many had people returned for a second or third time and what sort of services they were actually seeking. In your submission at point two, you talk about using data to target the resources. Could you expand upon that a bit more, please? Yes, yeah, so what was apparent after the, the street visits was that um, there were people out there living in homes that had been damaged by the floods who hadn't approached anybody for assistance. They hadn't um, been online, they hadn't been to a recovery centre, they hadn't applied for any grants. Um, and whilst the, the street visits themselves were useful in terms of... Um, the feedback was that people seeing um, people knocking on the door in, in government shirts saying, you know, we're just here to make sure that, you know, you know there's help available, um, was quite um, comforting for a lot of people and they enjoyed the opportunity to talk to people and, and tell them about their story. Um, so that was, you know, that was obviously a nice touch. Um, but it seems that if we had those records available where we could say, well, we know this, the houses that were affected by the flood, we know the people or the addresses that have applied for grants, if there are affected homes and nobody's actually come forward and applied for something, they're the people we probably want to go and knock on their door and say, did you know that there are things out there that we can do to help you? So, you know, all those sorts of technology-driven things, which I, I think, you know, I was a bit surprised to see that we didn't quite have those in the, you know, at to the capacity that I would kind of expect, um, given we've been through disasters previously. Um, so I'm just hoping that, you know, next time we get a, a a bushfire or a flood, that there'll be some thought going into that to improve the, the way that we deliver our services and make them targeted. And continuing on, you, you've mentioned to us about manually filling in documents and then having to scan them and then send them off to, I'm assuming, Service New South Wales headquarters. So there was no provision for data input on the spot at all? No, so for the disaster relief grant, so the, the back home grant, which was the Service New South Wales grant, was done online. The disaster relief grant, which was administered by Resilience New South Wales, was, was done on bits of paper. Um, they were scanned into a, a, a computer somewhere. Um, the scanner at Ballina didn't scan double-sided, so people were having to photocopy it and then scan it to try and get it into the system. Um, and then emailing it off to a, to a Resilience New South Wales central repository and then once a week or so, they'd be packaged up into an express post envelope and, and posted off to Sydney. Um, so until it was only the last, I think, I think the last week I was there, we started getting a list showing all the people who had applied for a grant. So we could actually then say whether they'd been received, because up until that point, we had no idea if people came in and said, I applied for my grant six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, do you know where it's up to? Um, we didn't have any idea whether it had even been received. Um, at the head office, so we were just, you know, flying blind and just saying, well, you'll probably just have to wait, really, which is quite unsatisfactory from our from our perspective. Yeah. Sure. Can you can you just explain to us about department housing as well? My understanding is there were department housing because obviously housing was one of the biggest issues. Am I correct in saying that people needing crisis accommodation, temporary accommodation, whatever it happens to be? My understanding was department housing were at the recovery centres for a period of time. And then all of a sudden they were withdrawn, and so you were left, you being the recovery centre workers, were left to deal with that as well. And it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that recovery centre workers were given like a 1800 number to ring for Department of Housing, the same number that members of the community were given. So recovery centre workers are sitting there on hold to make an inquiry about housing. Is, is that correct? Can you talk us through that a bit more? So, yes, that's correct. Um, I said when I started there on the 2nd of May, the, the desk with housing written above it was there, but there was no one there. Um, and we were expecting, I was expecting somebody to be there and nobody came and then we sort of heard later in the week unofficially that um, they'd withdrawn and there was a 1800 number for people to call. Um, about a couple of weeks after that, so probably the last week I was up there, um, they actually passed out a 1300 number, which was an internal number for the staff to use, which had a much shorter wait time. But between that period, 
it was really just a matter of ringing the number and waiting on hold. And uh, Service New South Wales people were, you know, as I said earlier, they were adding that to their, their their quiver of things that they had to manage, and they were sitting on hold and trying to get people, you know, crisis housing, emergency housing, so they didn't have to, you know, sleep in their car again or sleep out, you know, in a tent somewhere. Um, so that was, yeah, qu again, quite unsatisfactory. I mean, housing, you know, volume-wise, I wouldn't say it was every second person, but, of course, someone without somewhere to live is, you know, that's, that's one of our primary needs. And to have people come in saying, you know, I've got nowhere to live, um, and us having to sit on a phone and ring up trying to get some help was, it was quite frustrating. Well, sorry, sorry, Brad, can I just You're right, yeah. So what were the reactions from members of the community who came in seeking help and assistance and encountering someone on the same telephone line, express posting materials to Sydney or having a clumsy grant process and being told to relive the experience over and over again. What, what, what were the personal responses? What occurred? Um, well, obviously the range of emotions as you can imagine. So people were upset, people were, were sad, people were frustrated, people were angry. Um, it just kind of depended on the, the person themselves. Um, I mean, the, the people affected by the floods that I encountered were, you know, I think the most common phrase you get was, oh, you know, um, oh, but, you know, people had it worse than me. Mm. So people had their, you know, their home was only flooded three feet, not six feet. So they go, oh, lots of people worse, you know, worse off than me. Um, but still, when, you know, they knew there was a process that could help them um, and we'd be putting it out there, there's a process to help you, but that process wasn't, it might have been helping them, but it was not helping them in the in the best way possible. And you know, it was quite frustrating for a lot of them, and quite you know annoying. And um, you know, I guess they couldn't understand from from our perspective. We know there are internal things. We know there's Service New South Wales and Resilience New South Wales and Services Australia. But from a customer or a person who's affected by the flood coming in, they just want to see the government and they want to see somebody help them. They don't really care about our individual ways of working. They just want to know that they can get what they want um, and not be put through any more trauma in the process. Right, Catherine, do you have another? Oh, yeah. Did some people give up? I'm sure they did. We've had, we had a couple of people walk out. Um, I had a gentleman come in one day and he came in to, you know, as we do, we greet them at the counter and ask them what we can do for them today and started asking him some questions and he eventually just threw his arms up and walked out. Now, he'd been in before, apparently, so obviously the experience for him wasn't a particularly positive one, um, which is, you know, really unfortunate. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that hurts people that are working in those centres when they see people coming in that obviously need help and they walk away, you know, disparaged. Just ask about registering yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, go, go, go people ahead. who come in. Um, that, that's a kind of voluntary process. Um, I just wonder why we don't register flood victims and make it a more seamless experience for them based on the fact that they've identified themselves once, their address is there, and we can really tell a multitude of agencies, state and commonwealth, who they are without repeating that over and over. Why, why don't we do that? It's a very good question. A uh, bit, bit above my level to answer that question, but um, it, it seemed to me that you know, it's the sort of thing we do in government agencies, um, you know, all the time. So we register people, we give them numbers, and then we have a file on them and we can access it. You know, we tell them up front why we're going to access your information. We access it, we use it for um, purposes. So if we, as long as we disclose it, I don't know what, what the issue would be with actually recording that information and making it available to anyone who needs it to help those people. Excuse me, Catherine and Rod. We have a question from Scott Barrett online. Sure. Sure. Sorry. Thank you. And then we'll come back to that. Excuse me, you're looking to look forward, but you've got around that data capture. Um, how do we do that better? Is it the Red Cross who meets them at the first and tries to capture, tease out as much of the information as they will need going forward? Um, do they keep going back to that one person every time new information is needed? Or as they share information with different people, which I'd imagine would be a, another stress on top of everything else, do, that, do those people need to get better at capturing that into a, a central database or any other options that they might be? Look, I think that's exactly what it is. I think it needs to be captured, um, you know, once in a central database, which is, you know, going to be a special database that's created for that particular event, whether it's a cyclone or a flood or a fire. Um, we want to know where the person's address is. We want to know that it was affected by the floods. Um, obviously, there are people that will come forward and you know claim for things when their homes haven't been affected. So we've we've got that all that data. So we just need to make sure that we capture that, capture it once, 
Um, if people need to produce bank statements, they produce them once, they get stored in the system. If they need to produce photographs, we capture them, we store them in the system. Um, and then we make them available. If people are entitled to three or four different grants or subsidies, then we should be able to just simply access the data that's already in there and say, OK, well, look, that's there, that's there, that's there. And um, we can either process the application or if there's more information for a specific application, we can seek that out. Could some of this information be sort of pre-filled? For instance, they've got to have the addresses and names of every... They've got to have the names and who lives in every residence in that shire, right? On, on, if nothing else, the electoral roll. Um, could those sort of databases talk to each other to help populate some of this information that's needed? Um, I'm not a database expert, um, but... I can't see why not. I've, I've worked in areas previously where we, we get lots of databases to talk to each other all the time and you can overlay systems that will catch that data and, and suck it up and use it available for, make it available for other purposes. So I can't see why that would be too difficult. Um, and look, one of the other things is, you know, there are, um, there was a number of, you know, fraudulent instances where people have applied for grants for homes that they didn't live in. And then the person would come along to make their grant application and, of course, the Service New South Wales system wouldn't accept it because, you know, one grant per household had already been applied for that household and it wasn't the person that lived there. Um, so I think, you know, with a little bit more automation, a little bit less manual sort of working, you could pick up those things a bit, bit faster um, and make sure that, you know, that, that you're kind of mitigating against the risk of fraud um, a little bit, you know, better than we were because it was kind of flying blind when we just had to accept things and just, you know, put data in and, you know, push it through and hope for the best. Thank uh, you. Rod, do you have any, any oh, I'm questions? mindful of the time, Chair, and perhaps some of the okay. other uh, participants might like to ask someone. Sue, Catherine. Catherine? Okay. I think that concludes... Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm just maybe just one um, final question um, then. So I suppose just in terms of the, the, the role broadly of resilience New South Wales in terms of providing guidance, you know, there's supposed to be coordinating the recovery efforts. Um, what was your experience with um, Resilience New South Wales during your time um, heading up this recovery centre? Um, look, obviously, I think that the attitude of the people that worked for them was fantastic. Um, there was clearly some communication issues, clearly some um, clunkiness in the way that it operated and the way that um, things were done, um, you know, they said the equipment in the recovery centres wasn't really up to scratch. There was a lot of things that just didn't quite work seamlessly. Um, I can see that, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a relatively young organisation, but I think there's definitely a place for it, um, perhaps not in the um, incident responses, as my previous um, witness said, but in terms of the recovery, the way they were able to coordinate different agencies, I think was actually quite helpful. Um, we had, you know, interstate contingents coming in um, to help out and they were able to be coordinated through Resilience New South Wales and that was quite quite helpful. Um, it just seems there does need to be some, some ironing out of some of the processes and some of the communication. Um, I know when I left um, the recovery centre there was no one to replace me. Um, so, you know, there were some issues around um, continuity, which is one of the other things is people would come in for very short periods of time, maybe a week or two weeks, and they would leave. So, the information that they gained, the knowledge, the experience was then lost and they had to start again. Um, so that wasn't necessarily, again, a very seamless way of um, people coming in looking for help to experience that. So, Can I just ask, how did you end up being at the recovery centre and how did you end up leaving? Uh, I applied for an expression of interest that went around through the state government to say anybody who's interested in going up and helping with the flood relief efforts, put your name down, and so I did, and they rang me and said, when can you go? And was that resilience that put that out, or do you know who in government? It was through, it was through resilience. So it was a, essentially a succumbent to resilience New South Wales for a short period. Yeah. And you left because? I was only you, there for a finite period. That yeah. was my tenure. Thank you. Can I? Yeah. Right, so right. when you took over, I think second of May. Yes. Correct. Did you get a handover from whoever was the coordinator before you? So I was extremely fortunate in that I did get a handover. But apparently I'm one of the very few that that happens to. So, yeah, I was... And the person who had been there had been there for some time. Um, so I found that extremely helpful. In fact, I would have been, you know, in a much, much more disadvantaged position had that person not been able to spend some time with me to, to actually, um, you know, do that handover with me. Sure.
and the person that followed you, were you in a position to give them a hand over? Well, they're, I don't, they're, as far as I know, there wasn't anyone that followed me. Okay. And just for clarity, you ran the Ballina Centre? Did That's you work correct. at any of the other ones as well? So we also had the uh, recovery centre, the hub we called it out at Wardell, which was two days a week, uh, and then we ran outreach centres at the Jali Aboriginal Land Council in Ballina. We had Camp Drew up at uh, Lennox Head, and there was a, a site out at the South Ballina Caravan Park, which housing had essentially procured a whole bunch of homes to put people in, and we'd go there once a fortnight and do the mobile visits to help make sure people were OK and see what we could do to help them. So the difficulties that you've outlined and experienced in your operation, that was the same across all those centres? And yes, yes, exactly. That's it for my chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cornish, for your time, your submission, and making yourself available. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> I think we will now re... We'll take our lunch break and reconvene at 1.15. Yes. Thank you, um... I'd like to admit our next witness. Would you please state your name, position title, and swear an oath or affirmation? Mr. Rose? Thank you, Mr. Secord. Uh, my name's uh, Danny Rose. I'm the Technical Director for Floodplain Management Australia. Um, I'll make the following affirmation. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Now, under the rules and regulations of this committee, there is there is um, an option of a short statement if you wish to do so. Do you wish to do so? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commence. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present evidence on behalf of Block Home Management Australia today. FMA is the peak national body for floodplain management practitioners in Australia and we represent over 170 members from local governments, catchment management authorities, state agencies, consultants, <coughs> actors, suppliers and individuals involved in the state in the flood industry. We've built strong partnerships across government agencies including the Bureau of Meteorology and State Emergency Service and other bodies such as the Insurance Council of Australia. We meet quarterly, hold a national conference annually, and we have a library of over 60 years' worth of research papers into every facet of our field, giving our members access to all aspects of best practice floodplain management. In our submission to the inquiry, we've emphasised the following issues in relation to the preparedness and response of government and our communities for floods of the nature seen earlier this year. One, flooding is our most costly but also our most predictable natural disaster. While many of the February and March floods were floods of record at various gauges, they were well within the realms of probability based on existing flood studies and management plans. This information is freely available to the response agencies in the community, but there are barriers to communicating this information, especially where warning times are limited. Two, we need to urgently implement the findings of the Productivity Commission's 2014 inquiry into natural disaster funding arrangements. To correct the ongoing fund funding uh, paradigm of 3% on studies and resilience projects and 97% on recovery. We know that every dollar spent on mitigation works can save $10 in reducing direct flood damages. And this does not account for indirect costs of flooding such as stress, health impacts, lost employment and environmental uh, issues. If we spend this number three, if we spend this money on updating and expanding our flood studies and making risk-based investment decisions for engineering works like levies or land use measures such as property buybacks, um, um, it, local councils need significant technical and financial support to implement and manage these projects. There has been a systematic downsizing and de-skilling of the traditional government agencies that councils turn to for the support and this needs to be addressed. And fourth and finally, FMA has long advocated for stronger links between our floodplain management and land use planning schemes to reduce current and future flood risks. And we have provided two position papers relating to this for, for your consideration. 
We support risk-based development and trials that consider the full range of flood intensities, including climate change scenarios, not just the singular flood standard like the one in 100 flood. Flood risk needs to be intrinsically built into strategic land use planning at the state, regional or local levels, all supported by clear and consistent government policies and guidelines. And with that, I'm happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mr Rose. And we'll start with um, Ms. Ms Sue Higgins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rose. Um, can I just take you to the floods that took place on the Richmond floodplain in the north? Um, yeah. We've received quite a bit of um, evidence from various agricultural interests across the floodplain that have called for more active management in terms of cleaning out drains, um, that sort of works in the sort of mitigation um, program. With your knowledge of floodplain management, is that something that you think could have had a beneficial impact in terms of the flood at the scale and impact that we saw in the northern rivers? Or is that you know, is that a mitigation, is that a sort of measure that would not have a dramatic impact in terms of what we saw in terms of scale in the Northern Rivers? Um, it's an interesting one and I'm, I'm based um, in Tweed Shire, so I understand and I've heard very similar um, comments from the Tweed community. Um, in my opinion, those sorts of drain management and um, river management techniques would not have made a significant impact on the peak of the flood um, or the duration of the flood. Um, <coughs> my experience is that they, those sorts of techniques are effective in managing agricultural runoff um, and drainage of those areas. A lot of those areas are only um, able to be farmed because of previous uh, drainage measures and mitigation um, works like levees and floodgates and pump systems um, and all those flood mitigation uh, assets do need to be maintained long term for them to be effective but um, because of the volume of, of water coming down the, the Richmond, the Wilsons, the Tweed, all the, all the northern rivers um, during those events, um, I don't believe personally that um, those drainage-based so solutions would have had a, had a measurable impact. And Mr Rose, just as a follow-up, thank you very much for that. Um, just as a follow-up, which is a bit of a sort of two-pronged um, question. One, um, there was, there's been quite a lot of discussion in the North about the need to um, revegetate the upper catchment areas. If I could have your comments on that just briefly. And um, the final part of that is also um, what you raised in relation to what you raised about buybacks. Um, on that Richmond floodplain, do you think that there is actually a, a case that looking at some of those riparian areas, we pro perhaps should be broaching that topic of buybacks? in order to allow the floodplain to function, particularly in those riparian areas? Okay. Um, the, my understanding is revegetation of upper catchments can be quite effective, um, but it needs to be looked at based on the um, characteristics of, of the catchments. Some will be suitable for that and it may have um, benefits for um, Others, it may not be because, it, for example, it may slow down water coming down one tributary that then coincides with other other peaks coming down other tributaries. So it, it can be it can be beneficial, or it could uh, act to um, worsen flooding in some situations. Um, it, it is certainly beneficial in trying to slow down water, um, reduce uh, scour, reduce. Um, the export of, of large amount of sediment uh, down rivers, uh, and we, we, we saw a lot of that type of damage in the northern rivers flood. Again, because of the volumes of rain and runoff that, that occurred in this particular event, I'm not sure any amount of revegetation would have really made a material uh, difference. 
uh, just because of the volume of, of rainfall. Or your second question in terms of buybacks to allow for riparian uh, planting. Um, it's I, again, it's it's not a field of field I've really been um, professionally involved in, uh, but uh, in my opinion, it should be something that's negotiated with with landholders uh, because there's a lot of benefits for those landholders in re-establishing those green corridors and, and setbacks to to the to the rivers. As I said, it stabilises uh, things like fence lines, um, access roads. Uh, pumps for, for irrigation. Um, so rather than buying back uh, rural or agricultural land for those purposes, I, I think the first step would probably be working with those landowners with um, assistance from local land services or other agencies to try and uh, come up with beneficial partnerships. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Ms Penny Sharp. Thank you. Thank you very much for your submission. A um, couple of questions from me. One is, um, you, you said in your opening statement that um, the sort of flood, probable flight um, heights um, were actually entirely predictable and are within, within the um, models that exist. Do you have a view about how it is that we keep getting told we just got it wrong? Um. Yes, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, in terms of, and I'll use the, the Tweedshire example, I'm not aware of any properties um, that, that were impacted by the flood in the Tweed Valley um, that hadn't been shown in some sort of mapping or property system um, to have been flood liable. Um, we, we do studies uh, and they're funded um, but they're, they're funding assistance from the Department of Planning and Environment to do so. And one of their requirements in doing a flood study, a, a contemporary flood study, is to model the full range of flood events right up to the probable maximum flood. Uh, even in Lismore, where a flood occurred that was um, several metres higher than floods of record and exceeded the 100-year flood, it was still, still within, well within the realms of prob probability. Um, so floods higher than, than has or had, had occurred in this morning, February, could, could conceivably occur. Um, equally, um, floods of record or, or floods of equal rarity could occur in the Hawkesbury or uh, um, the Hunter or any, any number of rivers. Um, so it is conceivable and we can, even though they should, they're, they're rare events, um, what we need to do is consider the um, escalating consequences of those rarer floods and make sure that the planning is, is, is in place for those um, rarer but, but more impacting floods. Yes, thank you. Um, and this is sort of a tangential, but I know your submission, you know, obviously, I mean, it's clear that local government and others need more support in terms of the technical guidance um, to make these plans and to do that work. Is there, um, is there, do we have a workforce issue here as well though, which is that there aren't enough people with the skills to be able to do this work? Um, to some extent, um, the, the industry has changed a lot um, in my almost 20 years of experience. Um, the, the, it's because because the technology now allows us to do um, a lot of modelling of floods, uh, very complex flood studies, um, complex statistical analysis of rainfall and runoff, it is very much the realm of, of the private sector to, to do those studies now. Um, so it is very typical, except for all but the, the largest um, city or regional councils, um, to, if, if they're undertaking a flood study, they, they would be uh, engaging professionals from the consultancy world. Um, they're very well equipped, um, but are in demand and, and, and cost uh, a reasonable amount of money. But the, as I said before, the state uh, floodplain management grant system uh, does support New South Wales government uh, councils in uh, engaging those professionals, probably where the where the skill set is lacking is then what happens um, when we do the management studies 
once we work out what that flood behaviour is and get a suite of measures, and they might be um, infrastructure, or they may be town planning changes, or they may be changes to emergency response, <coughs> um, the, the ability for councils to then um, implement those projects uh, is limited by, by project management skills within councils. Um, and we've seen a gradual de-skilling of, of the agencies that would typically support those projects, such as Public Works Advisory and Department of Planning and Environment, um, local land services, all, the, all those sorts of state agencies, where 30 years ago there, was, there were large teams of, of very skilled uh, professionals uh, and engineers. Um, that's gradually been uh, whittled away as, as people have moved away from the industry and there's understand that funding has been put into other focuses. Thank you. Uh, Kate? Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Rose, uh, thanks for, for uh, your submission and also the, the um, reports and um, the attachments that you uh, sent with it as well, which will be very useful. I just wanted to ask you to expand upon uh, your submission where you state, you, you, you alert the committee to the fact that the FMA has recently completed your draft position policy, which is the consideration of climate change flood risk in land use planning, which I understand was presented to your recent conference in Toowoomba. Um, but then you say that there are some differences between the floodplain management Australia's policy and the new draft flood risk management manual which uh, the department has put out and that you're working to resolve those issues with the department. Could you please, um, as simply as you can I suppose, uh, explain what those differences are and uh, how, you're with, yeah, how you're working to resolve those issues firstly? Uh, yes, um, very briefly I think um, we, we're very supportive of the of the draft manual as has been uh, exhibited by the department uh, and a number of FMA members, uh, including myself, were part of working groups in the in the formation and, and review of those documents. So over overall, FMA is is hugely supportive of the update to the manual and its its toolkit. Um, where where some of our um, our submissions back to the department on the on the document. Um, the, it was uh, considered to be a little too hefty for the majority of um, plot plane professionals, particularly council uh, exponents, to be able to use readily. Um, so we we requested some additional planning guidelines to uh, simplify the process. Um, and, and perhaps have some of the more technical information um, in, in other chapters. Um, there was still a feeling amongst uh, the FMA that, the, um, that there was still a little bit too much focus on the um, singular floods standard, um, the idea that we still should uh, look at the 100 year flood and, and, and apply freeboard. Uh, the manual has taken a number of steps away from that sort of approach and, and indeed its, its current um, format and possibly the one before has, has advocated a merit-based approach. However, however based on um, the information in our, in our position papers, we think that that can be broadened um, so that um, and, and worked. Because there's a link between the, the way the manual is trying to um, work with the planning system and the, and last year's uh, flock grown land package as well, um, which does give councils the flexibility to um, set different flood standards for different um, types of development and different vulnerabilities, um, but making that a little more um, uh, obvious to land use planners who don't um, understand the complexities of our, our flood models and the different size floods and, and the way that they're modelled and the hazards that come along with those uh, and, and create a bit more of a roadmap about how that can be 
are truly merit-based and truly risk-based for a range of different land uses. Another one, Kate? And then, okay, Catherine. Thank you, I'll, I'll Thank Thank you, you so much for this um, evidence. It's fabulous. <coughs> Can I ask um, what liaison you have with the Bureau of Meteorology in relation to modelling floods? Because uh, communities are very dependent on uh, what, what the Bureau says is likely to happen. I, I know it's not an exact science, but we're in an, a La Nina weather event at the moment. Um, catchments are saturated, so I'm assuming that the engineers and the expertise of your members are pretty important in understanding how to model for flooding. And I just wondered how that all fits in with what the Bureau is telling us during actual events. During actual events, there's no, there's no active um, involvement of, of the FMA in in what the Bureau does. Um, but outside of that time, we do have a number of links with the Bureau. They present at all our, our quarterly meetings and provide weather outlooks um, for, for the months ahead, as well as summarising um, events and, and activities that they've done in the previous quarter uh, and any learnings that we do have there. So there's a lot of shared learnings amongst uh, our industry representatives and the Bureau. Uh, in areas where improvement uh, can can be made. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, and and I think I think the best uh, link that the FMA provides for the bureau, or, or it's the, the FMA members linking with the bureau, is around um, involvement with the community and the local government stakeholders. Uh, in making sure that the Bureau are using the best available information, uh, uh, identifying gaps in warning systems and, and perhaps upgrades to, to gauging systems and, and the, the networks that the Bureau uses to um, make its prediction and monitor what's, what's falling on the ground. Um, but, but I wouldn't uh, be in a position to comment as to uh, how effectively their, their warning systems or, or forecast systems are. Um, but as you say, it is a very complex uh, system and we enjoy ongoing discussions and, and liaison with the, with the Bureau um, and do uh, sit with them on their uh, flash flood, flash flood um, consultative committee. So in relation specifically to this issue of the 1 in 100 year flood, which I think a lot of people are now starting to kind of get on board with what you're saying, that maybe that's not, that shouldn't be the focus anymore. Are you talking to the Bureau about that? Because just in terms of this language and terminology, um, it's really not clear to me who is driving the standards and how we should be thinking about these things. Yep, and we, we often hear from the Bureau and, and, and the SES that they, they really have no interest in whether it's a five-year flood or a 20-year flood or a 500-year flood. The 100-year flood standard is, is very much driven by land use planning um, and it doesn't really mean much to a, to a true um, flood modelling practitioner. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a certain size flood with a certain probability of, of occurrence. Uh, it's just that a lot of, historically, our, our flood planning systems, our land use planning systems, sorry, have been attached to this idea of the 100 year flood. Um, so the, the 1 in 100 flood is just the flood that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. Um, as we've seen in the 50s, in the 70s and in recent years, you can have several 1% floods or, or, or thereabouts um, very close together. Um, so I don't see it at all as a, as a failing in the, in the forecast systems or the flood modelling to say that um, we didn't know we were going to have a 100-year have a flood this year. It was more, I guess, it's the ability for the Bureau to be able to predict what appear to be um, rapidly escalating weather systems uh, and be able to get forecasts of how bad they may be out in enough time for emergency services and the other uh, response agencies to be able to do something meaningful with that. 
So with climate change, though, shouldn't we be updating these probabilities? And how, if so, how does that happen? Uh, yep, there's, there's been a whole um, body of work done, uh, led by um, Engineers Australia, I think it was. Um, there was a multidisciplinary team that, that updated a, a document called Australian Rainfall and Runoff, um, with its latest version being 20, 2019. Um, it took many, many years and experts from a range of fields um, to, to look at um, all, all, the, all the data um, and the weather um, recordings and how we can better represent and help assist the flood forecasters um, with, with that. Um, we rely on a number of uh, international models. Um, when I say we, the Bureau relies on a number of international models to um, try and predict what the weather will do. Mm. Um, often those models will have different different um, scenarios, and it's only when those scenarios start to line up between a number of models that uh, the accuracy of, of forecasting tends to uh, improve, and the, the, the further, further out um, the Bureau tries to make those predictions, um, the, the more uh, varying those uh, likely scenarios might be. So just, if I can just finish this, in relation to Sydney, actually, um, and the Nepean and the Hawkesbury kind of floodplains, and Warragamba Dam, um, we've been hearing evidence about how the dam should and shouldn't be used to mitigate flood, a height of floods. Um, how is that being informed by probability and climate change data and <coughs> the community is clearly of the view that it's not being managed at all. But I mean, is it being managed? And do you have views about those floodplains and how we're managing them? Yep. Um, I think the, the Hawkesbury and the floodplain is probably one of the most studied and modelled floodplains in Australia, um, possibly um, up there with the Brisbane River floodplain. Yeah, we, there's countless studies, um, scenarios, climate change, um, possibilities, um, the probable maximum floods run through there, and it's all that um, work has has helped inform Infrastructure Australia, um, the, um, the, the the Department of Planning, um, the, the member councils, and the communities there of the extent of the flood risk there. Unfortunately, a lot of, of the majority of that flood risk is is already sitting there on that on that floodplain. Um, so then it starts to turn to um, measures to to either try and hold back some water with measures like um, dam storage, diverting water with things like levees or, or channels, or then you, or, or um, channel widening and those sorts of schemes, or then you have to look at the, um, the, the warning and the town planning um, approaches to try and get either get people out of the way. Um, as, as an evacuation response or permanently through changes to, to our settlement patterns. So I, I, think I guess the question is, forward. are we doing a good job in that? Well, that's, that's probably a political question um, that, that I'm not, not able to, to answer. I think um, the, the, the technical side of it um, is, is done very, very well. It's then being able to make decisions where there's going to be winners and losers is the is the hard part. Just a quick just yep. one, um, just on on that. Then we've heard from both uh, some members of the community in the Hawkesbury, Nepean, as well as in the Northern Rivers around the Tweed in particular, about the potential impact of new development that will take place uh, in floodplain areas. Uh, not least of which will be to exacerbate the impact of floods on the, the, the um, existing um, development. Would you like to, to comment on your views about whether or not that can be done safely now, given what these communities have been through, in terms of new developments that are being planned for, for flood, flood prone areas in New South Wales? Yep, yeah, again, again, it's a very specific um, I guess equation depending on which which catchment and floodplain you 
you're looking at and what the the topography and the settlement patterns are as to whether the sum developments are suitable in the floodplain or not. Um, typically, if if and and even what sort of land use it is, because I mean um, development can be can be agricultural or recreational based, where where regular flooding is is uh, acceptable or <coughs> beneficial. But if we're talking about residential development, um, yes, we are. Yeah. First, first of all, um, it needs to be um, in a in a part of the floodplain that's that's compatible. Um, with, with the hazards, so if it is part of the floodplain, then it needs to um, be in an area where the water um, is not running too swiftly at too deep, deep a depth um, to um, provide um, unacceptable risk to, to buildings or people. Um, so it tends to be more around the fringes of, of the floodplain where that um, can occur. And then you need to look at Things like the impact on emergency services and the ability for those new developments to, to get themselves out of the floodplain and away from that hazard under their own steam rather than waiting for boats or helicopters to come to, to come and rescue them because as we've seen in these events, that scenario is extremely unlikely or, or even impossible. Um, all those steps have, uh, are built into the New South Wales planning scheme. Uh, as well as the existing and the proposed uh, floodplain development manual. So all the steps are there. Um, where, where local government um, and state agencies tend to, to have difficulties is dealing with the legacy issue of, of either past approvals or, or um, past zoning decisions that, that were made in the absence of, of good flooding data and perhaps just focused on the one one in 100 year flood, which as we've said is, is, is limited and not understanding the, the potential for things to get a lot worse in probable maximum floods. Thank you, Mr. Rose. That completes our time allocation. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you for your submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> to our four witnesses, um, starting from, I guess starting from Mr. Sutherland, would you please state your name your position and swear either an oath or an affirmation. Thank you, Chair. My name is Peter Sutherland. I'm a network operations executive from Telstra. Um, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Mr. Wells. Uh, thank you. Greg Wells, New South Wales Government Chief Information and Digital Officer. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jenner, you're on silence, sorry. All right, Luke Jenner, Chief Operating Officer of Essential Energy. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bronwyn Clear. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Bronwyn Clear. I'm the Operations Executive for Telstra Infoco. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, ma'am. Now, under the um, standing orders, there is a provision for an opening statement. If anyone would like to make an opening statement, can you please raise your hand, and then I'll call for you in turn. Okay, so one opening statement. Uh, Mr. Sutherland, please commence. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the members of the committee. Telstra welcomes the opportunity to appear before the committee today to provide more information about the role that we played during the major flooding across New South Wales earlier this year. The 2022 flood event resulted in widespread and significant impacts across many areas of northeast New South Wales and the Nepean Hawkesby area in the west of Sydney. <laughs> Tragically, we know that lives were lost, homes and properties were destroyed, and businesses were severely impacted or, in some cases, destroyed. We know that during times of crisis, staying connected is critical. In our long history, We've had ex extensive experience dealing with disasters and we work year-round to ensure that we are prepared to respond when a disaster hits. As soon as it's safe, we're often the first on the ground to assess and restore services during our following disasters. During our disaster, our first priority is the safety of our people, followed by doing all that we can to assess the impact and to restore services to, t to critical facilities. During the 2022 floods, our network experienced substantial physical damage 
which caused mass disruptions to our customers and to fixed line services. Across the flood affected areas, Telstra experienced outages at 124 mobile sites and there were some 60,000 fixed line services that were affected. In the initial days of flooding, network facility disruptions were largely due to loss of power as well as an inability to access sites, primarily because of flooding, uh, to connect backup generators and to keep them refuelled. However, once the floodwaters receded, the power utilities were able to restore mains power relatively quickly, and in many cases this enabled services to be restored. In some instances, however, we suffered physical damage to our assets due to water inundation or due to a fibre optic cable some distance away being impacted. Our technicians on the ground and many Telstra staff across the country worked tirelessly to restore services as soon as possible. We deployed technicians from other parts of New South Wales and indeed from other parts of Australia to the, to the areas. We express our sincere appreciation and thanks to the many brave and determined emergency workers, the ADF personnel and other individuals for the assistance that they provided to minimise the impact of telecommunications networks and to help restore services, often in very hazardous and challenging conditions. We hope that this is an opportunity for the committee to learn more about Telstra's recommendations regarding our response to natural disasters, the challenges we faced to, uh, to access our infrastructure during and after the event, and how we supported our customers. We'd also like to table a two-page document containing six images from the 2022 floods that, help, that may be helpful in answering some of the questions from the committee today. Thank you. Now, Mr. Jenner, I understand, did you want to make a statement? Yeah, I think you're on mute. Okay. The recent flood events across the north coast of New South Wales caused major disruption to the communities that Essential Energy serves. The flooding impacted almost 70,000 Essential Energy customers from Tweed Heads in the north through to Coffs Harbour in the south. The customer impact was almost as significant as the 19 to 20 black summer bushfires. Labelled the one in a thousand year event, unprecedented amounts of rain caused significant damage to Essential Energy's electrical distribution network and disruption to our customers who experienced subsequent power outages, many for an extended period of time. Essential Energy's Lismore and Wollumba depots were flooded, with the Lismore depot completely submerged. Electrical infrastructure across many towns in the northern rivers was also submerged including various substations which supply power to tens of thousands of customers. The Central Energy immediately enacted our emergency response plan and acted quickly to mobilise crews to begin assessing damage and making repairs where possible. 210 local Essential Energy employees were involved in our immediate flood response. Further, we mobilised an additional 250 employees from more than 30 locations across regional and rural New South Wales throughout the duration of the recovery. Essential Energy also used specialised contractors that were required, bringing our total complement on the ground to over 450. Access remained a key risk throughout the response, with landslips, boggy ground, roads and bridges washed away. Our crews used drones, helicopters and specialised fleet equipment to access isolated parts of the network. However, in some cases this was a slow process. Logistics and fleet teams offered supplies into the area, including food and water for our crews, new poles, cross arms, replacement substations, underground cable fuel and specialised fleet equipment, boosting local supplies as access to those items became available. We ensured that essential energy response was focused to our customers. We ramped up our call centre operations, provided daily operational updates and media interviews. In addition, given the communications challenges in certain areas, we had employees set up around the community to speak directly with our customers and used, utilised electronic signboards to alert the public and provided them hard copy fact sheets. Our ultimate objective was to deliver a safe, steady and sustainable response to this significant flooding event. A number of essential energies, local employees lost homes or experienced significant damage to their own or loved one's property. While the business was providing support to these people, their eagerness to assist with our response was testament to the strong and resilient <coughs> communities across the area. The Central Energy also worked with many other organisations, local, state and federally based, to collaborate on recovery. In particular, the Lismore Operations Centre provided a critical forum for coordination, prioritisation, knowledge sharing, communications and joint planning. I'd like to thank our employees, who I'm immensely proud of, for their tireless efforts to restore power, the community for their patience, resilience and support as we rebuilt the electricity network, and finally the numerous other entities who assisted us in this endeavour. Thank you, Mr Jenner. 
Um, Mr. Jenner, I'll start the questions. Um, when, uh, actually, sorry, what is the current status of um, electricity supply in Lismore, Lismore CBD? When we, were, um, when we were up there doing site visits, we were told that many homes still just have one cable with two little outlets. What is the, what's the current status of supply on the North Coast? So <clears throat> all premises on the North Coast have supply available to them. So the network, uh, the electricity network has been supplied to the premise. Um, New South Wales Central Energy isn't responsible or, or able to actually affect repairs inside the house. So that means um, homeowners need to engage that electrician to to carry out repairs inside their property. And currently there are about 1,500 premises that are that remain de-energised for safety. So that means that um, either the homeowner hasn't decided to re-energise or has yet to organise someone to carry out those repairs. When you say... Um when you say de-energized. So when a home is energized, do you count a single cable with two little outlets as being energized? So that wouldn't be, that wouldn't count as being energized because that, uh, so there's two factors. One is, is the power available to the customer's switchboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second one is, has the customer actually had an electrician check their installation, deem it safe, and restore supply into the actual premise. And in that case, that wouldn't include, uh, which is what I think you're referring to, which is where a single power point has been installed onto the meter board. But some, some electricians did to get power to people in, in a quick fashion. So when you say there are 1,500 sites that are de-energized, you mean there are still 1,500 sites on the North Coast without full electricity power? Correct. When will those, what's the timetable, so what are we now, almost three and a half months now. So what's the timetable to have those 1,500 back on deck? So for, from our perspective, we, we have power available to the premise. To the premise. Um, if the customer, if the house isn't, or the premise isn't, um, is intended to be re-energised, so in other words, the person hasn't decided to not reoccupy the property, um, the, under the way the legislation is constructed in New South Wales, the homeowner would need to engage an electrician to certify their property is safe, mm. and as soon as Sense Energy receives notification of that, we will, we will then make sure the premise is re-energised. Okay. I'll, I'll ask a quick question, Mr. Sutherland, and then I'll go to Mr. Barrett, who's asked. Um, you, will you, are you familiar with a community called Timbalgan? I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but I'm aware of it. Uh, that it's a, it's a region in northern New South Wales. Yeah. So what, what learnings and lessons do you take from previous, previous floods? Because I'll give you an example of what happened in Timbalgan. So the last flood, they moved, or Telstra moved the mobile phone towers to higher land. However, they put the energy supply and the support materials to the mobile phone tower on the ground. So as soon as it flooded, mobile phone reception was lost. So what learnings, what lessons do you take from previous floods and what steps are you taking so you in fact don't simply put the electrical gear on the ground so when a flood comes it immediately wipes away the service? So after any event we always do a review to, to determine the cause and what we can do to mitigate uh, any future events. Mm -hmm. I can't talk specifically about what happened to Timbalgan, mm -hmm. but, uh, but we certainly do take, uh, um, take, it, take steps to restore infrastructure in a way that makes it safer and less prone to incident in future events. Uh, for example, in this instance, there's a couple of sites where we're doing work like that. In Lismore Exchange, for example, we're putting equipment on higher floors. Yes. Um, and we're rebuilding uh, other sites in a way that's um, safe as well. In some instances, we have restored service as is, with reviews to be done uh, following the event, and you know, that will be ongoing over the coming weeks and months to uh, to assess whether we can do things in a more practical way to make them make them safer. One of the things we must always remember with telecommunications networks, though, particularly mobile networks, is they need to be close to the community. They serve the community; they can't be too far away. Uh, the further away they are, the uh, the less um, service they provide. So we've got to balance all of those things and make sure that we're doing all we can to So why was the service. major mobile phone hub placed in Woodburn, which was one of the areas that was, the, in fact, 
the hardest hit by flooding. Why would you put all of the materials, all of the mobile so phone support in an area that was flood prone? You mean in the Woodburn Mobile Base Station? Yeah. Well, the Woodburn Mobile Base Station was in an area that, uh, that serves the community of Woodburn, so that's why it's built there. But it didn't occur to you that it was in a flood prone area? Uh, it would have, and, uh, and, and certainly you know, the flood event in this case was so much higher than it has been in previous years, and it was unprecedented, and as a result the, the site did get inundated and was unable to operate as a result. Um, so have there been steps to sort of scatter out the mobile phone support area so you don't have a repeat of Woodburn where it wipes out the entire North Coast communications? It wasn't the specific loss of Woodburn that wiped out the entire North Coast communications. What did? Uh, there was a myriad of instances of, uh, of sites being inundated. We had 17 mobile base stations that were inundated with water. We had 35 fiber optic cable um, um, connections that were broken as a result of washouts with landslips and the like. And it's a combination of all of those things in conjunction with loss of power that leads to service outages. But you have experience with floods. You had the Queensland floods. You had the floods five years ago in, in yep. Lismore. Correct. And okay, well, why didn't you change behaviour or take responses or change the, um, change the responses? Well, we, we build mobile networks in particular and also fixed line networks to serve the communities. And so they need to be in areas where they serve those communities. If they are in flood prone areas, then all we can do is build the networks in a way that enables them to be restored as quickly as possible should an event occur. We typically don't put mobile base stations in areas that, that flood, and certainly it's, uh, it's not our practice to have mobile base stations inundated with water. If you look at previous flood events, there's very few instances of mobile base stations being completely inundated as they were in this event in northern New South Wales. Um, Mr. Barrett? Uh, yes. Um, Mr. Jenna, in your, you touched earlier, you talked about, you said in New South Wales, the central energy can only go to the power box. Does that imply that in other jurisdictions you can do more? And if so, what are the, you know, how does that help speed up the process? Yeah, so New South Wales, uh, which is central energy only operates in New South Wales extensively, but in New South Wales, um, there's an authorised service provider scheme in effect, which basically provides contestability for homeowners and essential energy is is effectively ring fenced from being able to work behind the meter so to speak so we're not able to carry out any work behind the customer's meter. There are other jurisdictions where electricity service providers are able to carry out that work um, but, but not in New South Wales. So, so in some respects you could say that the response may have been delayed, but what we did is we worked very, very closely with electricians, and I would say there was a significant uh, supply of electricians in the area. We all also worked closely with the Electrical Trades Union to make sure that electricians and electrical supplies were, were available on the ground for customers to access. Okay, um, thank you. And I think Mr. Sutherland, um, first of all, very technical question. I've got a charger that I use to charge my one mobile phone, can you get bigger chargers that would charge multiple mobile phones? I know for a lot of people, you know, there was no power so we couldn't charge their mobile so we couldn't reach them. Is it possible to get a big, you know, bigger thing that sits in an evacuation centre that many people could plug into? Absolutely. There we could, uh, there's generators that would be able to be provided to provide backup, backup power to a emergency evacuation centre and you can connect power boards and the like to, to that sort of um, device to ensure that you've got power to whatever you need. So it'd just be like a, a regulation generator rather than yep. a special phone charging one? No, no, just a regulator generator with, uh, with you know, 240 volt output. And just finally, sorry, recently for Broken Hill, for the ad fair out there, I know we contributed to a, a cell on wheels, which was essentially a, a mobile mobile tower. Yep. Um, do we, and to what extent, do we employ these in, in these sort of scenarios and how does that help? So we, look, we have still, uh, today, got two cell uh, mobile towers. We call them a cell on wheels or a cow. We have two currently deployed in northern New South Wales whilst we undertake permanent repairs. Uh, one is near the Woodburn area, the Buckendoon uh, site that, that went underwater, and the other one is at Mullumbimby that was destroyed by fire. So today we have both of those deployed to provide emergency services. And uh, we expect the Mullumbimby one to be 
removed towards the end of this month, towards the end of June, and uh, the other one uh, sometime in July. And how quickly can they be deployed? Because it seems like there's quite a gap without phone and service. How quickly could they be deployed? Once you have safe access, you can typically deploy a cow in, um, in you know, four to five days. Scott, is that it? Yep, keep your... Thanks, thank you. Keep. Yeah, I'm, my first question is just um, in relation to, and again, yeah, how, how quickly things could be deployed after a disaster. Um, in your submission, you uh, kind of make the point that it, it is deployment after a disaster, often not during, but you also mention that telecommunications carriers do have mechanisms available to rapidly deploy assistance to emergency services organisations to aid in first responder efforts. Could you explain what specifically they are? So that's during rescue um, itself, um, what those mechanisms are to, 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 to deploy and whether that happened this time. So are you talking about during the event? Um... Yes, specifically, yep, that's what you're on page, um, page seven of your Submission at the bottom, um, there are, you say, it's stated that there are limitations in terms of when and where you can provide temporary facilities and that it's often, that it's after a disaster, not during. However, the point is made that telecommunications carriers do have mechanisms, and now we're at the top of page eight, do have mechanisms available to rapidly deploy assistance to ESOs to aid in first responder efforts. I'm just run, wondering if you could expand on what that is and whether that happened this time. So what we typically do uh, during the event uh, is ensure that the emergency services evacuation centre centres have communications. That's the most important uh, element to start. And so what we do is we do um, an assessment of the infrastructures providing services into those regions and, uh, and deploy the, um, the necessary field staff to, to get those services restored as quickly as possible. In terms of specific technology that enables us to provide services, the, there is nothing that we, that we have other than things like satellite phones uh, that can assist the evacuation centres to maintain communications. Yes, so on the, on the, um, the topic of satellite phones, you did make a note as well in your submission that while Telstra did not receive any requests for satellite phones during the North East New South Wales and Sydney flood events this year, is that correct? That's correct. Is that, do you find that surprising? Um, no, we, we did during, if I refer back to the bushfires mm. back in the beginning of um, 2019, 2020 bushfires, yeah. we did receive a large number of requests for satellite phones and provided what we could um, noting that you know, Telstra also has a limited stock of, of those sorts of devices, but in this instance there was no requests that came through. How many satellite phones, roughly, or do, do you have that figure, um, were provided during the bushfires? I don't have that figure on me, but I can certainly... Are we talking like two or Oh, we're talking no, ten, so 20, 30, that sort of number would be yeah. the, the number that would be. And so, just to, to... Would you have seen them being able to... Do you think... Satellite phones being, so for example, are quickly, you know, aerial dropped, whoever you could get them to Lismore um, uh, and potentially, yeah, to some of those recovery centres or whatever. Do you think there could have been a role for that? There, there could have been a role for that. There could also be a role for pre-provisioning or pre-location um, pre of satellite phones to areas like police stations and council offices and, and ambulance offices or ambulance centres. Uh, to provide uh, some form of emergency backup when communications fail, which they inevitably will after a major disaster like this. And so, can I, can I check on this? So, Telstra didn't offer didn't offer uh, satellite phones um, during. I'm assuming. I, I don't know whether an offer was made or not. And do you know whether the bush during the bushfires was it? Did an agency approach Telstra saying, "Quick"? We need these satellite phones, or is there something standing in place during bushfires that this happens? What's the di key difference here? I think the key difference here is that in the case of the bushfires, the requests came in rather than Telstra being being proactive with From offering there. them. Yeah. Uh, and similarly with this, the requests didn't come in, and I don't think it was something that uh, that was raised. 
And do you know, so during the bushfires, my final question on this, um, who, who made the request for the satellite phones? I'd have to, I don't know. I'd have to set that on notice. Thank you. Thank you. Mom, Ms. Sharp. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Mr. Wells, I wanted to ask you about the role of the Telco Authority and um, during this event. Do, does the Telco Authority have a role? Thanks, Ms. Sharp. Yes, so that in terms of the response um, to this, the Telco Authority plays two key roles. Uh, firstly, we operate the public safety network, so that's the radio, the radio network that emergency services organisations um, use uh, to operate and to, to be first responders, obviously, but there's those... Uh, yes, yeah, so we... we um, we operate the public safety network, which is the, the, the radio communications network for emergency services, and in fact 65 agencies across government. Uh, that's also a network that we're putting a, a large effort into upgrading, as you know, through the Critical Communications Enhancement Program. Mm -hmm. the, the other key role we play in terms of this response is, um, as part of the Act, we, uh, we operate uh, a unit called the Telecommunications Emergency Management Unit, or mm -hmm. TMU. Uh, so TMU acts as the liaison between carriers and providers and emergency services to look for risk, to uh, provide safe access to sites to do restoration and maintenance and those sorts of things, and to augment, I guess, our public safety network for emergency responders when that's required as well. And were there any problems with the public safety network during this recent...? Uh, look, there were, as you've just heard, there were a lot of power issues that impacted sites over, that, over the course of that month. Um, but we were able to uh, maintain the, the network, you know, availability of 99.92%. So in terms, of, so in general terms, the net, the public safety network, quite distinct from carrier networks, I need to differentiate those two things, did hold up very well. We are lucky that a lot of those towers are built on, on hills for different purposes. They are built for redundancy. That This network is built for 99.95% redundancy and must be to, to enable... RFS, SES and all the emergency services organisations to do their job. So yeah, despite those power issues, it did hold up well. It does take uh, a lot of deployment of generators, of, uh, of satellite backup, of um, cell on wheels equivalents, as you've heard before, uh, to make sure that stays up. And that, that was managed by TMU over the course of that 46 days. I think we were 24-7 for 46 days. And are you able to give us an idea of how long any of it was down? Look, I'd, I'll take on notice the exact specifics of which yeah. sites, which, which components, but generally it was... I mean, I'm interested in when they went down and how long it was before they got back up. It's really the, yeah, sure. We, we, can, we can take that on notice, but as I said, most of that was mitigated by a lot of proactive watching of where power issues were starting to occur, where, where, where sites were at risk, ex Etc. So, as I said before, 99.92% availability through the course of the response. And um, I just noticed that the, so the, the plan that this all sits underneath, um, well, publicly says that it hasn't been updated since 2018, is that correct? The plan for CCEP? Well, I think it's just the, the gym, sorry. The, um, the communication services support plan. My reading of it is is the plan for how you do all the things you just told me that you do. It may. Am I misreading that? It may. Mis Look, can I just check on notice what that's referring to? But I think it probably refers to the operational communication strategy for the state, which has just recently been refreshed. So it might have been renamed. I'll just check where that's published because it is publicly available too. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Thank you. Um, and so the one of the things I wanted to ask is so um, the. For an agency like the National Parks and Wildlife Service, they're connected to the Public Safety Network? Uh, I believe they're one of the customers and are now part of the Critical Communications Enhancement Program that will be rolling out over the coming four years. Yeah, yeah so, the, so for example, so just to, so to be able to participate, I assume that you need to have upgraded um, gear, you know, equipment to yep. be able to do that. So. The government, for example, announced money for the National Parks and Wildlife yep. Service over the weekend. Would it be under this program that that's, that's being funded? Uh, I think I'd have to check the specifics of that announcement, but I think... Well, it's a four-year um, approach to their radio network, so be, it sounds be, like it. Yep. So, so there's two, two elements. One is the actual towers and coverage in the parks, which will be now part of the program. And yes, the other bit is the handsets and, 
equipment that go with accessing the network as well. So and that would be both part of that, yes. And why haven't they been part of that to date? Um, I think they had an alternative. Uh, what the Critical Communications Enhancement Program is doing is converging all of the emergency services onto a single network for greater resilience uh, and coverage, as you know. So I think what I, I'll take the specifics on notice, but I think the National Parks and another number of other agencies had separate networks, which over time we've been converging into this program. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, Mr. Sullivan, so has mobile phone reception and coverage to the entire North Coast been restored? Apart from the two locations where we have the cell on wheels deployed, it's been fully restored. Where, those lo where the cell on wheels have been deployed uh, there is coverage at this site, but it is not at the level that we like. It hasn't got the capacity that uh, we would normally expect from a, from a site. Uh, that will be completed once the rebuild is done at those two sites over the coming uh, weeks. And when, what are those two locations? The two locations are Mullumbimby, which will be the end of June before we get that restored, and the second one is Buckendoon, which will be uh, before the end of July. Mullumbimby. So what, what, what's happening in Mullumbimby at the moment if you have a mobile phone? You will be able to make a call, uh, but you won't have the same data throughput that, uh, that you would expect once we get the, uh, the services fully restored. What does that mean? That means that uh, some of the services that you would use on your mobile network, accessing data, internet services and the like, won't be at the same level that you would expect. You will still be able to access it, but you'll suffer congestion because the capacity is not, uh, is not at the same level as we would expect. So you can make calls, you but, can you, make calls. But, you, but you can't use the internet or something. You can use it, but, yeah. uh, but you will be restricted on how much you can, uh, on your throughput. If you, would, if you tried to stream video, for example, you would, you would have difficulty. No, right. Um, uh, Mr. Wells, back to the, um, when you said that, I think it was 99.2% of the, was that correct? 99.92. Or 99.92. It's the, so maintained coverage, working, reception, you're able to make contact back and forth. Now, yeah, that's correct. That's, that's, remember, that's the emergency services radio network. That's what, that's what the telco, opera, telco authority operates. Can I operates. suggest you explain that? Yeah, I will. Yeah. So it's important to <coughs> understand that the, the public safety network, which we operate, mm -hmm. is for emergency services. It's separate to carrier networks, which the, the public yep. use, right? So the emergency services use the public safety network, which we're in the process of enhancing across the state, that network was up 99.92% of the time of the floods for, okay, I, for SES and other responders. Okay, that's what I'm going to drill down yeah. to. So 99.92%. Yeah. Does that mean the entire North Coast, the, the, that's, that's, the, the system worked, or it only worked in areas that you had system? That, that's, that's an average across the network, but, but for, all, for, the, for the flood response, that's an average across the whole network. Average across the whole network. Yep. So then wh why were there stories and evidence about a lack of communication, um, government, SES, um, rescue, people not being able to communicate? What, what, so, so their radio network was available to that, to that extent. If there, are, if there are specifics about other communication issues that were related to carrier networks, the carriers would be best to re respond to that, what we're accountable for and responsible oh, for. Oh, no, 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 Catherine, um, yeah. he's giving evidence, not you. So, so, I want to find out. So, can you drill down a bit more? So, how, who, who was communicating with who? who, who? So, again, I'm not quite sure of the question who's communicating well, with Well, I'm, I'm actually but, trying but to find out. You're making an extraordinary claim. You had 99.92% coverage. That's not the evidence that we we had. So the, was it a miscommunication back and forth? Or was it, I'm, try, I'm trying to get down to it. It's extraordinary. You said 99.92% success rate. For radio communications, right? right. Emergency service, so SES, RFS, first responders, radio communications, that network, which is what we are responsible for and operate, right. was available for 99.92% of the time. Thank you. Okay. Catherine, any questions? Yes. The, I understand that system worked well, but the problem is the people who needed to be rescued couldn't access that system. Yeah. Yep. So they were only able to communicate amongst each other, but they weren't able to get any information, for example, about Woodburn. Is that correct? Yeah, again, this is 
the users of the of our network are the emergency services, not the public, obviously. I understand yeah. that the emergency services need to be in communication with the public, surely. Yes, correct. To know, because these people couldn't even ring triple O. Yeah, that's right. Is that anything to do with that committee in terms of communications, or it just is completely confined to communications amongst emergency services? Emergency services, that's correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you for clarifying my question, Catherine. Thank you. No. <laughs> you clarified my question. Okay. Um, Mr Sutherland, um, why did the New South Wales government system perform so well, but the Telstra system failed the entire region? There's a very big difference between public safety networks and telecommunications carrier networks. Public safety networks are point-to-point -point radio networks, and they're typically built on high locations, at the top, tops of hills and so on, so they can communicate effectively between all the various regions. Telecommunications networks are built to serve the community itself and they're located amongst the community. So as a result, they are in an area that is more prone to flooding than public safety networks, which are, by design, separate to, um, to those sorts of networks. Sure, I do understand that. In relation to Malcolm, for example, just returning to the Chair's question, um, which was essentially what was the point of putting the tower on a hill but leaving the tower on the on flood the ground. Yes. Um, who's doing that risk assessment? Well, or do, is it just something that you wait till it fails and then you rebuild it better? But leave it there? We, we will need to do an assessment of that site and I'll have to take that. I'll, we'll have to look at that one and come back to you on, on what exactly happened at Tumbo. I'm not familiar with that, that particular okay. site. So, in terms of just the number of failures that occurred, like, I think 100 and... 124 mobile sites across the northeast yep. and western Sydney. So, doesn't that suggest that in terms of risk assessment, that was never done for the network? That, that so many sites could be prone to flooding and failing? The, the nature of the network, not all of those sites were flooded. So a lot of those sites failed due to power yeah. and due to um, loss of fibre optic cable backhaul, which is critical to maintain the networks. That connect, that's what connects the networks through. So if that cable gets broken, then you might you know, a single cable break might affect several base stations. We had 17 mobile sites that were inundated with water, not 124. I did want to ask you about the fibre optic. That's not a Telstra responsibility, or is it a Telstra? It is a Telstra responsibility. It is a Telstra responsibility. Yeah. So... In terms of Woodburn, because everybody on the North Coast has been led to believe that something flooded at Woodburn took down the whole North Coast. And that was definitely a facility that was mentioned by Telstra on radio frequently when everybody was trying to find out what was going on. Are you saying that the Woodburn failure only affected Woodburn and didn't impact the rest of the coast? I, again, I'd like to take that on notice, but I don't believe that to be the case. Mm -hmm. you know, we had 35 fibre optic cable breaks across the region, and those 35 fibre optic cable breaks, along with loss of power, is what led to the vast majority of outages. And there was not a single point of failure that, that affected everything, like you've suggested. Right. Why did Optus continue to operate in the region, but not Tostra? I, I can't speak for Optus. I don't know what uh, what's different about their network um, or, or or how that differs from Telstra's. Services were lost for over a week. Um, did Telstra offer customers an apology or uh, a credit on their bills for that loss of service? There, were, there was um, work with, with customers. Uh, I can't speak specifically about what credits were applied, uh, but we can certainly come back to you on, on uh, the specifics about what we did for, for customers post the event. So but that work related to people who couldn't pay their bills, didn't it? There was certainly work around people unable to pay their bills, um, but I can, we can also come back to you about what, uh, if any, credits were applied to accounts that were, that were off. Does Telstra have any uh, role in relation to emergency management when all of its communications fail in an emergency? I, I guess what I'm really trying to get to at this is when you say nobody asked us for a satellite phone, can I assure you that people would have been desperate for satellite phones had they understood that they were available. We had a spokesperson from Chelsea on ABC North Coast telling people they were silly not to have satellite phones, certainly not offering satellite phones. 
It's a bit difficult yeah. to access the satellite phone when the flood's already happened and the community's been cut off. Agreed. So why, why wouldn't Telstra organise satellite phones, at least to those communities that were totally cut off and couldn't even dial triple O? If Telstra, have, if, if Telstra had been requested for some mobile phone, there would be a small number that would be able to distribute. But Telstra, Telstra does not carry a lot of satellite phones. It's not, it's not a core business of Telstra's. So there's no plan B in an emergency for communities that are completely cut off when the there's a system-wide failure? The plan B for communities needs to be for uh, the provision of things like satellite phones at major centres like police stations and the like. Okay, so that's my question. Do you have a role to play or a responsibility in regards to that? I think we have an awareness role to play in that, whereby we make make communities aware of the of the risk to telecommunications networks in the event of a major disaster. And I think making communities aware of what options that they have available to them to be able to uh, to have emergency communications is a role that Telstra can play and in fact does play during our planning planning phase, and uh, there's many options that um, uh, that we do discuss as part of our, our summer planning in particular that goes to, to various communities about um, option, about things that they can put in place to, to mitigate any impacts. How do you liaise with the New South Wales government in relation to disaster management? We, we work extensively with the Telco Authority, the New South Wales Telco Authority. Uh, we have daily stand-ups with them and uh, have you know, very, very frequent communications uh, with uh, the New South, Wales, New South Wales Telco Authority, who then assist us in liaising with the energy companies and the like to ensure that we have, um, you know, we prioritising things as, as best we possibly can between all the all the agencies. Excuse that. Um, uh, Ms. Clare, Ms. Clare would like to add something. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to support what Peter was saying. Um, we did undertake a number of briefings ahead of the summer season. I think we all knew that we were likely to experience some adverse weather events. Um, we spoke to the New South Wales Telco and I think during the, the issues itself, or the floods itself, we did uh, have twice daily briefings with them uh, and we also um, offered to update stakeholders. So one of the key focuses of our response um, was to make sure that the communities and the stakeholders were very clear on uh, where we were having to go and restore services and where we had service issues. So it's your evidence that the communities were very clear on that? I think through the evacuation centres and through the briefings that we undertook with the New South Wales Telco Authority, we were absolutely clear on uh, the sites that were impacted and the work that we were doing with our teams to get in there and fix those. Can I perhaps ask you on notice to provide the committee with a timeline for when you gave service to the evacuation centres? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that you'll you find that. it took more than a week and I'm just quite mm -hmm. curious to find out who asked you to do that. Um, whether that request was made from the telco or whether it was because Telstra was being totally smashed in the media by a very upset community. I mean, you must have got that feedback that people were very unhappy or not. Happy to take that on notice. Oh, absolutely, I was part of all of the crisis management discussions and it was very clear that we wanted to proactively reach out so, um, and be provided with that timeline. So the Royal Commission into Natural Disasters recommended that um, our service carriers uh, look at um, being able, consumers being able to have roaming between different carrier towers so that people can at least access Triple O during an emergency. Um, has that been progressed at all? So um, members of the community can access Triple O today across uh, any carrier. So if, the, if you are a Telstra customer in, uh, and the, there is no Telstra coverage in the area, uh, that call will be handled by one of the other carriers if there is coverage from those other carriers available. That is in place today and has been for, for several years. That's quite distinct from roaming itself. Uh, roaming is whereby uh, customers will automatically flow across to different networks for, um, um, you know, if, if there's no coverage available on your, on your home network. Uh, there's been three reviews by the ACCC uh, conducted into regulating roaming. All three of them of reviews concluded that it was not in the interest of competition to uh, to regulate roaming. As a result, that that hasn't been done uh, since uh, or in the last uh, last 12 months. There has been an agreement reached with Telstra and TPG, which is pending uh, ACCC approval to regulate or to to put roaming in place between TPG customers and Telstra customers. 
Uh, that has not yet received regulatory approval, but that is, uh, that is in train now. Is that um, roaming generally or roaming in an emergency? Roaming generally. Okay, so in relation to in an emergency, does Pilstra have a position in relation to that? A again, it's not something that can be done uh, very, very quickly. I mean, roaming in an emergency is not a viable option because of the technology would be required to be put in place. What technology would be required? It'd be, all carriers would need to have significant investment to ensure that we can switch customers between all the different, uh, the different carriers. Thank you. Um, Kate? Yeah, I've got a, uh, got a few more. This time to um, Mr Jenner. In your submission, you uh, mention that it would be advantageous for telecommunications providers to provide essential energy with a list of their critical <coughs> infrastructure to assist you to prioritise restoration efforts to support the community. And you make the point that this request was made of telecommunications providers. However, the information was delayed and inaccurate, which was challenging. Could you um, expand on that for the committee, please? <clears throat> yeah, from, from our perspective, we reached out to um, Telstra early on in the, on day one of the response to ask which sites needed um, to be prioritised for electrical restoration um, and it did take several days for those sites to be provided to us. Okay, and how many sites are we, are we talking about and how many days? So we were provided, uh, took us four and a half days to get a list of ten sites um, and we received, by the time we received that list, eight of the sites had already had electricity restored and two of them were still inundated so couldn't have electricity restored. Okay, so and do, do you think, so that delay, did that have tangible outcomes on the ground? Oh, well, I guess that would be a question for Telstra in terms of whether the, you know, the power could have been supplied more quickly if we know where to focus our efforts. Um, what I would say, as I said in my opening statement, that what Essential Energy found through the response that the local emergency operations centre, which in this case operated out of the Lismore Council Chambers, was absolutely the, the, the focal hub for whether it was police, defence, Essential Energy, um, council, uh, any, uh, any other emergency service prioritising its response. I think having Telstra and the other telcos present in that forum would, would significantly expedite the ability to restore telecommunications. And what's your view of that, Mr Sutherland? Do you think, do you think a four and a half day delay in terms of getting that list of critical infrastructure to essential energy is good enough? Oh, absolutely not. If, um, and and you know, we can certainly do better in terms of, of communication between the agencies. Uh, Telstra does work very effectively with uh, Essential Energy and, and, uh, and Osgrid in this instance as well, who are also part of, uh, part of the restoration effort, and the New South Wales Telco Authority to ensure that we, pro that we can exchange information as best we, ha we have. Uh, four and a half days does seem uh, excessive, and uh, I think what we need to do is uh, investigate what went wrong there and ensure that we can do better next time. Were you aware of that? I wasn't aware of a four and a half day delay, no. Why isn't Telstra in these meetings? Look, to, uh, Telstra absolutely can be and is happy to be involved in these meetings. The, the structure of the engagement at the moment is through the New South Wales Telco Authority. Yes. Telco Authority is the, is the prime agency that interfaces into us. And, uh, and we interface uh, into the, uh, between, the, uh, between the energy companies uh, through the Telco Authority. Uh, we do uh, instigate direct engagement where we believe there is value in doing so, but the process is meant to follow uh, through the New South Wales Telco Authority. Um, does the, Mr Wells, the, um, the Telco Authority seems very comfortable in its success in the public safety network, the PSN, Clearly there's an enormous role for the New South Wales Telco coordinating telecommunications. Is it failing and are you looking at the fact that it is failing in that regard and is there work for you to do to bring these privatised organisations that actually don't have a government role to come together, particularly in the emergency response period and the recovery, so that our communities can actually communicate with each other and feel safe? <coughs> So that's the role it does 
does play in Miss Higginson. So it does coordinate with all the carriers, not just Telstra, all the carriers in terms of setting priorities as to where it's safe to go and restore you know, sites, etc. I would really also, though, echo that getting access to better data from all carriers in real time with a bit more depth is something that w would help us in our response to in, in order to understand where risks are. That was a key learning out of the bushfires and we've made some progress there, but we would like also more more depth of information, more real-time information, because that helps us and helps the emergency response, resilience and combat agencies work out where to prioritise and where to go first. But you're the telco, so can't you... So what do you need to be able to do what you aren't doing at the moment? Most of what we need we have, uh, and that liaison works, works reasonably well. The key thing that I would highlight is the same thing that Essential Energy just highlighted is better data, more real-time data, that would help us understand where the key risks are in the network. So some sites have more impact of being inundated than others. Some sites are more critical. Some sites have bigger coverage than others. So uh, more information in more real time, something, again, that we found out of the bushfire response would be, would be really helpful in, in coordinating, that, coordinating that response uh, from a state operations centre and from that regional operations centre that was just mentioned. So as the public, the New South Wales Telco, are you now doing that and coordinating that yes, and making are. that happen in case we have a flood in a month's time? Or? Yes, yes, we are. And as I said, we, we had people deployed 24-7 for 46 days in that exact role. So 12 people deployed uh, from Wollongong in their operations centre, from the state operations centre at Homebush and in the local um, response centre in Lismore. And okay, where in the local response centre were they? Yes, they were. And yeah, where were where? they? Oh, can I can I confirm that it was in Coffs Harbour, I think. Coffs <coughs> Harbour. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And and then played a role in the response effort as well. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Cusack, any more questions? Yeah, absolutely. So, did you put in any requests to satellite phones for isolated communities that had no contact? I'll, I'll have to check that, Ms. Cusack. Were you in the centre in Sydney? No, I wasn't. No. Who was in the centre in Sydney? So our, our telecommunications emergency management team were in that centre. They were deployed in those four locations that I mentioned. Right. So yep. in terms of the fact that we've got all these isolated communities, and let me read, I mean, I've got a list. It's about 30 communities. Yep. What were you doing for them? So again, our role was to coordinate these all carriers. You didn't coordinate anything, did you? With respect, you coordinated nothing. So... I don't know how to respond to that other than It's a very emotional issue up on the north coast, let me tell you. They were cut off. Yeah, I understand. For 10 days, no fuel, no method of communication. I understand. So, and, and we're saying, why aren't the telcos in, in the emergency centre in Lismore? Mm -hmm. Oh no, we have this much better system across four locations like Coffs Harbour, which is three hours south of Lismore. Um, so... What was being coordinated and, and why weren't requests being made? Like, so, so when these isolated communities that could not be reached by road lost all their communications as well. Yeah, I understand. Our, our role was to, to coordinate with carriers. What did you coordinate but for them? When it was safe to restore their networks, which sites to prioritise in terms right. of... I understand you're providing that service to the carriers. I'm asking you what service were you providing to the community that had no communication? So again, our responsibility in, in terms of what I operate is, is for the emergency services radio network. That's the scope of our accountability at the moment, the, the scope of what we have to deal with. Right. So, Mr Sutherland, can I return to you then and say, given that um, the telco appears to have no duty of care to the victims who are stranded without service, why wouldn't Telstra participate in the emergency centre in Lismore, where they could have worked with Essential Energy and not had four and a half days of people circulating whatever data was required for We'd that information to be provided. We would be happy to, and in fact regularly do, uh, work directly with uh, all, of the jurisdiction, all of the emergency services across all jurisdictions. Uh, in the case of the New South Wales uh, floods, the process is a little bit different, and we have the New South Wales Telco Authority uh, providing that coordination role for telecommunications carriers. Uh, and you know, we would be very happy to work directly with the, uh, all emergency services and be operated out of, and operate out of the main centre in Lismore. Um, Ms. Cusack, uh, Ms. Clear, I wanted to offer, make a contribution. 
<coughs> you know, I think Peter covered it beautifully. Uh, I think that uh, he called out that for all other jurisdictions, we do have a seat at the table at the emergency centres. Uh, and in the case of New South Wales, the protocol is to go through the New South Wales Telco Authority. I just have to comment, the performance of Essential Energy, I thought, was exemplary. Mm. They were all over the community attending meetings, explaining the process. They had three people there telling people to be patient because this was going to take a very long time, and everyone accepted that because they were being given information. There's never any information from telecommunication. I don't know whose responsibility that was, and I don't know why it wasn't provided, but in particular... It was very unexpected in places that weren't impacted by flooding and the roads were cut off, the fuel shortages came in straight away, there was no food coming in and there were places like Amber that nobody could even get access to food for a week, uh, for 10 days, I'm sorry. Really very serious issues when no one has communication. People down river towns trying, needing to be rescued but there was no phone service. So we understand the we do understand the impact that lack of communication has. So, what would your thoughts be about how we could do better for communities in that situation in future? I think preparedness. I think preparedness is is a key point. Um, there is definitely a role for for local communities to to be prepared in terms of having access to to satellite phones and the like. Uh, that was also a finding that came out of the bushfires. Uh, there's, a, there's a, a, um, a role for all carriers to work effectively with the emergency services teams, be it power, police, fire, and so on, uh, to ensure that everyone understands their clear priorities. And I think in this instance, some of that communication was, uh, was sub suboptimal, and uh, we can do better with those sorts of things as well. Suboptimal. Mr. Roberts. Uh, thanks, Mr. Sutherland. My questions to you. I have very limited technical knowledge about the operation of mobile phones and, in fact, satellite phones as well. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that is a satellite phone doesn't run off the tower, it runs off a satellite, hence the name. Am I, correct. am I correct in that? So then going forward, going forward, would it, if Resilience New South Wales had a bank of 100 satellite phones and there were remote communities isolated, if they were to be able to airdrop a satellite phone into that community, that community would have access to a network to be able to make emergency calls or, or say, listen, we need fuel here or we need Correct. food or Mrs Jones needs to be airlifted out, she's injured. So going forward, I'll put the proposition to you again, if Resilience New South Wales was to provide or was to have access to that and provide it to those communities when they needed it, or be it they can't get in by road but they could airdrop it in, that would provide those communities with ability to be able to make contact with the outside world. That is correct. All right, fine. That's all I need. Thank you. I, I have one last question, Mr. Sutherland. So you mentioned that Mullenbimby will be restored to mobile phone service at the end of June. You talked about, in your submission, about cows and meows. Why, in fact, haven't you just provided more of those so they can have the proper data and the proper support that they need in the major, there major is a, town? There is a limitation with... the. the the nature of a cow is they are limited to the amount of capacity that they can carry, and putting more of them in the area wouldn't actually solve that problem. Why not? Because of the just the nature of the way they're constructed, they are they are constructed to provide uh, voice coverage and put uh, put coverage into the area. And uh, <coughs> if you had more of them, you would have more voice coverage. So, what's the reason why there's not mobile phone coverage in Mullumbimby then? Can't you? It's been three and a half months. Can't you simply just construct a tower? We are well. We have a tower there. The tower was was destroyed by fire, and we are rebuilding it. And it takes oh, time to rebuild. Oh, are these it. the anti five G five G yes. people burning? Yes. Right. Okay. What did you do at Ballina so that Ballina got restored service? Yes. We restored the Ballina site. No, sorry. Sorry, Catherine. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. No, there was a temporary fix put into Ballina. Uh, I think I, the mayor of Ballina was saying you can do this for music festivals, why can't you do this yeah. for flooded communities? And a, and a temporary... Is there simply uh, just not the I, revenue available I, to you to do it? Is there a reason? Because, in fact, we did have evidence. Oh, there was certainly no, there was no revenue decisions or, or criteria assigned to the deployment of any infrastructure. That's, uh, that's never an issue uh, in emergencies. At Telstra, we'll do everything we can to restore services. 
I'm not aware of Ballina being restored by anything other than restoring the, the major site in the town, but I will take that on notice and, uh, and come back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and that concludes our other uh, check. Yes, that does conclude our time allocation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Four o'clock. Four. So they're um, Now, could each witness, there's no one remotely, is there? No. No. Could each witness please state their name, title, and swear either an oath or affirmation, starting with Mr. Jones. Uh, Matthew Jones, General Manager of Public Affairs at the Insurance Council of Australia. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mr. Dyer. Uh, Andrew Dyer, uh, Principal Flood and Climate Risk Analyst <coughs> at uh, Insurance Australia Group. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now give, about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, under the provisions of this committee, there is, you can make a short statement if you wish. Do either one of you wish to make a short statement? I do. Mr. Jones, continue. Sir. Thank you, Chair. My name is Matthew Jones. I'm the General Manager of Public Affairs at the Insurance Council of Australia. The Insurance Council is the peak body representing general insurers in this country. I'm joined today by Andrew Dyer, who's the Principal Peril and Climate Risk Analyst at Insurance Australia Group. And as a kind of general direction, the Insurance Council will be able to provide answers on general policy questions. And um, Andrew will be able to give you a perspective on more detailed flood issues as it relates to insurance. So General Insurance provides Australians with 43 million business and household policies each year and pays more than $166 million in claims every working day. We're a key part of the economy and social fabric of the nation. The Insurance Council declared the recent floods an insurance catastrophe on the 26th of February this year. To date, there have been almost 92,000 insurance claims related to the floods in New South Wales alone with an estimated claims value of $1.9 billion. Total claims costs across New South Wales and Queensland have exceeded $4.3 billion. In terms of insurable losses, this is Australia's costliest flood and the fourth most expensive natural disaster in our history. These catastrophic floods underscore the need to improve where we build and how we build it, make communities more resilient to extreme weather events, and remove other impediments to making insurance more affordable to all, but particularly high flood risk communities. Alongside planning reforms, so, no, so we no longer build homes in harm's way, the State Government can quickly improve the affordability and availability of insurance by removing State taxes on insurance products. State taxes such as stamp duty and the emergency services levy on insurance only worsen the affordability and availability of insurance in communities who most need it. In New South Wales, taxes add more than 30% to the cost of an insurance premium. Insurance prices the risk to any asset. Ensuring those risks are mitigated to the best of our ability is key for both protecting lives and the social and economic fabric of our communities. We cannot keep doing the same things we've always done and expect a different result. We know current land use planning rules are not properly protecting Australians from worsening flood risk, but they can be improved. Our recently released policy platform, Building a More Resilient Australia, calls on all Australian governments to lift investment in household and community resilience measures to $400 million a year or $2 billion over five years. This has been supported by the Federal Government and we encourage the New South Wales Government to do its part in lifting national investment in this crucial area. As part of this program, the Insurance Council is proposing an investment of $232 million in New South Wales over the next five years, jointly funded by the New South Wales and Australian Governments. The proposed New South Wales Investment Program includes $133 million to wet flood-proof more than 8,000 homes at high risk of flood. It also includes a $13 million investment towards a $37 million national program to improve flood early warning systems, estimated to protect more than 142,000 homes in New South Wales alone. We also propose a half a billion dollar local infrastructure fund to support important flood mitigation projects like levees and floodways in towns such as Lismore, Tweedheads and Narrabri. Modelling undertaken by actuarial consultancy Finity for the Insurance Council shows that this investment would return a benefit to the New South Wales Government and homeowners of $5.6 billion to 2050, or 24 times the investment. Affected communities across the state are calling for this investment too. Recent polling undertaken by us of residents in the Northern Rivers and Western Sydney found 91% of respondents think resilience investment by governments should at least double from current levels. 51% said state and federal governments share equal responsibility for investing in resilience and mitigation. I welcome any questions from the committee. 
Thank you. Um, Mr. Jones, Mr. Dwyer, um, <clears throat> on a recent visit, actually on the, not this flood, but the previous flood, I spoke to a homeowner in a place called Timbulgan, and they said that insurance would be, they were quoted $25,000 a year for insurance there. Then I spoke to a local business in the same town, and they were told that they were quoted $250,000 a year to insure their business. So how, what can the government do or what can the community do? How can you actually have affordable insurance premiums for communities like that? Well, that's a, it's a great question. Oh, and is it's it a, possible? It, it's a great question and, and uh, it's an issue that um, we're very focused on as I kind of flagged in my opening statement. Um, insurance prices risk and unfortunately those premiums that are being offered um, are based on the risk that is present and in areas like those affected by the recent flood particularly in Lismore which is very prone to flooding uh, the risk is such that it's you know priced accordingly um, and that means unfortunately that for some people um, flood cover becomes unavailable it's just out of reach for them um, so that's why the Insurance Council and insurers are so focused on improving the resilience of uh, those communities by doing things like investing in community infrastructure like levies which have been proven to work in some locations. They um, may not have worked um, for all parts of Lismore for the recent flood but they can work. Uh, and also household level um, mitigation programs. So these kinds of programs um, not only um, protects the home, um, but they also have the effect of driving down insurance premiums. So Roma in Queensland uh, effectively became um, uninsurable. Um, the, it was very difficult for residents there to obtain insurance. And then uh, the Queensland government, um, I believe with some co-investment from the Commonwealth, built a flood levy for Roma and insurers came back and um, premiums dropped by as much as 75%. Uh, in Queensland also, they had a program called the um, Queensland Household Resilience Program, which was aimed at um, protecting, better protecting homes from cyclone damage. And um, it was a pretty modest program, but uh, it was fully subscribed very quickly. And um, for those people who participated in the program, um, obviously their home was stronger, better able to withstand a cyclone, which is a, a fantastic benefit. Um, but also they saw their premiums drop by 25 to 35%. So... These kinds of investments do work, um, but they're not, um, they're not the only thing. We don't, we don't have one magic silver bullet for all um, types of perils and for all locations. So it requires investment in resilience and mitigation, both at a community and household level. Um, it requires changes to land use planning, so we no longer build homes in harm's way. Uh, it requires strengthening the building code so that our, um, <coughs> our buildings are better able to withstand um, uh, extreme weather, particularly in the context of a changing climate. And, you know, to be frank, and I'll use this opportunity given I'm um, before a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry, it requires the removal of state taxes, which only make insurance more um, unaffordable and more difficult to obtain. Uh, New South Wales, unfortunately, is the um, outlier now. It's the only state, Tasmania is getting, getting rid of their emergency services levy. levy. It'll be the only state with an, with an ESL, uh, and when you um, add ESL and stamp duty on top of um, GST, residents are paying 30 to 40 percent of their premium in tax. Um, that money could better go to um, uh, lifting the, their sum insured so they're better protected or giving them money to spend on something else. Sue, you can sit. Thank you. Um, on the 30th of March, there was efforts made in the federal parliament, in the Senate, to amend the Treasury Laws Amendment Cyclone Flood Damage Reinsurance Pool Bill. Yep. Um, and that those amendments were seeking to amend the definitions to broaden just cyclones to include flood and fire, whilst per perhaps a short-term solution. Would that have had a material beneficial impact on the people right now who are messaging me even today in Lismore who have fallen through the cracks in terms of 
their one and only home that they just couldn't quite insure it afford the thirty thousand dollar insurance premium. Would would those yeah. amendments have helped? Uh, the short answer is no. Right. Um, so for a few reasons, um, the first is that the scheme actually doesn't come into effect until the first of July, so in a few weeks. So this is the um, Northern Australia Cyclone Reinsurance Pool. Um, and uh, large insurers have 18 months to have all of their reinsurance purchased out of that pool, um, and smaller insurers have uh, 30 months, so two and a half years. Um, and so it will take some time for all insurers to be in the pool and be purchasing their reinsurance, <laughs> which is insurance for insurers, from the pool. Um, so for those people that would not have had any, any benefit at all, but even if it had been... Um, uh, even if the cyclone reinsurance pool had been operating, we have doubts about um, its efficacy for flood for a few reasons. One is that a, a um, reinsurance pool does nothing to protect your home. And we saw from the, um, from the devastating impact of this flood, you know, unprecedented, the fourth biggest natural disaster in our history, um, water up under the eaves in downtown Lismore on the second story. Um, so a reinsurance pool is, uh, um, is designed to reduce the, the cost of one element of what goes into making up a premium, so it's the reinsurance element. There are other elements as well. Um, so that's the first issue that we have. Um, and the second is the kind of policy prescriptions that I just outlined in my previous answer um, haven't been tried, and they are more effective at um, mitigating against the risk. They actually can stop the, you know, water inundation into the house or, you know, um, whatever, and, um, and they're cheaper and they haven't been tried yet. So um, we believe that um, we need to see how the cyclone reinsurance pool plays out and whether it does have the um, impact on premium prices in Northern Australia that um, it's expected to have, that it's hoped to have. Um, the other point I would make is that um, cyclone pools, cyclone flood pools, and um, Andrew might want to comment on this, in, um, in other parts of the world um, have proven to be um, uh, very big drains on the public purse. So there's a, cyclone re uh, sorry, a flood reinsurance pool which operates in the US, and um, the US government has had to um, essentially um, forgive loans from that pool so that it could pay out claims. Uh, and it has deadened the um, price signal to people who live in those flood zones so people continue to be flooded. Um, they've got no incentive to move. The government, governments and other authorities have no, have no incentive to um, mitigate the risk. They just get bailed out financially and it goes on. So it's not proven to be a very effective scheme. So it could work, but um, there are other things that need to be tried first. Um, and so in the case then, thank you for that, that's very helpful. So in the case of the residents of North and South Lismore, of which there are hundreds that weren't insured or couldn't afford the premiums this time round, have been insured in the past, um, there's arguably nothing for them in the short term through any insurance company coming good or, or, you know, for their partial insur insurance. And, and with those people, given no levy is likely to ever protect their homes, um, and we think that that's more than obvious and likely, um, in terms of costs on the public purse, and is the idea from an insurance perspective that those people would be best offered a way out of there because they can never insure against the likely risk that they're going to face in the short, medium and long term? Sure. Um, well, I'll take the first part of the question first. So there are things that insurers are doing um, and insurers um, are very cognizant of the responsibility that they have um, to the communities that they operate in and, um, you know, have done things such as even where a, um, a policyholder may not have flood cover and so they're not covered, have made, um, you know, payments to cover emergency accommodation even though it's not covered under, the, under their policy. Um, and um, 
insurers are working very hard to sort through claims and to understand how the damage occurred because for many people who don't have flood cover they may still have storm cover and so they may get part of their claim covered because some of the damage occurred by because of storm inundation and not not flood so there are things that um, insurers are trying to do for those folk um, and on the second part of your question um, it's pretty clear I think to everyone now that um, you know, land swaps, buybacks, moving people out of harm's way is um, an appropriate solution for the most acutely um, impacted. So it's not a, as I said before, there's not a kind of magic bullet <coughs> all flood um, risk. There are different solutions for different areas and different levels of risk. And it might be that the solution is different for one part of the street to the other part of the street in the same suburb. Um, so it does, you know, there's no easy answer, but um, essentially that is one of the policy prescriptions that should be looked at. Thank you. Um, Penny Sharp. Thank you. Thanks for coming in today. Um, I wanted to, in your submission, you talk about the European um, early flood, um, what was it called, flood alert system. Yep. Could you just expand a little bit about how that works and you know, whether it's applicable to, to New South Wales? So one of the things that we did when we um, put together this document, Building a More Resilient Australia, was that we engaged um, an actuarial consultancy, Finity, that I mentioned in my opening statement, who are the experts in kind of um, measuring the impact of these kinds of investments. And um, they looked at the European flood alert system and um, they um, calculated that if a similar... Um, system was put in place in Australia for a pretty modest investment, it's like tens of millions as opposed to hundreds of millions, um, we would get um, warning around 10 to 15 days instead of three to five days. And um, so obviously that has a lot of benefit for people being able to move property, um, the property which is, um, you know, movable, um, not the home obviously. <laughs> um, um, and. Uh, most importantly, move themselves out of harm's way. Um, I'm, I'm sure you might have seen the um, story that was on 7.30 last night um, about some residents in Lismore, and there was a guy there who um, had a, a lot of his um, material in his shop that he couldn't move, and it was you know, very valuable, and it was all great, it was damaged. So that would give people the opportunity to do that. Um, Finity um, calculate that the return on investment um, for that project would be 271, which is huge. Um, and that's because it's relatively modest cost and there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people across Australia in the most flood prone areas that would benefit. Um, so it's certainly something that um, we should look at. It's one of the investment measures that we proposed um, in our pre-election, our pre-federal election document. and. Um, we're hopeful that the new federal government will be one of those things that they um, take up and we'll be certainly talking to them about that. And so just the, I mean, obviously getting, I mean, I'm interested that, you, that in Europe they're able to get 10 to 15 days ahead given that this inquiry has heard a lot of criticism of, about the Bureau of Meteorology and the problems with our uh, forecasting. Is there a forecasting issue or is it just a different approach? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not a meteorologist or, a, or an actuary so I, I can't answer that question I'm afraid. Okay. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could just comment, I mean your submission makes lots of sensible um, points to lots of sensible things in relation to planning laws and obviously the design in place set has been put on ice for now. Could you just expand a little bit in committee about how important putting these things into our planning laws is going to be to the future, or is now, really? Sure. Well, we know that um, these extreme weather events are worsening, um, and um, we have relied so far on um, uh, historical data to give us an idea of what's going to happen, what we think is going to happen in the future, and um, with, a, you know, with worsening extreme weather events. Um, that's not necessarily um, as good an indicator as it once was. Um, there are um, many, many homes, some built in the last 20 years, that um, have been built in places that are at high risk of flood. 
and have been built in a way that they don't really adequately withstand floods. So they're um, timber frame homes on a concrete slab. Um, and um, we need to be much more careful about where we um, build that kind of um, residence and um, look at what alternatives there might be, either um, not building in those locations or building something different in those locations. And while the upfront cost might be higher, and obviously building costs in this country is a perennial kitchen table issue, um, the life um, the life of asset costs may be lower because um, you don't have to remediate the home or completely rebuild it or you know um, when there's an event happen but I don't know. yeah I guess uh, so both of our submissions touch on the issue of uh, moving to a more risk-based planning framework and I believe you also had a the FMA uh, yes, earlier yes. today talk about more more of a risk-based planning framework um, what we're essentially saying here is, is, is uh, gradually moving away from the 1% uh, planning standard towards a, a, a way of accounting for the full range of possible uh, events and consequences and flood depths across, across the full spectrum of events. Um, just to add a bit of colour to the conversation here, there are places in New South Wales where if you build a complying uh, new build to the 1% flood level plus the required freeboard, uh, when we measure risk as an insurance company, we're looking at all the possible events. Uh, in, in areas where you build a complying new build and there are extreme uh, depth ranges, uh, you can see flood premiums on, on new builds in the order of uh, two, three, four thousand dollars uh, under the current uh, frequency-based sort of, uh, way, way of doing land planning. So this is why we're moving towards a more, uh, to advocate for a more risk-based uh, approach to planning where we do consider the consequences of the full range of possible events. And the route, so one more. Yep. Um, I mean, the government's undertaking, has said that it's undertaking its review into planning <coughs> off the back of these recent events. Um, how um, have you been able to make submissions to that and are you engaged with the government in relation to those discussions? We have not, but we're happy to. We have not. Uh, Roger Roberts. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for attending today. Just um, a couple of quick questions. The fallacy that we hear of the one in 100 year flood, you know, being experts in the field, you will know, and Ms. Sharp and I happen to sit on another committee, so we've since learned. It's one chance in 100 every year, isn't it? Do you think that, there, therefore, there is scope for education of the community from government to explain to them what a one in 100 flood chance is. Uh, I put this proposition to you that the average punter on the street would think, oh, if there's been a flood this year, we're pretty right. We're not going to get another one for at least another 90 odd years, which we know is not right. Do you think that there's a need for education then to bring everybody up to that um, knowledge level? It's absolutely a problem. Uh, we, we uh, as, a, as a profession, floodplain managers, we recently had a uh, change to the guidance that we are given on the language that we use in, in expressing this, and we, we now say a 1% annual exceedance probability flood, uh, which is a bit less, uh, you know, zippy than <laughs> calling it a 100-year <laughs> flood. And, uh, it provides more it's, information. But it provides more information. It's more a 1% one percent yeah. annual exceedance probability. Uh, unfortunately, it brings in acronyms, and it, it, it's a bit harder to work around. But, but uh, it's certainly is more informative to the community, a 1% chance per year. Oh, that means a 1% chance this year, last year, next year, every, every year. Because um, we all know 100 to 1 winners get in, in the races every now and again, don't we? So we know, yeah. you know, as I say, the average show on the street can work it out. It's a 1 in 100 chance. Well, not it's one chance in every 100 years. Yeah. So if you've got, if you um, live in a um, 1 in 100 AAP location, you've got a 50% chance of uh, experiencing a flood over 70 years, over an average life, and a 15.6% chance of experiencing that flood uh, at least twice in your lifetime. They're pretty high. Exactly. And, and, and I agree with you. So do you, I put the proposition to the government and local council should be um, spreading that message more in a language that's easy yeah. to understand. And therefore, can I take you to the next one? 
the old Section 149 certificates that come in your contract, or Section <coughs> 10 or something, I think they're, they're now label. I'm sure I'm right. Do you think that they should be much more detailed in terms of, is this in a flood zone? Yes. I think is, is some of the 149s that I've seen in my time doesn't explain what, uh, what yeah. section of it fits in. And do you think it's incumbent on councils then to provide with those Section 10 certificates a flood map so somebody that picks up a contract can look and see, oh, the shading shows that this block of land or this looking at uh, potential for inundation? It's certainly a challenge uh, in, in communicating this. So the, the, the land planning certificates as they stand, they're there for land planning. They're there to tell you what land planning controls apply to your land. Yep. They're not there to give you a long list of information around the flood risk to your land, and that's, that's probably a gap uh, for the community. Um, in terms of best practice, uh, if you look at the Brisbane City Council flood check website, you can, you can whack in your address and you get the full range of flood probabilities uh, for your address. There are also some quite good uh, examples across Sydney. I believe the Hawkesbury, uh, Hawkesbury Council flood planning certificates give you the full range. They give you here is the 10% level, the 2%, the 5%, the 1%, all the way up to the probable maximum flood uh, as it pertains to your address. And that, that's a much more helpful way of, of you know, indicating to people what are the possible range of flood depths at your address. Uh, but certainly availability and accessibility of, of flood risk information is, is a concern in the community. And we, we, I guess we don't want people to be finding out about their flood risk uh, when, when the flood's coming through their door or just from their flood insurer, their, their insurer, when they're receiving their flood premium. Sure. I might just add to that, um, the Royal Commission that was undertaken after the 2019-20 bushfires called for um, a much of the availability of a much greater level of data at a household level. Um, and that hasn't been enacted. Um, and I just might make a comment about local councils. I think we um, expect a lot from our local councils. They're, um, you know, generally not particularly well funded, and um, some of them, you know, don't have particularly sophisticated systems or processes. And so we absolutely um, support better data at a household level of the risks that are present. Um, but we wouldn't want to see that kind of duck shove to um, local government. Um, it really needs to be a statewide or indeed a national program with proper funding and a, and a single source of truth for that data so that um, everyone understands what they're looking at. Sure. That's all changed. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, sure. Just one question from each other. Um, and going to that table in your submission from the Affinity Consulting Report, um, and you talked about a return on investment of 271 for that early flood warning. Yep. Just for the average punter, that probably doesn't mean much in terms of what benefit would have on their insurance premiums. So have you got any modelling in terms of potentially what some of these mitigation investments uh, w would do to individual premiums? I know you probably won't have a definitive, but... No, well, you... insurance is a competitive market and different insurers price their premiums in different ways. They want to be in or out of particular markets for different yep. reasons at different times. Um, so there's no one answer, um, and um, you know we we so we haven't done that. But I would ref, uh, refer to my um, previous answer around um, the Queensland Household Resilience Program and the levy in Roma, and indeed the levy that was constructed around Launceston. Um, all of these projects have seen significant benefit um, from that investment, um, including to. Um, uh, premium. So, different the those um, that investment will impact the premium cost of different insurers in different ways. But um, history has shown us that uh, it does have a downward pressure on um, premiums. Catherine, thank you. Just some quick technical questions. Um, you said in New South Wales, uh, as a result of the flood event, I thought you said ninety-two thousand claims have been made. But in New South Wales? Yeah, the submission says 98,500 claims. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay, and, I'll... Um, I'll... The, the, the cost was a bit different. I just, look, I just, I mean, obviously to take it on notice, but I just would really appreciate, if possible, to get a breakdown by postcode of the claims, if that's possible. How many have been accepted, how many have been rejected, and how many are still... 
So um, I'll take that on notice Thank and we'll, we'll provide what we can. Um, so far, um, about just under a billion dollars um, in total. Um, that's not in New South Wales, across the whole of the event. So New South Wales and Queensland have been paid. So about 20% um, of claims have been settled so far. Um, just a, again, another technical one. Uh, when you say that you insure for all disasters, I wondered if land slips are part of that risk assessment or not. Uh, again, this is going to be a policy by policy one. Yep. Uh, certainly, the policies that uh, IAG offer, we, we do. Uh, my understanding is that we do cover uh, land slips, but again, that's going to be a, a very bespoke policy by policy uh, answer. Right, it's just hard to map it like you can map a flood, that's all. Physics. Yeah, that's right. It's certainly not uh, my organisation. We don't explicitly uh, price for it the way we do for flood. With, with flood, you can go out and get a flood map and get an understanding of where the risk is. Landslip is a little bit more nuanced and, and difficult to get information about. Thank you. Um, in relation to, uh, again, in referring back to your opening statement, Mr Jones, you said that 30 to 40 per cent of premiums in New South Wales could be going into levies and taxes. Is it possible for you again on notice just to unpack that a little sure. bit more for us and give us the state-by-state the state comparison, which sounds simple. I'd be very happy don't. to do that, very yeah. happy to do that. We but essentially, GST is applied first, and I think then it's stamp duty, then emergency services levy, um, or it might be emergency <laughs> services levy, then stamp duty. But we'll get that answer for you, and it's... Uh, it's, but it's very high in um, New South Wales. Thank you. Um, in relation to uh, insurance policies, okay, big question from me I've been asking for months now. If somebody is covered in, by insurance can't, and they are in a flood zone, would you consider just giving them the money rather than requiring them to rebuild in the flood zone? Because that seems to me your whole message about relocating people out of flood zones. If you could just write them a cheque on the basis that the house will be demolished and may leave, wouldn't that be assisting the relocation process instead so, of forcing them to sure, rebuild? Sure. So what you're talking there about there is a, ca a cash settlement. Correct. And um, uh, cash settlements can be um, offered for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because the policy doesn't adequately cover the cost of the rebuild, so the insurer is not able to complete the work. Um, the local council won't let them rebuild. Um, but it can also be done um, in agreement between the policyholder and the insurer. Um, insurers generally don't like to cash settle just because um, it takes... It, insurers have access to a panel of builders who they know and trust and they can warranty the work um, and so on. But um, in this circumstance, if someone said, I want to, you know, walk away from that land, sell it or whatever and take a cash settlement. Um, that's certainly something that um, insurers um, will have a conversation with their customers about, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis as the I customer I do understand needs. that, but wouldn't it be so much better if the insurance industry, just in the case of flood zone, disaster zones, where you actually don't... See, so you force them to rebuild there and then you won't insure their house. So wouldn't it be better, why not just give them the money almost as a default offer so because they each can leave each and buy somewhere where they can actually get insurance? But each circumstance is different, each customer is different and it's according to their needs. So, it, But it's certainly something that insurers are open to talking about. Um, in terms of, um, I think the <coughs> one earlier, uh, IAG, one of the insurance company submissions We've talked about how you build in a flood zone as part of the opportunity to mitigate risk. And in a sense, you're not trying anymore to stop the water coming. You're accepting the water could come, but you are trying to mitigate the damage in the, in the specific building itself. So is there an opportunity in people's insurance policies to kind of be given credit for that? I know, for example, with my car, because I can put it in a lock-up garage, my car insurance is a little bit cheaper mm -hmm. because that's mitigated the risk of theft. What about how you build <coughs> um, or how you rebuild as, as something that could be taken into account in people's insurance policies? 
So it'll depend on the insurer. So some insurers will take that into account and others won't. But I do know that, um, and, you know, as I said before, it's a competitive market. There are, there are lots of insurers operating in Australia. And, um, there's, you know, I think um, stickiness is, customer stickiness has actually become a bit problematic. You know, I might not like me saying this, but, um, you know, people need to shop around and find out find a um, policy that's appropriate for them in their circumstances. Um, um, Is there even the expertise to risk rate that? So I, I do know that in Queensland, for example, the, um, the uh, household, Queensland Household Resilience Program that I mentioned, um, um, some insurers, uh, in fact I think most insurers, um, when customers presented evidence that they participated in that program and had um, done remediation work to their house to strengthen it against cyclone, they got an automatic deduction on their policy. So it does, it happens. It does happen. yeah. we, uh, for example, we, we have quite significant discounts for properties uh, that are built significantly higher than the surrounding terrain, which is a, a common uh, response to flood risk is you build the property up high. We, we offer quite significant discounts around that. Yes. So, but I am aware, for example, in, in Mullum, there's two houses identical side by side, but one's been built so that the walls can dry quickly. Um, the materials that have been used and the capacity to, for it to, uh, and was virtually unaffected. Next door neighbour's house is uninhabitable. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, just a, yeah. I'm, I'm just interested in that. Um, and just my last question okay. relates to the impact all of this is going to have on people's property values. Um, and I say this as a resident of the Northern Rivers, we don't, we, we really are facing housing in flood zones that's cheaper anyway, which means therefore you've got a more vulnerable group. Um, in terms of relocating and implementing these policies, we don't want to turn any communities into ghettos where you can't, where you can sell a property for 50 cents, basically. Uh, or people are coming in who ordinarily wouldn't be able to afford to operate a business or whatever, but you, you just end up creating a, a kind of a ghetto situation. So in terms yeah. of our planning for this transition um, and people's properties becoming almost worthless, um, have you any thoughts about that? Well, it's, I mean, you've articulated a, 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 a kind of... Um, terrible consequence of where we find ourselves in that um, the flood risk is high and so the premium is very expensive, the, um, the stock becomes devalued, um, it's only the only people who um, want to live there are those who can't afford anything else, they can't afford um, the insurance cover themselves and then another event comes through and the cycle continues and um, you know, and they, need we end up in, they do and, and it ends up hurting those who are the most vulnerable in the community and are at least able to help themselves. Um, and that's why, you know, I don't want to sound like a stuck, stuck record, but that's why we need to invest in resilience and mitigation measures at a household or community level. That's why we need to look at, um, you know, relocating some um, parts where the flood risk is most acute. Um, you know, there's, that's why we need to take taxes off insurance. These are um, policy prescriptions that will assist in the problem that you've identified. Sure. Thank you. Um, one last question for me. One of the there's been a great deal of frustration um, in the community about the response of government in terms of providing documentation and dealing with all of those matters. We actually heard positive feedback um, on a lot of in insurers where people had actually said to us, you know, yes, my claim's been assessed quite quickly, and yes, it's ready to go. The real issue is you now getting the work done. But leading that aside, I'm just wondering if you could just tell us actually how you assess and how you do it very quickly and how you manage it with people who've lost all their documents and their, and their hard drives and all of those things. How does that work? Uh, I'm not in the claims world. I don't have a high level stab. But, uh, no, that's fine. I, I'm happy to. It's a nice um, question. Um, <laughs> so um, the advice that we give to people and we're, um, you know, one of the um, um, reasons that we declare an insurance catastrophe is to um, mobilise all insurers at once and um, it kind of draws attention to the event. The Insurance Council takes a lead on communications. We're on the ground as soon as we're able and so on. And one of the, and we're providing advice to the community even while the event's still happening about what they should do. 
And one of the things we say is, you know, don't worry about trying to find your insurance documents from the bottom drawer as, you're, as the floodwaters are lapping at your front door. Um, you just need to provide your phone number or, you know, some personal details to your insurer and they'll be able to find your your claim and your claims history, and, sorry, your policy and your claims history and all that kind of thing. And in fact, um, we, the Insurance Council also helps people, some people don't can't remember who they're insured with, so they call us and um, we can help them um, do that. So I, I guess it's one of the benefits of being in a digitised world that, um, you know, that kind of process becomes relatively, um, relatively easy, but... Um, how do you manage the fraud within that? The government's made big... I mean, we know there's been serious issues with fraud through the government grants programs. Is it just that there's enough information connected to an individual that you can identify them easily and you've got all of their records because you've got their insurance claim? So it's, it's just an easy match. It's yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. Kate. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just wanted to, to turn to the, um, the whole uh, notion of planned retreat and to be honest it was a relief to see NIAG's submission mention of this and to tackle this um, head on. Um, you, you do say that and one of your recommendations in fact is for local governments and planners to consider allocating or putting aside areas of land for relocation programs in the future. And I just wanted to get a sense from you as to whether you, um, from the insurance industry's um, perspective, whether conversations around this, how have, have they gone within local government circles and government circles generally? Um, I am sure you have been raising uh, the issue of planned retreat for uh, some time, including coastal, not just in terms of floods. How, how has the discussion gone and um, do you think there's more, there's people, agencies were, are more receptive to it after the floods? I think, um, I think this flood has been, if you pardon the pun, a watershed moment. I think that um, the response from the community in Lismore that we've heard or that we've heard from stakeholders like Mayor Steve Craig and Janelle Safin and others has been that the community is much more receptive to this notion than they have been in the past. And, um, you know, it's difficult for people who've been in a community for a long period of time to let go of the idea that they'll be there until they pass away, that they might be somewhere else, they might have to move somewhere else because the risk of where they live has become too risky. These are kind of big human issues to deal with. Um, but in terms of agencies, um, you know, our discussions with New South Wales government have been very, uh, and their agencies have been very good and everyone's um, open to whatever policy prescriptions um, we think are needed. And you've raised actions of the sea, coastal inundation, that's another area. And it's not the focus of this committee's work, but it's certainly another area that um, we're looking at and considering because um, there's going to be um, areas along the um, coastline of Australia that um, um, <coughs> just become, oh, they get eaten away by the ocean, basically. So, because there's a there's a there's being proactive about it, and there's being reactive about it as well. The, the proactive, of course, is is trying to plan for um, future inundation and to, and to try and save lives and. Um, you know, before it happens. We're probably a long way off from that, do you think? Yes. Because your submission also, oh, sorry, IAG submission, um, says that there, which I wonder if we're here with the northern rivers, some of the northern rivers anyway, where there's a point at which the nat natural disaster risk is so great that communities have limited ability to prepare for or recover from the impact of the disaster. Do you think that's where, um, Mr Dyer, because it's IAG submission, yeah. that, that some parts of the Northern Rivers are at that point? It, it's certainly a challenge. So just taking a step back to, to sort of support our position on this, we, we've actually done some research on uh, where communities would best be, uh, be better off spending money on sort of targeted community scale mitigation, and it's all attached to the mission, yes, the Kathy document. Yeah. Um, but also where... Uh, property level uh, measures might be more appropriate and also where perhaps a land swap deal might be more appropriate and we, we've, 
we've come to understand that there are circumstances in which a land swap deal may be more appropriate, and it's these extreme high frequency risk zones, so where it's, where it's often uh, flooded very high frequency, and, and I guess Lismore, south, north and south Lismore, would be a prime example, very high flood frequency, and those are the conditions that lend themselves to a, a more uh, a, a relocation strategy, if you like. So just to be clear, this is contained in the report um, that you provided where it says you, um, you've got two out of the seven shortlisted options in, in the report. Um, one is the New South Wales town of Narrabri and the other South Tweed. Yes, that's right. So we looked at, uh, at essentially long-listing uh, towns or areas as, as, as uh, potential uh, for, for flood mitigation. Then we identified seven or eight of them identified some structural mitigation options that would be appropriate, but also acknowledging at the same time that not every town is appropriate for mitigation uh, on a community scale. So some areas you might have to look at it on a household level, and we, we outlined the circumstances under which that would be appropriate. But also you might uh, have other circumstances where a <coughs> land swap or managed retreat deal might be more appropriate. Uh, one of the key findings there was that if you piggyback on a major event, it's much more economically viable. Uh, it, it extends the, the sort of areas of applicability for managed retreat. If you, yeah. So in relation to that report, who are you talking to within government uh, with that report? I mean, it, 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 you're before a parliamentary inquiry now and you've, you've given that to us, but surely it's something that you're talking quite closely with some government agencies about, I would hope, anyway. Uh, I guess the, the key audience for that particular report was the, uh, the National uh, Recovery and Resilience Agency. Uh, given their role of allocating funding at a national level for, for resilience spending. But that, they are the key audiences, but of course we've also distributed it through uh, submissions like this to the various state government agencies. Okay. Okay, do I still have a yeah. couple? Of, um, <coughs> so I just wanted, you've also mentioned in here, which is um, which I think is um, is important for the committee to, to be aware of is the buyback or the, the after the Christchurch earthquake, the um, government there introduced basically zones that prohibited the development of, of homes, like mandated no-go zones, essentially. You say that this could be done either market-based or mandated in terms of suggesting that homes really shouldn't be built or rebuilt in certain areas. Would you like to explain what the market, like what the market-based me mechanism would be? Uh, yeah, I guess this is sort of stepping beyond the, the remit of an insurance company. This is this is where we we sort of chose not to be prescriptive in how how we thought we would, governments should go about this, and we we chose to uh, recommend either the the mandatory or the optional uh, measure. Certainly, the mandatory measure. Uh, taken in Christchurch with, with, with the red zones has uh, has been a success. Uh, I understand uh, in the following the 2011 floods there was an optional uh, scheme in Grantham in in mm -hmm. uh, the Lockyer Valley, and that's also been quite successful. So there are there are there are many different ways to go about these managed retreat uh, studies. My understanding is that council and the NWRC are undertaking a study into the best way to to essentially about this. And just one last question if I can. Um, uh, again, I was pleased to see um, in IG's submission uh, raising the issue of cumulative impact of new development on flood risk. Um, uh, essentially, the risk that that continuing to develop, develop in um, floodplains and potentially not even floodplains, but can increase the risk to existing housing stock, I'm assuming, in terms of the way in which water moves across the landscape. Is that, is that your understanding of what that, that means? And if not, could you explain to the committee what that is? You basically, it's a recommendation saying planners must consider cumulative impact of new development on flood risk to existing housing stock. And that's uh, quite, yeah. yeah. Yes, that, that's, that's the, generally the gist of it. The, the other concern is around uh, evacuation, uh, certainly, uh, and community facilities around evacuation facilities and uh, yeah, the like. Sorry. Do you think that's happening at the moment? Uh, probably case by case. I think everyone's sort of doing their best with the resources available. But uh, probably not for me to say. I must say that's a really great question because that came up in Hawkesbury. Mm.
where the community is strongly of the view that um, mm. another suburb's development has contributed mm. to the increase and to the height of mm. the flooding. So presumably that then impacts the premiums on all of those homeowners. What role should mm. the insurance council be playing in these planning decisions? And I mean, at, at some point, if a council's going to approve construction of homes that either make that house will be uninsurable or it will increase the risk to other houses. Should we even be allowing that? Uh, well, you know, our role is to, as I kind of outlined before, um, advocate for um, policies that will reduce the risk, which will better protect lives and property and put downward pressure on premiums and um, make us more resilient as a nation and our, our communities more resilient. And that's why, um, you know, we've been um, arguing for planning and land use planning um, reforms. That's why we've been arguing for tax reform. That's why we've been arguing for um, resilience in um, mitigation investment, um, because all of these things um, will have an impact. So we, we do have a role. Um, it's difficult for us to have a role in those kind of individual land planning decisions. We're not planning experts, as it were. Um, and um, you know, there are others with expertise in that area, you know, greater expertise in that area than, than we have, but um, at a macro level, it's, you know, we're very strongly um, advocating for um, better land use planning in the future. We had um, in Ballon or a council trying to do the right thing, and I think it's 1.8 metres you need to elevate above sea level. I think that it's a measure about that. That all that happens is everyone in a surrounding property feels anxious that now the water's been redirected into their property when it wasn't. And it's clearly an area for debate that only very qualified and expert people can really tell you the hydrology impacts of raising up individual blocks. But intellectually, you can see that that is going to change the... Um, I mean, there are different, um, you know, as both of, both of us have said, there are different solutions for different um, locations and for different risks, but I talked about wet flood proofing houses, which is um, raising the services above the expected flood line, so all your um, plumbing, electrical, um, your appliances are all mm. in the first story and the um, ground floor is built in a way that um, is able to be you know, recovered relatively quickly yeah. and cheaply. So that's one solution which wouldn't require um, the redistribution or raising of land, but allows the water to come through and then um, you know, hose it down and away you go. And maybe you can tell Telstra to stop putting their generators <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I'm done. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks very much. I think um, that brings to the end our questions. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your submissions. Thank you. We've got a four minute <coughs>